Hello. Dr. Arun Balu, sir, can we start? Hello? Hello? Yes, doctor. I uh, can hear your voice. Yes. So, uh, do we go live now? Yeah, we are in the live. We can uh, introduce the speakers and we can uh, play the videos so from the uh, welcome everyone to the Mishab uh, 2021 and uh, I think we have the honor of starting the first session today in this hall and uh, this is going to be the basics, talking about basics of the endoscopic spine surgery. I'm not able to see the uh, video of the other members. Hello? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Hi Prasad. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Karuna Karan is the first speaker and he's not joined yet. Can someone check with him? Doctor is already there, Doctor. Karuna Karan, Doctor is already there. Uh, uh, Arun, I'm already there. Okay, so yeah, you, you were you were supposed to unmute yourself. So yeah. uh, without wasting any time, I think we can start first with the Dr. Karuna Karan's talk on the uh, your talk is the first schedule, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's uh, about different systems uh, and how we are going to uh, know the equipments, know your equipments, basically. Right. So, uh, uh, we have a galaxy of speakers with us in this session. Uh, Dr. Karma Karan, Dr. Mahesha, Dr. Uh, Pradyuman Pai, uh, Ketan Deshpande, Dr. Prasad. And uh, uh, I think there's one more. Um, we lost the list. Oh, wow. Yeah, Dr. Sukumar is also there, right. So we start with Dr. Karuna Karan. Uh, this is the f uh, first session of basic endoscopic spine surgery, full endoscopic sp spine surgery, and it will also have one session on biportal from Dr. Ketan. So uh, we re uh, I'll request all the participants to uh, add their questionnaire uh, in the chat box uh, as and when they feel like, and we'll try to address the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, so uh, let's start with Dr. Karuna Karan's talk first. Yeah, too much. 
uh, in the meantime please i request all the other uh, panelists to kindly mute yourself till the doc till dr karanakaran is speaking uh, doctor can you able to see my screen yeah yes, yeah it is visible yeah thank you i'm just playing the video good afternoon if somebody is looking at improving his skill sets in doing endoscopic spine surgery he must be aware of his equipments i will talk today about different endoscopic systems similarities differences the uniportal technique which i use is the fully endoscopic technique which can be used transforaminally as well as interlaminar based on the disc fragment and situations required destendo is again an interlaminar technique it's a uniportal technique it's an endoscopic assisted technique unilateral bipolar technique is a rapidly evolving technique and the advantage of the endoscope as you all know is the illumination and the clarity with which we could see structures as the eye of uh, for visualization is right at the tip whereas in a fully endoscopic technique is at the tip and it can be rotated to see different corners of the operating field in descendo technique uh, there are different uh, equipments for cutting as well as uh, grasping a disc material it can be used for both uh, discectomy as well as decompression both both in the cervical as well as in the uh, thoracic and in the lumbar region the, the the very interesting instrument which i found it very useful is the marking instrument which helps to keep the the disc space perpendicular to the ground so that you don't have to unnecessarily angle the instruments during surgery the distendo working uh, Uh, portal as provisions for the uh, the camera the suction the the grasping the disc punches and the uh, up cutters and is got an inbuilt retraction system which could keep the neural structures away from the operating field in unilateral bipolar technique the best part is that you can use the existing arthroscope and also the uh, the conventional micro uh, discectomy instruments the this has got sequential dilators and some special tissue dissecting instruments uh, for the execution of unilateral bipolar technique in uh, in in tra- fully endoscopic technique there are, are different types of uh, endoscopes which can be used for both uh, the transforaminal and as well as the interlaminar technique in uh, it can be used in the thoracic cervical and lumbar region there is got a variable length in these uh, endoscopes and diameters the commonly used one would be the 4.1 mm uh, working chat the endoscope is a 25 degree scope which will help you to look into different corners in the operating field and look for uh, fragments as well as neural structures can be retracted using the uh, working sleeve it is uh, the, the the beauty of this uh, uh, endoscope is that it has got a large uh, space for the introduction of the working uh, instruments through the working channel is because that it doesn't need a separate outlet flow area uh, as it is elliptically designed which per, which allows for the, the saline which is coming into the operating field to go between the scope and the working sleeve what it is advantage is that it doesn't cause unnecessary increase in pressure on the neural structures during the irrigation process and also keeps a very clear operating field and it helps in rotating to visualize the different corners of the area outing area it's a step by step approach where you need a needle that followed by guide wire and the dilator and the working sleeve special equipments to uh, uh, grasp fragments if it is inferiorly or superiorly migrated like the articulated rongers and the punches and the most important equipment in endoscopic uh, spine surgery would be the radio frequency from meha hertz the because this is again an uh, ergonomically designed that, uh, tool and it can be rotated ergonomically 360 degrees and it is a got a precise current flow which helps to, to pass the current intracellularly and effectively control uh, the bleeding by coagulating and also cut tissues to dissect and uh, probe uh, different areas of the operating area it is also got an high speed burr which is go up to 16000 revolutions the tip is very well designed it has got a hooded protected burrs that you can use a diamond tip burr as well as a cutting burr and it's got an articulated burr too the fluid management system is very important and in this uh, system the pressure is very effectively controlled it, it doesn't allow you to uh, go inadvertently to higher pressures it can be pressure monitored 
and this provides a very clear operating feel. Thank you very much uh, for the patient listening. Wish you all good luck. Stay safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karuna Karan. That was yeah. a wonderful description. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, 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 Dr. Ajay Krishnan is our other moderator. May I request Dr. Ajay to also unmute himself? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, hi Ajay, welcome. Uh, so, uh, it was a wonderful description regarding the various types of endoscope. And uh, as you correctly mentioned, the 25 degree ang uh, angle in the working channel endoscope is a big advantage because you can look under the neural tissue, which you may not be, uh, possible, uh, not be possible to do with any other visualizing system, except the free endoscopes that are done uh, used in the uh, UB type uh, endoscopic surgeries. Uh, do we have any questions from the uh, viewers? No questions here. Anything, Ajay, you would like to add on into the instrumentation that you feel uh, is required? Well, this seems to be perfectly covered, the basics. Good right. So then we move on to the next uh, talk. Uh, can I just request the organizer to uh, keep uh, or maybe send uh, the list of the talk topics in this session? in the chat box to us. No, oh, Doctor, we'll send it. Yeah, and there's one more discrepancy. There was one talk from Dr. Pramod Lokhande on interlaminar technique, which does not seem to reflect in this session, in this page, but it was mentioned in the final program. So do we have enough time for that talk? Uh, yes, Doctor, It's uh, the topic has been mentioned for Dr. Pramod uh, Lokhande. But his talk is scheduled here, right? Yeah, after Dr. Ajay Krishnan's talk. So sure. we Dr. Pramod Lokhande. Right, right. So I'll yeah. just uh, inform Dr. Pramod that he has to be there. Uh, he was just checking with me that it is not showing. So please send me the uh, main topic and we proceed with the next uh, talk in this session, which is Dr. Ajay's. Or I think it is Dr. Prasad. Dr. Pratyumna. Pratyumna. Pratyumna will be speaking on the needle uh, techniques, right? I'll yes, Tarun. I'll yeah, 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 yeah. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is coming up, but we can't see any slides right now. Uh, I will play the video now. Please. Thank you. My topic today is uh, tips and tricks to optimize needle entry into the disc. Needle insertion is a critical step in many diagnostic as well as therapeutic medical procedures. Especially in percutaneous full endoscopic transforaminal discectomy, needle positions, positioning assumes critical importance. Because for targeted treatment, you need safe, accurate, and optimal needle positioning. The needle position determines the final perfect placement of subsequent cannula, endoscope, and instruments, which then further cannot be manipulated. The key to optimize needle placement, obviously, is knowing how to handle the needle and it requires advanced tactile skill and feedback for needle manipulation. A few things to consider about the needle. We use long spinal needles, 18 gauge needles usually to accommodate the guide wire. The needles are beveled and stylated. And here you can see the hub or notch which is there at the uh, base, which helps us to identify where the bevel is. Steering the needle by controlling the movement of the tip is an art to be mastered and it is possible in beveled needles. Especially the beveled needles can be steered and manipulated. You hold the needle with both the needle, uh, both the hands. Use style it, which is compatible with the needle. Placing a bend or bow to the needle shaft outside the skin to accentuate the deflection to our advantage and it is possible with flexible needles. So it is illustrated over here. If you insert the needle with a bend outside, the needle tip can go towards the direction of the bevel. Use the bevel effectively to our advantage. You insert the needle in small, smooth, incremental fashion and not in sudden bursts. The next important point of optimizing needle placement is you have to have an expert CM technician to 
always show you where the tip is moving and you should know the comprehensive knowledge of the anatomy because whatever the cm shows is only the bones you have to imagine where the nerves are lying and you should also know the pathology as well as the normal anatomy so as to have a perfect and safe placement of the needle in transferangular targeted fragmentectomy you have to design a safe surgical axis from the skin entry point to the pathologic disc herniation point avoiding damage to the exiting nerve root and negotiating the superior articular facet how do we start is by planning the insertion point depending on the target point and the target point is identified by studying the mri ct all the investigation modalities for location of the herniation level of the herniation migration sequestration and associated stenosis you do marking on the skin the needle placement the two most important things to be uh, gauged are the distance from the midline and the angulation which you make for upper lumbar disc l12 and l23 you need a trajectory which is more steep skin entry is more close to the midline and you target the lateral pedicular line to avoid neural injury and peritoneal contents for l34 and l45 you have much more liberty as compared to the angulation which is possible you can go very horizontal also for targeting central disc herniation you can go at or medial to the medial pedicular line for l5 s1 the iliac crest makes it slightly more difficult especially also the short transverse process and the narrow foramen makes it slightly more challenging the location of the herniation whether it is central paramedian or extra foramen also help also uh, decides how your angulation of the needle and entry point from the midline going to be decided whenever we are uh, discussing needle placement usually the reference point which is taken is the pedicle lower down and then you identify where the tip is lying as in reference to the medial pedicular line lateral or mid pedicular now in uh, targeting the paramedian disc herniation or central disc herniations this is the ideal needle tip position which is on lateral view it is on the posterior vertebral body line in the ap view it is at the medial pedicular line for a foramenal disc herniation lateral is same but in ap view it has to be in the mid pedicular line and for extra foramenal it is the lateral pedicular line for downward mig migrated disc herniation you may have to go from cranial to caudal and target the lower end plate injecting contrast helps to identify where your tip is going before you in, uh, insert into the disc here it can identify the exiting nerve root location clearly in my practice what i do practically is i always try and hit the facet first because identifying or hitting the bone is very reassuring and no uh, we can know where our tip is uh, lying and then adjust the tip of the needle accordingly needle placement it can be if your needle is too shallow then you can identify the location that it is wrong on ap view and lateral view like this if it is too vertical obviously uh, you can identify it Uh, this is important because if the needle is going in the wrong direction you not only have missed your target you there is always a chance of injuring other critical structures like the peritoneal contents or the vascular uh, structures thank you very much happy needling thank you pradeep uh, great talk as usual and uh, it underlines the importance of the first step in the uh, full endoscopic surgery the needle because everything else follows the needle and uh, it is important to uh, understand the uh, behavior of the needle when you are using it in the soft tissues of the back and how to target uh, before we proceed further i didn't have the program first with me and now i would request uh, welcome my uh, panelists uh in this session uh, some of the stalwarts in the endoscopic surgery dr uh, rohidas dr girish datar dr peston ji and dr prasad padgaonkar uh, i welcome all of you and uh, uh, most of uh, uh, you do not need any uh, uh, big introduction you are stalwarts in your own field so we are glad to have you in this uh, panel and uh, it will be a Uh, we hope that we'll have a very rich uh, exchange of knowledge uh, with your presence here uh, now the next talk is doc by dr mahesha uh, if everybody agrees do we take questions at the end of the session or uh, do we take uh,
क्वेश्चंस इन बिटवीन अजय वी कैन टेक द्वेश्चन इन बिटवीन आल्सो दैट्स फाइन राइट सो एज ऑफ नाउ वी डू नॉट हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम द ऑडियंस एंड मोस्ट ऑफ द टॉक्स आर बेसिक एंड दे आर जस्ट सेल्फ एक्सप्लेनेटरी वी प्रोसीड विद द next talk by another very experienced surgeon from down south dr mahesha on how to choose uh, between the two most common techniques of full endoscopy transforaminal versus interlaminar uh, requesting to start dr mahesha's talk welcome mahesh uh, thank you arun and ladhi and all the uh, can they play my talk yes we can see that is my screen is visible Okay. How to choose? We know that surgery through natural opening avoids collateral damage and gives the best. How to choose? We know that surgery through natural opening avoids collateral damage and gives the best results. Transforaminal approach uses the foramen, which is the natural opening in the spine. There are two contraindications to transforaminal surgery: patient unfit for open anesthesia or surgeon not experienced in endoscopy. The scope of endoscopic surgery has expanded over the last few years. Most of the in- contraindications have turned into indications. At L5 S1 level, interlaminar approach is better because a wide interlaminar window, minimal or no bone resection, easy access to migrated fragments, familiarity with traditional a technique and ilia crest or foramen size has no effect however uh, interlaminar approach is not suitable in previously operated cases and also it is not suitable for accessing foraminal or extraforaminal herniation here is a patient with uh, a massive central disc extrusion at l5 s1 level causing right sided foot drop this was done with interlaminar endoscopic surgery uh the extruded fragments were removed and this is the post operative mri showing good decompression and disc excision as i said earlier interlaminar approach is not suitable in certain situation that's why you should not transfer an approach here is a patient with recurrent disc prolapse at l5 s1 level this is a 27 year old athlete who had a previous micro discectomy done the ilia crest is high there is no instability there is no central stenosis the problems here are recurrent disc herniation foramenal stenosis and epidural fibrosis this required trans iliac transforaminal approach at the end of uh, decompression you can see both the exiting and traversing roots very well decompressed patient had uh, full relief of symptoms and in 3 months time he is back to training here is another patient 64 year old patient with severe right l5 radiculopathy patient has stable lytic lysis at l5 s1 level with foraminal and extra foraminal disc herniation this was done with transforaminal approach targeted fragmentectomy was done extruded fragments were excised post operative mri shows good decompression and patient had complete relief from symptoms without requiring any fusion another patient with the chronic left l5 radiculopathy since 4 years this is a chronic disc herniation with the hard collagenous annulus this was done with interlaminar approach at the end of decompression you can see very well decompressed root and the dura and plate ossifies were removed patient had complete relief and post operative mri shows good decompression another patient 57 year old patient with acute left foot weakness since 10 days the mri shows massive down migrated disc extrusion at l4 level this was done with transforaminal approach this can be done with interlaminar approach also here we burr the superior part of the pedicle to access the fragment at the end of decompression you can see uh, the nerve root and the fragments removed post operative mri shows good decompression you can see that disc is not touched at all and patient had complete relief of symptoms coming to advantages of transforaminal approach it is the least invasive approach does not require root retraction ease of access to the foramen it can be done under local anesthesia and it is the approach of choice for upper disc 
Disadvantages of transfer on approach, it is technically demanding, requires a longer learning curve, increased radiation, requires more instruments and there is some difficulty at L placement level. Coming to advantages of interlaminar approach, it is technically easier, shorter learning curve, less radiation, less instruments and uh, ease of access to L S one level. Disadvantages of interlaminar approach, it is more invasive, requires retraction of root which can cause uh, neurologic deficit sometimes. There is difficulty in accessing the foramen. It requires regional or general anesthesia and there is difficulty in accessing the upper disc. So this is how we choose approach. Uh, transforaminal or interlaminal. Take home message interlaminal approach is good for alpha S1 disc stenosis, chronic disc congestion, whereas transforaminal approach is the approach, approach of choice for foraminal, extraforaminal disc, upper lumbar disc. Both approaches are effective, good. Mastering both techniques are very important if you want to become a master. Otherwise, do whatever works best in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahesha, uh, with that uh, wonderful conclusion that yes, you need to learn both the techniques and uh, one can't replace the uh, one over another. Uh, but I have a small question uh, for you and Pradyumna, like we were talking about L5-S1, uh, as there is a special situation of uh, recurrent herniation at L5-S1 where you may not choose the interlaminar technique. What are the criteria would you want to uh, look at while accessing the disc through the transforaminal approach, especially if you do not wish to go transiliac. So, would there be certain anatomical considerations in the L5-S1 region where you would uh, choose that it will be safe or unsafe to and what will be the improvisations needed? So, if you want to approach transforaminally, transiliac approach is a very good uh, option. However, if you do not want to go through the ILM, then you have to look at the lateral view of the patient, lateral x-ray of the patient. If the uh, iliac crest is uh, uh, above the upper end plate of L5, then uh, there may be some difficulty in going. However, with the experience, it is possible to go through the iliac approach in uh, most of the situations, except if you have a massive central disc extrusion, where it may be slightly difficult. However, if you have a foraminal disc, foraminal stenosis, or a paracentral herniation, you will still be able to land and remove that fragment through suprailiac approach because uh, even with a steep angle with the flexible instrument, you will be able to manage with some foramen of Right. Thank you. Pai, uh, 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 are you there? Dr. Pradyumna? Yes. Yeah, so would you would you wish to add something to uh, L5-S1 level through the transforaminal approach? Uh, yes, I think L5-S1 transforaminally, if your space available is less, I would go interlaminar rather than transforaminal. Right. So, uh, L5-S1, you can go transforaminal, but you may need additional equipment along with it. Like uh, you need to do a superior, uh, the foraminoplasty, you may need to burr the... At the same time, the location of the disc herniation is also very important. So, if it is centrally located, I would definitely go interlaminar rather than transforaminal in case of a compromised uh, foramen uh, with a higher iliac crest. So, I'll add a little bit from here that uh, yes, Mahesha and Pai both uh, reiterate that at L5-S1, if you can do interlaminar, it is a preferable approach because it is less messy and it is, uh, especially if you compare it with the trans iliac one, but uh, if the choice is for a transforaminal and uh, you do have a difficult anatomy, one can, in fact, uh, instead of directly entering the foramen, one can dock the instruments first at the facet and can go under endoscopic visualization by drilling the undersurface of the facet and then uh, addressing the pathology. That is one more uh, option that one can have. Uh, so, with that, we proceed to the uh, next talk. Uh, which is by Dr. Ajay Krishnan now. The step-by-step -step technique for the transforaminal uh, endoscopic discectomy. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay, thank you. 
transforaminal endoscopy a technical know how now this we all know that now transforaminal endoscopy is a foraminal approach through the cambins triangle and basically there are two ways to do it one is inside out and one is outside in the basic difference between the two are that both of them being done under, done under local anesthesia one approach directly into the disc do the discal work come out and does the epidural work later and outside in approach wherein you don't go into the disc but do all the things epidural and that involves blind foraminoplasty and removal of certain amount of bone and ligament of flavor to have an access to the epidural space now let's have this case for inside out first this is a small disc which is paracentral a classic indication for a transforaminal disc this is what the post operative uh, decompression you achieve by a transforaminal discectomy i to v image is oriented to have an orthogonal view wherein you have a parallel upper end plate of the level to be operated that is important and coplanar disc level is chosen and you are inserting a needle at a distance of 8 10 12 or 16 cm depending upon the size and the equipitis and the pathology to be addressed for paracentral usually it is 9 10 cm and this is the position of the endoscope which is achieved and this is the line which is marking the transpatocentral plane so that you are not completely going flat and this is the entry which is going at say 30 degrees to 40 degrees now the appearance what you go and you get will depend upon how lateral you go this is the needle you have pierced and this just progresses to reach to the target area this is the transversal line the needle progresses reaches further further it touches the facet it negotiates across the facet to reach the medial pedicular line at the postro uh, uh, postro inferior corner of the disc and then it insert the, the needle is further inserted into the disc and a guide pin is replaced a trocar is put which is further guided and over that a working sheath is put and then the working sheath is kept there and the endoscope is positioned this is the initial position which is sub annular in the posterior one third of the disc and as you withdraw it you come out to a position which is called half in half out and this is what is the location of it wherein half is showing into the epidural space and then you work around to remove the fragment and you achieve the decompression this is what is half in half out and the endoscopic view would be something like this this is the intradiscal work as you approach you remove the disc part that is done sub annular then you are able to see the annulus there you remove the annulus you use bipolars and once the annulus is uh, cleared you will be able to see the fragment there uh, pushing there this is the annulus and you then do the annulus cutting the moment you are cutting the annulus you will face some bleeding you coagulate clear it and after the clearance has been done you go to the next step of delivering the fragment you just grab it and pull it out and usually that's a that's the win situation and immediately the decompression is achieved and the decompression is confirmed by fluttering dura seeing the nerve roots probing and visualization so this is the end point of a paracentral disc you may further withdraw the endoscope to view the facetal bone this is the decompressed dura which is there you can see the root there you can see the pulsations there you can see the flutter of uh, a fluid flutter uh, causing moment of the dura there and this is the facet you can remove to have more decompression in appropriate cases whenever needed so this is the facet directly in front of you you can see the exiting nerve root there this is the tip of the facet so when there is a foraminal stenosis this is the part which needs to be decompressed and you can decompress this nerve root which you can do if you do a dorsal decompression in this case you can see the root which is dorsally there ventral there all we have removed the facetal part and the ligament of flame so this is possible in cases when needed the outside in technique differs with the use of only one thing that is remus that is one secondly the direction of putting the needle and the endoscope is oblique say so this is coming obliquely at this angle and this is not coplanar where you are going this is going oblique so this is what is required you put the needle there and a skin incision is placed over that skin incision you use reamers and these reamers are bone mill or you use trephines and you make the entry reach directly to the targeted fragment which is usually a migrated fragment where you want to remove it this is how it is placed and uh, 
guide wire is again replaced and this is the reamer which is rim th rimming through the superior ascending articular process and then you replace it with the endoscope there on, in, on this working channel. So this is the final position and you are directly working in the epidural space. You are directly working in the epidural space here, this complete epidural space in the lateral aspect of the foramen and uh, you can approach as deep as for this matter this is a highly migrated disc you can reach up to this this is not inside the disc this is epidural the first view you have is of this it is usually bloodier than an inside out technique and this is the arc of the bone which is you have rimmed out and this is superior articular process the pedicle this is the ligamentum flame there this is the fragment lying there you can directly grab this the moment you have re released it you have achieved the full decompression by a outside in approach Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, again, a wonderful description of both the techniques. Uh, uh, we also uh, have with us uh, Dr. Prasad Patgaonkar as the panelist along with Dr. Girish. And both of them have developed a new classification for uh, L5S1 uh, transforaminal uh, surgery. May I request Dr. Prasad to just to add uh, briefly the summary of your article just for the benefit of the listeners that can you, uh, what are the salient points that you need to, do? and it's kind of you to share the article here, anyone who is accessing the chat can uh, uh, see and download the article for uh, better learning. Dr. Prasad? Yeah, so the most important part is whenever we used to, I, I can see most of the experienced surgeon, they can eyeball it so nicely on L5S1 that if the iliac crest is high, they immediately decide I need to do more annulotomy, more foraminoplasty, or maybe my entry should be this much away from the iliac crest. So all those things are really difficult for the beginners. And when there is a situation where probably you don't want to enter interlaminar or probably you are not well versed with the interlaminar technique, in both the situations, transforaminal uh, way is really a good way to go when you want to go trans -iliac. And trans iliac is also not very difficult. It is just a uh, block of mind. Uh, it is just a block in our mind that trans iliac is not possible. It is just if we make a 10 mm hole in the trans iliac in through the ileum, probably it is absolutely the same way we are doing the transforaminal surgery. The rest of the surgery remains the same. So this article is just a briefly summarizing how you actually eyeball on X-rays, just on X-ray images on AP and lateral. And that is how whenever there is a type 3 relationship between uh, um, the ileum and the L5 pedicle, that type 3 relationship guides us for a, it definitely gives us an idea that it is either a uh, procedure for interlaminar approach or probably you should go trans -ileate. that would be a better ap approach. Right. Thank you. Thank you for uh, nicely describing it. And uh, as I already said, one can download this article, which has been kindly shared by Dr. Prasad. So we move ahead to the next talk in this uh, uh, session, which is interlaminar endoscopic discectomy step-by-step -step technique. So we just learned transforaminal and uh, we move on to the next full endoscopic technique, which is interlaminar step-by-step -step description by an, another stalwart expert, Dr. Pramod Lakhande from Pune. Is my screen is visible? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. My talk is on full endoscopic interlaminar discectomy, the step-by-step -step technique. Full endoscopic operations can be considered as one of the most sophisticated and highly evolved forms of minimally invasive spine surgeries. As we all know, there are two basic approaches transforaminal and interlaminar. Indication-wise, transforaminal approach is more suitable for foraminal or extraforaminal disc herniations, low migrated, central or broad-based herniations. It is also a preferred approach at upper lumbar levels or thoracic level disc herniations. Whereas interlaminar approach is more suitable for lower lumbar disc herniations, especially L5-S1 disc herniations, where transforaminal approach is not possible. It is also very effective in dealing with high-grade migrations and in patients with herniations associated with stenosis. It is also a preferred approach for cervical disc herniations. Coming to the second technique, which is the interlaminar approach, which is familiar to most of the spine surgeons. The surgical technique begins with the docking of the working sleeve. For this, you have to identify the center of the interlaminar space and an 8 millimeter incision is taken through which the dilator is inserted till it reaches the 
press at joint level. Once the position is confirmed, the working sleeve is then slided over the dilator and the final uh, check position is confirmed and this completes the docking process. Once the cannula is in position, the surgical technique differs depending on the size of the interlaminar window. There are two possibilities. If the interlaminar window is very wide, where the traversing nerve root is not covered by the facet joint. In this case, we do not have to resect any bone. So we just make a small slit in the ligamentum phlegm through which the hernia can be removed. Whereas if the interlaminar window is narrow, some amount of bone drilling is necessary. So here is a case example. The first case, wide interlaminar window, large extruded disc herniation at L5-S1 level on the right side. It is an axillary disc. This is the first vision. We see some muscle and adipose tissue, uh, which is removed with the help of forceps to expose the ligamentum flavum. Uh, we start cutting the flavum near the midline, layer by layer, till the epidural space is opened. And the tip of the cannula is used to stretch the ligamentum flavum so that it becomes taut and the cutting becomes easier. And once the space is opened, we start cutting the flavum uh, laterally uh, till we reach the facet joint. So this is the last part of the flavum which is being cut. Once the flavum is cut, then the next, next and the most important step is to identify the lateral border of the nerve root. Uh, the nerve root is slightly mobilized to confirm and since this is an axillary disc herniation, we do not retract the nerve root too much medially. We directly go towards the axilla and visualize the uh, herniated mass. The annular release is done with the help of a uh, dura dissector and an annular cutter. And the herniation just pops out. Multiple herniated fragments can be removed under direct vision. And this is the final complete removal of the herniation ma hernia mass. The 25 degrees angled endoscope allows us to look under the dura and the nerve root also. And you can see that the entire surgery has been done through a small slit of 2.5 millimeters. So this is a video, clinical video showing the removal of the large herniated mass through the endoscope. And these are the final post-operative MRI pictures showing complete removal of the herniated mass. And you can see the muscles are all preserved and there is hardly any damage which is visualized in the ligament of flavum. Now consider the second case scenario of a narrow interlaminar window. This is an upmigrated L45 disc herniation with a discal cyst and you can see the interlaminar space is very narrow. Now this is a right sided approach. The technique is very similar. Once the endoscope is inserted, some muscle fibers have to be removed to expose the ligament of flavum. We identify the facet joint and we release the superficial part of the flavum which is attached to the medial margin of the facet. The tip of the descending facet is identified like this and drilling is started from the tip of the descending facet continued upwards. This is the drilling of the ascending facet. The aim is to widen the interlaminar window. Then after bone drilling is completed, we start cutting the ligament of flavum layer by layer to open up the epidural space like before. And we continue cutting the flavum laterally towards the facet joint till the lateral border of the nerve root is identified. So that's the nerve root. We mobilize the nerve root and we advance the tip of the cannula downward towards the base and we rotate it so as to retract the nerve root with the tip of the working sleeve. So it acts like a dura dissector. The cannula is then uh, tilted upwards to visualize the discal cyst and this is the annular release which is being done to mobilize the herniated mass which can be easily removed with the help of a forceps. So there you see there is an exiting nerve root there that's the uh, axial of the exiting nerve root and uh, this is the well decompressed traversing nerve root. So the post-operative MRI pictures showing complete removal of the disc herniation and all of this has been done through a 8 millimeter incision. There is hardly any blood loss and we never insert a drain inside. So finally to summarize the advantages of interlaminate technique over transformal approach are it's a very versatile technique which is able to treat a variety of disc herniations. It is a familiar approach to almost all spine surgeons does not need a lot of planning and the use of fluoroscopy is minimal in this technique. Thank you very much. Thank you Pramod. Uh, to the point and uh, excellent demonstration of the step-by-step -step technique and 
it is a wonderful technique uh, to graduate to the full endoscopic spine surgery uh, as you correctly mentioned it uh, adds a lot of versatility and since the advent of uh, interlaminar technique the application uh, of full endoscopy to lumbar pathologies has increased by leaps and bounds so there is a question uh, by a delegate how to feel medial breach while using viper prime i think this is a question which is incorrectly uh, posted to this session so we move ahead to the next talk by dr pc day and now we move to the uh, next system of the endoscopy which is the descendo system we just learned the full endoscopic system where everything goes through the one single portal uh the tube was there and the working channel endoscope but now we go on to the next type of endoscopy which is the distando system and i'll request dr pc day from bhuvneshwar he'll uh, introduce us to the concept of the full endo, uh, the distando system thank you dr day yes good afternoon uh, uh, arun yeah and good afternoon all panelists i am going to speak on the step by step technique of this distando technique uh can i have my screen please sure um, is my screen visible yes the endoscopic discectomy and bilateral decompression step by step technique we are putting the patient in the knee chest position and uh, with the help of the special localizing device mark the level maybe two or three level with the help of cm we are not taking the ap view only lateral view is sufficient two bars should be parallel to each other and parallel to the space then we are putting the mark with the marker pen the incision is about 15 to 18 mm long 5 to 10 mm away from the midline it is the same for the stenosis where to address the bilateral nerve root and the we are putting the gauze piece tied with a thread one cranial one caudal creating a space between the spinous process and lateral aspect of the muscle it is a press fit technique there is no special device to fix it we have a very few instruments around 10 interlaminar window approach that's why it's called the surgeon friendly technique like the open surgery and the micro surgery both hand are the free of surgeons left hand for the suction tip and right hand for the operating instruments 52 years lady after fixation the disc after 7 year she developed the adjacent level pathology huge disc at l5 basal level and this is a right side nerve root compression right side radiculopathy this is the cranial or l5 lamina and this is the midline and this is the lateral this is the caudal so 3 o'clock is the cranial the first bite is usually at the spinal laminar junction because the dura is a little bit away from the bone is the safest place it is 45 degree carison points for the bone 90 degree for the sub tissue gradually coming laterally and then detaching the ligamentum flavum from the cranial lamina putting the patty to protect the dura then removing the ligamentum flavum piece will with the 90 degree carison points reaching up to the inferior lamina the s1 lamina here and also the decompression by cutting the overhanging facet because 52 years lady adjacent level surgery pre prior done and then completely decompressing the nerve root the disc is the axilla level huge disc little bit adherent detached with the pen pull tractor and then removed in toto and also the three fragments then irrigation with the normal saline and the 25 minutes surgery it takes about uh, removal of the fat gauze piece one cranial caudal and then after 4 hours patient can walk to toilet tackle the epidural bleeding with the help of the special bipolar pottery that comes in the set and the surgical cell operating tube usually sits on the lamina so advantages on the obese patient also 
the three four level, then the four five five base one. Sometimes we are operating from the single port, keeping the bony bridge intact. We can decompress of the same side and opposite side four five and five base one due to the mobile operating view or mobility, and also sometimes the north root which protects and push the north root medially gives lot of space laterally to remove the disc. Opposite side we are doing the over the top decompression by decompressing by removing the little bit of lama in opposite side uh, undercutting also discectomy is possible from the opposite side so unilateral laminotomy bilateral decompression removal the lesion without disturbing the anatomy and stability preserving the motion and function indications are many there are three or four level disc or stenosis no problem we can build very easily we do laminotomy and discectomy if associated. Here is a patient of L4, L5, stenosis. We are doing the bilateral decompression, same side, discectomy, and then discectomy. Going to the opposite side, this is the opposite side, ligamentum clavum, undercutting the lamina. Same carrison points, 45 degree. Sub tissue is for the 90 degree. So 90 degree for the sub tissue, 45 degree for the bone. Opposite side decompression completely. <coughs> the dural tear is the commonest complication, and sometimes the nerve root herniation. We are putting the muscle page, and then over that the surgery cell, and it heals usually because very small lesion. Posterior endoscopic lumbar discectomy and the decompression bilateral simplified approach by distant technique. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Day. Again, uh, it uh, shows the versatility of the distendo technique. And we have with us Dr. Rohidas, who is the pioneer of the uh, adapting this technique in our country. May I request Dr. Rohidas to add a few words from your side? Dr. Rohidas, is he, is he logged in? Uh, no, doctor. Uh, he is not here. He is in the surgery. Oh, he is in the surgery. Right. Thank you. Uh, any questions for uh, Dr. Day? Manu, I think there. Dr. Manu Singh. Yeah. Manu. Can you unmute yourself? No, I don't think. Manu is muted. Yeah. Okay. Hi, guys. Hi. Sorry. Sorry. Welcome, Manu. Thank you. Hi. So, uh, you have also been using this distando system for quite a few years. So, uh, as Dr. Day have already described very nicely the applications as well as the basic step to, uh, step by step technique. Would you wish to add anything from your own experience of using this particular method? Uh, my uh, personal experience is basically limited to using this in the lumbar spine. Right. Uh, I I feel that initially when you start off with the uh, simpler cases of uh, unilateral radiculopathy, one gets to understand the, uh, the intricacies of this system, but it's a very adaptable system and very soon you can start using it, uh, utilizing the mobility which is provided by this system. So a big part of this, uh, the uh, advantage using, of using this system is that you get to uh, do two level decompressions from the same incision you are able to go over across and you are able to actually uh, utilize the mobility to cover a lot of space from a small incision that i feel is one of the basic advantages which we gain using this system right so uh, uh, over and above what i feel uh, than the full endoscopic system is that it offers you the use of regular spinal instruments and uh, one can after a certain uh, number of cases of experience, one can extend it beyond the simple pathologies of uh, just a disc and stenosis and expert hands can manage some kind of uh, spinal tumors as well using this technique. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Manod, can I come in? I'm Dr. Anand. Yes, yes, Dr. Anand, please. Uh, uh, first of all, Dr. Dubey, uh, Dr. Dubey, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, just to add on to what you said, Dr. Bhanot, uh, we have been using this uh, destiny technique for quite some time and uh, we have operated upon 20 odd cases of in, uh, what you suggested as the intradural uh, tumors as well. 
primarily uh, Shwano Mars and Manin Joe Mars, not only at the lumbar level but also at the cervical level. So oh. I fully agree with Dr. Mono saying that uh, once you adapt to the technique, then you can graduate to the next level starting from the L5 S1 PIVD, the L4 L5 PIVD and then thoracic and then you can move on to the cervical level. Um, it is a very, very adaptive technique uh, in the sense that uh, the same, as you rightly mentioned, the same instruments can be used for the uh, tumor excision, the same tumors can be used for lumbar disectomies, and also uh, it can be used for uh, other pathologies like simple uh, canal decompression. So it's a very, very versatile technique. Dr. Anand, now that you uh, mentioned your own experience, uh, I have two, uh, one question which has two parts. One, is the size of the tumor... Uh, does it matter? And two, uh, do you find certain uh, special instruments while opening and repairing the dura? Because in microsurgeries, you have a rather wide field and in the endoscopy, you are just doing a tunnel uh, kind of a thing. So how do you adapt to those two particular issues? Yes, um, um, very important questions. Uh, I uh, See, the, to answer the first question, what we do is primarily we limit the size of the tumor to two lumbar vertebral body only. <clears throat> okay. If it is because, uh, as uh, Dr. De rightly pointed out, that with the distended technique, you can cater to, uh, at the most, uh, uh, ideally to two levels, but perhaps you can stretch to to the three levels disc. But ideally, it focuses on the two level disc. So if the uh, tumor is extending about one to one and a half level of the vertebral body, then this is a very good technique. By that, that is the cutoff limit. Secondly, what we try to do is, in the initial cases, we try to operate upon tumors which are posteriorly placed. Okay. Even the lumbar disc or at, the th uh, at the lumbar level or the thoracic level because entirely placed tumors are much more tougher to deal with. Yes, the instruments are exactly the same. Coming to your second question, um, initially what we used to do is we used to take out the uh, inner sheath and just uh, with the um, presence of the outer sheath, introducing the endoscope and then we used to suture the dura. But that was a very tedious method. Now what I do personally is, uh, I have a talk on that also. So what I personally do is I take an artificial dura. And because what happens is when the tumor is removed, the dura tends to collapse onto, uh, onto itself. So you just keep a piece of an artificial dura over that. And uh, I have done 20 such cases with this uh, artificial dura and uh, there is no CSF leak and no wound complication. So you just add, put the dura there and there is no need to do additional uh, no, 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 no. adhesive or any staple no, on it? No, 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 no. no nothing is required because see, uh, the distance that we use, it has only one and a half to two centimeter incision. Right. And it is a triangular uh, shape. So when you reach the dura, the opening is actually one centimeter. It is about less than a centimeter. So when you reach there, the dura opening is also very minimal. And you can just keep the artificial dura and there is no need to keep the, uh, trying to suture the dura because that is practically impossible to su suture the dura in such a narrow corridor. Do you find, do you find that there is ever an instance of this dural patch shifting or a leak happening? Or... Uh, Dr. Manu, uh, there was one patient in which there was the radiological uh, CSF pseudo the, the, uh, the about, a, about one and a half centi uh, about one centimeter of uh, CSF pseudo meningocele was found, but the patient was apparently asymptomatic, so we did nothing for that patient. Apart from that, there is no need for because the, uh, what I use is a Duragen, it has a sense of an adhesive uh, uh, structure to it. So once Dr. Anand, I am cutting you short. Sorry, uh, we no, just no. got a call from Dr. Rohidas. He is no, ready no. with the case and is exposed. So may I request the other two speakers, Dr. Ketan and Dr. Sukumar, just kindly wait. Uh, we'll just join Dr. Uh, Rohidas in the theater. And once he's done with the critical steps, then we'll just switch over to your talks in between. Okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, may I request the uh, organizing team to uh, switch over to their theater uh, telecast? No, doctor. Uh, we have Dr. Hyun Sing, uh, Kim Hyun Sung from Korea with us. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Thank you for joining. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> good to see you. Yes. Good good symposium. Very nice. Thank you. So we'll just switch over to the theater and then we'll have uh, uh, some discussion with Dr. Kim as well. He is one of the pioneers in a lot of full endoscopic techniques and uh, published a lot of uh, uh, breakthrough papers on this particular technique, especially the interlaminar one. Uh, Dr. Rohidas, are we there with Dr. Rohidas? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Yes. Dr. Rohidas. You are able to hear me? Yes, yes, we are able to hear yeah, you. But you are able to see the MRI now? 
no we are not able to see the mri can i uh, request the organizing team to switch over to the uh, ot telecast mri dakha santala ya camera yes now we can see that okay yes. this is a 72 year male okay presented with pain in both the lower limbs right and uh, numbness in both the lower limbs and perineal and perianal analgesia okay he is he has diabetes for 35 years his hypertension also angioplasty is done okay now this is the mri which shows l4 5 severe canal stenosis facetal ligamentum slam hypertrophy with a disc bulge if we see the mri both the spinous processes of l4 and l5 have stuck together there is no interlaminar space in between okay yes you yes you can see the axial also no we can't see the axials uh, yes yeah the wire cut the cut so yes this is a severe l4 5 severe canal stenosis it's a, a difficult case for a demonstration also nothing is difficult for you sir <laughs> i'll show you the uh, plain x ray now and i'll uh, show the endoscopic picture now i have exposed uh, we have induced the patient positioned the patient uh, we have done the localization and we have exposed the l4 5 and l5 and, and you mentioned he does not have any significant symptoms of back pain no right and we have uh, for the diabetes we have done a emg and cv also and there is no significant diabetic neuropathy also correct so that's why of 35 years of true. diabetes right. absolutely organizers could you please enlarge the view the mri pictures and the ot view we'll show we'll show now this is the ap x ray you are able to see yes yes we are yeah we are able to see but not enlarge view yes if you see the distance between the l4 5 and l5 there is no interlaminar distance you are able to appreciate yes Yes, this sir. is the lateral inflection and extension don't no listhesis no instability okay yes roy das gari yeah we will go to the endoscopic picture now yes please meanwhile anybody if if anybody wants to see the axial they can see the axial again <coughs> drill i don't know this a picture is very small i don't know you are able to see the axial but the picture is uh, i don't know the other people how i am not able to see the picture properly because this is very small only there are many views uh, viewers uh, in the same um, uh, box I think, i think the hall be in charge should uh, just enlarge the view yeah if the it it guy can just enlarge it Uh, we have pinned the video, doctor. It's uh, in the full screen itself. Uh, no, it is not coming the full screen. It's so not it, coming full screen for us. It's okay, PC. We will start with the endoscopic thing. Ah, uh, now it is full full screen. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Now just keep in mind, keep in mind the AP X-ray. Okay, and the 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 uh, actual of the MRI. Okay. Now, are you able to see the endoscopic picture? Yes. Yeah. Now this is L four. Correct. This is L five, correct. This is L five. This is L four. Okay. Yes. This is in between. This is the spinous process of L five. Correct. This is the spinous process of L four. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So we have to start from here. We might have to bar out this spinous process also for adequate canal decompression. Correct. Got it? Yeah. So this left approach spinous process of l5 is tilted to, tilted towards the left side so left approach you are approaching from the left side i am approaching from the left side okay so we'll start from here so this is a spinal laminar junction at l4 this is l4 correct this is the l5 spinous process i'll bore out this and create little bit more space so that the outer tube fits inside correct 
What is the size of the bar? It is 5 mm. And I am using Midas Rex drill. Diamond? Midas Rex drill, regular drill, no diamond. Okay. You are happy with the endoscopic picture? Yes, good picture. This is 2D what you are seeing. I am operating with 3D. Correct. 2D we are relaying outside. एवरीथिंग इज डिफॉर्मड हिअर to be very careful in such cases go step by step how old Don't is be in hurry how old age of the patient 72 oh. This is the spinous process L4. Yes. Now in this case, I have to go to the opposite side also. So I have to create a little bit more space so that I can go on the opposite side by burying the base of the spinous process. Okay. Yes. This is L5 spinous process. Even the intraspinous ligament is degenerated. Yeah, it seems to be like that. This is the cranial part of L5. There is almost no interlaminal space. This is the cranial part of L5. You mean L5 lamina? Yeah. Tip of the spinous process lamina. where yeah. the lamina is it attached? Okay. Yeah. Spinal junction even. Now you see. So both the lamina almost kissing. There is no interlaminar space now. I'm I'm using now three mm carison patch. Bone is osteoporotic. Now we are in uh, Nietzsche's position, am I right? Patient is in? Nietzsche's position. Yes. Ah, I, I always use Nietzsche's position, unless the patient yeah, has some knee problem no, or hip just problem. For, uh, just for the big, uh, viewers, the point of where the knee position is, there is no space at all. In Nietzsche's position, usually the uh, interspinous distraction due to distraction, the space increases. But yeah. here, but here there is no space at all. That means it's total tight. Yeah. 
Now, organizers, uh, so please uh, enlarge the view, operation view. Any organizing team, please uh, uh, enlarge the uh, picture. Yes, yes. Dr. Rohidas, uh, yes. you like to remove your lamina along with your uh, bony clearance or uh, you do it later after you establish those boundaries because uh, right now here we see you uh, removing the lamina, the, uh, uh, sorry, not the lamina, the ligament of flavum along with your, uh, as you are, you know, the setting. Uh, no, this, is the, this is the inner part of the, the ligament of flavum has two layers, no? This yes. is the outer layer we, which I have removed. The inner layer, I have kept it intact. Now, this is the L4 lamina. I have to remove part of this L4 lamina significantly till the ligamentum flam attachment is detached. Okay. Now you can see this is the interlaminar window now, okay? This is yes, the yes. L5 attachment of flower. Correct. The inferior attachment of the flower. You can flavum. appreciate this is the tip of the L5 in the midline. This is the lamina of L5. Okay. I might do a hemilaminectomy of L5. Okay. So as to have good decompression. And after the decompression, I'll decide whether I want to do discectomy or not. Drill. Yes, discectomy after the uh, decompression complete, you have to assess because it is uh, all magnified view. Everything will be in front of you after the decompression complete decompression of the same side. You can uh, feel and you can see the disc. If it is uh, already huge on or compression or is a part of the compression effect, then you have to remove. Now, this is the plane between the flavum and the L5. Okay. You can appreciate this. I'll zoom it, zoom in. You can appreciate this? Yes, yes. Yes. So I have to go inside with the carison punch. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Now, first time you are you are able to see Dura here. Okay? This is the Dura. Yes. Got it? Yes, yes, yes. Now, this is the best of part of distant view. You can zoom in out. With 2D, you can enlarge the picture also. I'm going laterally now. Everything is under vision. Yes. Now I'll go cranial. Cranially, your ligamentum plavum is not detached yet. From the from the I have to remove lamina. significant part of lamina. Correct.
डॉक्टर रोहिदास सर हाउ मच लेटरल डू यू गो वॉट इज द लेटरल एक्सटेंट ऑफ द रिसेप्शन टिल आई सी दैटरल एज ऑफ द ड्यूरा Now this is hypertrophied facet, superior articular process of L5. everything is stuck together there is uh, one request i have for the organizers or please uh, pin dr rohidas's video onto the screen because every time somebody else is spe else speaks his video shows up and on live stream on youtube it's causing a problem because they cannot pin uh, dr rohidas's video those on zoom they can but not people on live stream on youtube so uh, somebody please pin dr rohidas's uh, surgical video to the screen This is the part of the C uh, L four. Sorry. अच्छा 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 सर अच्छा सर I'll do that sir. Okay sir. no i will lift this flavum okay got it i have detached it and then i'm uh dr day has uh, lost his internet connection Darajamani, would you please uh, moderate the session, sir? I'm in. I'm in. Thank you, sir. You know, you remove the alpha inferior facet, the osteoids. So, how far of a clearance have you obtained, Doctor Rajdas? Could you just give us a, a few pointers about the steps you performed so far? Monu, yes, sir. Are you asking me? Yes, I am asking you to just. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm not able to hear you clearly. Okay, sir. Um, 
Sorry. Now you see, I am removing the ligamentum flam. Now the best thing is, unless you detach the ligamentum flam attachment from the lamina, cranial lamina, caudal lamina, and facet. And how much? You are not able to remove it. How much of the facet have you removed, sir? Here you have to detach it and then remove. Otherwise, you are. Have you just removed anything about the inferior facet of L4? Inferior facet of L4. You showed us the superior facet of L5. Uh, now I'll show you. I I have reached the lateral edge of the dura. I'll just zoom in yeah, and yeah. show you. Yeah. You see. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the lateral edge of the dura. Got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the disc face. Yeah. And a root is going down. Are you able to see the root? Yeah, well, 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 well. Yeah. Yes, yes, clear, clear. Now this clear. is the root. I am in the axilla. This is shoulder, axilla, root going down. And this is the disc space. Whether you are removed portion of the inferior facet of L4? Yes. Yeah. Now you see this is. Yeah. This is L5. I'll remove a little bit part of this and then I'll go to the opposite side. So what is your plan? Are you going to remove the disc? Let's see. I think the disc seems to be quite degenerated. You see, you see here. Yes. And this yes. is quite like. Let's see. We'll decompress the opposite side and then we'll decide. Correct. Okay. But normal root is seems to be very uh, lax now. There is no tightness or any compression effect. Now the root will be completely decompressed. I'm going into the foramen here. I'll show you the root now. This is the root. Axilla, very shoulder, good. I'm able to mobilize it, correct? Yeah, very. very you see the annulus doesn't seem, seems to be quite nice. I mm. might have to do discectomy. Let's see. Patty. Now I have to go to the opposite side, okay? Yes. Patty. This is the cotonoid on the opposite side. I'll protect the dura with the cotonoid. Correct. This carison is 3 mm 45 degree? 3 mm 45 degrees. The, the advantage of distant system is you, are, you, you have very limited instruments. Yes. This is the base of the spinous process L4. Four. Yes. This is the cottonite which I have used to retract the muscle. Gush piece. This is a gush piece. 
are using midas system am i right huh we are using midas bar system yes yes that is midas yeah. midas regular bar 5 mm he is using 5 mm उट बांगता है पिक्चर साइड प्रोटेक्टिव स्लीव एट एनी टाइम Rohit sir are you are you using the slips with the drill bit can you speak loudly are you using the protection sleeve are you using the using the drill bit with slip to protect the dura drill bit with with a, with a protection sheet no 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 that i used to use use before yeah, yeah, yeah now yeah, yeah. i'm not using yes now uh, with this 3d everything is clear i'm more aggressive now i i i know your experience judge this question was asked for the beginners <laughs> you see you have to invest in ot yeah. not in your house and farm house <laughs> you are more powerful if you have more equipment Uh, even i was not using uh, this uh, drill bit uh, till now i think for last 6 month only 6 month back i started using the drill bit it is definitely uh, saving the time and uh, easy still uh, though i am not using the protection uh, sheet i am directly using i started like that only but i have seen the rohidas was using a protection sheet previously nowadays he is not using that he is very confident Now this is on the opposite side, Lavam. But for the beginner, I think it is advisable to keep a petty at least on the dura while uh, using the drill bit yeah. or drill. How much spine you remove, uh, Roy? Now uh, this is on the opposite side, lateral. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. This is ipsilateral. This is opposite side. Now I have to remove this flywarm and the petty. So we are not able to uh, appreciate the lateral aspect of the opposite side of the dura. Hmm. Petty. The last line. This is a cotonoid in between dural tube and the flywarm. Okay. Correct. Correct. So I am pro protecting it with the cotonoid, and I have created space also there. Okay. Yes. Now, this is the plane between the opposite facet lamina and the flywarm. You are able to appreciate this plane. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You see, I am detaching the flywarm. Got it? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now what I will do? I will undercut this. I have gone up to the lateral edge. Correct. Correct. This is the lateral edge of the dura. So you are you are going to undercut the bone of the opposite side. Now I will I will undercut the bone so that I am I am able to remove the flywarm easily. So and during the cutting the bone of the opposite side. Now you you see I am undercutting the bone and what are the protecting structures? Flywarm and the cotonoid. Yes. Principles are same to protect neural structures in open microscopic 
प्योर एंडोस्कोपिक अनप्योर एंडोस्कोपिक एवरीथिंग यस एब्सोल्युटली द प्रिंसिपल इज द सेम सर्जरी इज द सेम सर दी यंगस्टर शुड नो हाउ टू डू अ ओपन सर्जरी एंड अप्लाई दोस थिंग्स विथ एंडोस्कोप now i have created space my outer tube is going inside also you are able to see this flame on the outer side yes opposite side yes still the, the attachment to the caudal end is still intact so i'll re detach from the caudal we have detached the flamum cranially now this is lateral and this is caudal now correct now this is not possible with microscope which one to which see the opposite see? lateral races now you can appreciate this this yes. is a flamum correct this is the opposite lateral facet and the undercut lamina correct Yeah, yeah, yes. able to see space inside this is not possible with the fixed system or with small endoscope you need to have a very good quality of vision now this is the opposite side flavum okay yes i have lot of space to pass 3 mm carison punch can you use 90 degree ha huh? No, that is same forty-five. It's ninety degree punch. No, no forty-five. Same forty-five degree. Always use forty-five. Yeah, most of the time, yeah. because he is taking the bite from the bone itself. So along with the bone, he is taking the bite from the inferior lamina. I try to remove ligamentum as a single piece. I don't go in between the ligamentum flap and go up and down to remove it. Yeah. that is dangerous try to go in the same direction of the attachment of the flavum okay. now you see this is on the opposite side okay now this is the nerve root on the opposite side you see yes. yeah clear this is the shoulder yes. axilla is here Yes. I'll remove this part. I have reached the opposite lateral edge. Correct. Can you sir just zoom in a little bit? Now, Doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's very nice. This is good. This is in the opposite neural foramen. Yeah, absolutely. That's Everything is under vision. this is opposite lateral edge facet now this is the opposite side of the disc you can able you are able to see the disc yes 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 so this much of decompression is enough now now on the opposite side i have not violated the facet joint i just undercut it okay yes muscle attachment is still intact this flavum which is forming the superior foramen ligament in the foraminal region this goes up and forms the superior foraminal ligament where the exciting root is there yeah. irrigation beta din iron peroxide irrigation no first part is over decompression sometimes what happens with distend you the opposite side decompression is more aggressive than the ipsilateral this is because of the angle and this is the opposite sided root beta din iron peroxide
even i feel it is easier even the, uh, even very easy to go to the opposite side and decompress the opposite side nowadays i am doing decompressing the opposite side first then coming to the same side okay is sir yeah i am feeling better because once you are tilting the instrument little bit keeping all the structures of the ligamentum flammar of the same side to okay. protect the dura without removing that i go to the opposite side it will be easier and protected dura is protected so finish the work of the opposite side when okay. all the ligamentum flammum is intact so all the dura whole the of the length of the dura is protected finish of the work of the opposite side come to the same side then remove the ligamentum flammum so you prefer to go to opposite side proximal and then lateral then distal am i right yeah proximal and lateral then distal and then finish the work of the opposite side come to the same side pretty choti are you going to do discectomy as well dr rohit I am just seeing it and just uh, uh, inspecting the annulus. No, he is. If it is lax, I'll remove it. How much the disc is there? If it is really the pathology is still there, it is imp impinging to the nerve root. Then the he disc is there is no compromise in the disc height as a, at the age of seventy two also. Choti pati. Right. Uh, I have passed a cotonoid cranially. This is the shoulder of the nerve root. Okay, and this is the complete disc which we are able to see. I'll pass a cotonoid down. Let's see. Lateral and lateral and anterior aspect of the root. Yes. Now this is the annulus. Now it is lax. You, okay, you can appreciate this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We just push up the pain field. I could enter that. I'll do the discectomy now. But can they? But I will not be aggressive. It is all degenerative disc. So what is the rationale for uh, annulus being lax and then you doing discectomy if the annulus is lax in after in future he might have some problems okay right so to prevent that okay Means your the annulus is not is lax. The disc annulus is quite tight and intact. Why to go inside and remove the disc then? Okay. So here is as the annulus is uh, lax. You are expecting some maybe some annulus injury or maybe tear in future. That's why you are going to uh, you have decided to remove the disc. It's a degenerated disc. You can see, right? So, yeah. Doctor Rohit, you see, you are almost at the end of your procedure. Is that right? Yes. So, if you permit, can we move to the second uh, surgery? Doctor uh, Ketan Deshpande is also ready with his case now. Don't wait for a minute. Wait for a minute. Okay. I'll need around okay. two, three minutes now. Okay, sure. Rohit, okay, when do you decide not to? You can see the amount of the disc here. Yeah. At the end, I will show you the amount of the disc. Just wait, two three minutes. Once we say stop from here, or uh, we'll start closing. Let Ketan start the his surgery. Yeah, the good amount of the disc. Well done, well done, Roy. Does so they they seem to be loose fragments. So your decision is justified here to prevent any early disc herniation. Now in India, the surgeon and the patient both have internal feeling that with this one surgery only we have to solve <laughs> each right. and every problem. Yes. <laughs> patient also now you can see the loose fragments now or, yeah, yeah yes that's right or if you do one one for three one more for three <laughs> yeah the same no, no i i fully agree a lot of surgeons uh, feel the same not only the patient that i should be doing only one surgery whereas all of us know that sometimes you have to do a repeat one correct absolutely 
one should not be apologetic about it once i am able to irrigate it hi arun hi how are you good <laughs> i think is disconnected yeah 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 the connection has gone from ruidas ot ruidas hello Want to probably yes, are able to listen me? Later. I think it disconnected. Yeah, probably they are going to connect to the other theater. Yeah, maybe yes. Okay. In, in the meantime, uh, may I request the organizer to Irrigation. start Dr. Ketan Desh Pandey's presentation? If Dr. Rohidas is already disconnected, because Dr. Ketan will be demonstrating the surgery, so it would be appropriate for his. Uh, talk to be telecast yes, first can you just wait i'll i'll show you Ketan the Desh. end part and then we are not, stop this we are, dr rohidas we are not able to see your video feed there is some problem in telecast here light baga bagun gaya bagun gaya tala bagun gaya sang right now nahi to janata shuru kara now you are back okay okay we are with you dr rohidas now now wait now this is the left sided route No, we are not able to see the inside picture. Only outside is you will be able to see. Can I do endoscopy? Can I do? We are not able to see your endoscopic view. One minute. Where is on the camera? Ah, yes. Now can you are able to see? Yes. Yes. Ah, yeah. yes uh, now you see we have decompressed the canal. This is the left-sided traversing route. This is the right-sided traversing route. Correct. Correct. And we have done a discectomy. adequate discectomy we'll stop yeah. at this point okay yeah thank you good now you can carry on with this second yes. case uh, the case with uh, dr ketan excellent demonstration and uh, as i said nothing is difficult for you even the most difficult cases you see make them seem very simple and easy thank you thank you the thing is we was it is very easy and then it they should jail form don't jail form <laughs> that is true with all all good surgeons operating the viewer always sees it's a very easy surgery yeah 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 <laughs> always uh, it gives a warm feeling how difficult it is those who do it on the morning okay uh, we move to the Therefore, next talk uh, the organizer can you uh, switch uh, dr rohidas telecast off 3:30 ja lena IT support. Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. It will be switched in. Yeah. Can you just? Ah, okay. Yeah, please. So, uh, Doctor uh, Ketan is now scrubbing and starting the case. In the meantime, let's uh, listen to his talk first, because that will make the uh, understanding of the surgery easier. Doctor Ketan Deshpande's talk on uh, UBE, unilateral bile. Doctor, should we play his video presentation? Yes, yes, that's right. Play his video. He'll be able to take any questions uh, with the mic on. टेक्निक <laughs> as the name indicates it's unilateral so there are two ports but they are on the same side of the midline and the two ports are one is a scopic port and the second one is a working channel 
as you can see in this picture the yellow line is the midline the blue line is an imaginary line on the uh, one centimeter lateral to the midline the red line is the disc level and there are two ports which lie on either side of the disc level but on the same side of the midline one is a scoping and the second one is a working portal uh, and like any other joint which has a contained cavity in spine we don't have that luxury so what we use is a potential space which lies beneath the fascicles of the multipedus fiber. So this triangle here which lies medial to that particular fascicle is the potential space which we have to explore to perform this particular procedure. The picture on the left hand side shows the approach for UBE and the picture on the right hand side which shows the approach for a MED technique. Uh, in UBE since it is done under continuous irrigation there has to be a continuous flow of water which goes in from the endoscopic portal accumulates at the target area and it comes out through the working portal as is seen in this video there has to be a continuous outflow of irrigation fluid going in from the scopic portal and coming out from the working portal uh, the operative preparations are it the procedure is done under general or epidural anesthesia the position is exactly same like that of a microdiscectomy you need to have a special fluid collection back and cm radiography is absolutely necessary for this particular procedure uh, as you can see that the surgeon is standing on the symptomatic side of the patient. Uh, in his left hand, he uses the scope. From his right hand, he uses uh, he uh, uses it for passing the instruments through the working portal. The CM is from the opposite end of the table and the video trolley is on one side and the CM monitor is on the other side of the CM. The rest of the equipments are a video trolley, a 4 millimeter scope which can either be a 0 degree, 12 degree, 15 or a 13 degree with trocar cannula a good shaver system, radio frequency cautery, some specialized UBE instruments and the rest are general spine instruments. The operative steps include marking the skin portals, initial target point and the working space, triangulation, radio frequency soft tissue clearance and the rest of the procedure is same as that of a open or a micro lumbar decompression. So we start by marking the midline, then we go and mark the working portal. We confirm the position on the CM. Then we mark the scopic portal, which is approximately 2 to 3 centimeter cranial to that of the working portal. We haven't taken the skin incision yet. Then we go into the CM lateral view. We put some pointers, some metallic pointers, and we check the CM lateral view. Here, the black dotted line is the scopic line, and the red dotted line is the line from which the working portal, the instruments are coming into picture. We take the skin incision and the facial incision for the working portal first. Then we use a blunt dilator. We go and feel the laminospinal junction of the, of the cranial lamina. We confirm it on the CM. Once that is confirmed, we serially dilate this track. Once dilatation is complete, we start working on creating the space. So we work on the upper lamina, we work on the interlaminar space, we work on the lower lamina space. This is how the space is created. Once that is done, the dilators, they come out and we go and uh, take the incision for the scopic portal. The scopic portal is approximately 2 to 3 centimeters on the cranial aspect of the working portal. The incision is approximately 5 millimeters. Fascia is also cut in line with the skin incision. The trocar cannula is passed through that skin incision and we touch the tip of these two instruments and we confirm the position again on CM that we are still at the cranial uh, laminospinal junction level. <clears throat> we do this kind of a waddling movement to, uh, so as to facilitate the flow of the irrigation fluid from the cranial aspect over to the interlaminar space and coming out through the lower port. Uh, this is the space that we have created. We have to explore this space. That's the orientation. Left side is cranial, right side is caudal, 12 o'clock is medial and 6 o'clock is lateral. We start by working on the upper lamina. We use a radio frequency cautery to expose the upper lamina, the interlaminar space and uh, eventually the lower lamina also. This picture is very important wherein the yellow line is uh, showing the spinous process, the red line is showing the lamina and the orange dot in the center is showing the laminospinal junction. That is the exact point which we need to isolate uh, before we start working on this particular, uh, with this particular procedure. The rest of the procedure is same. We are very, very much accustomed to this particular approach. So the initial part of the procedure is only different. The rest is same as uh, otherwise you would do for a micro lumbar decompression or a tubular decompression. 
uh, what all procedures can be done by using this particular approach? A single level surgery, yes. A two level surgery, yes. Multi level surgery is definitely possible. You just need to keep on adding one separate incision and just shifting from one level to the adjacent level. Cervical UBE, yes, of course it's possible. Also, it's possible to do a complete instrumented interbody fusion or a UBE T lift procedure using the same particular approach. So what we are, so what is different that we are doing here? Uh, we are combining the advantages of tubular decompression and that of unipotal end, uh, endoscopy. So the versatility of tubular decompression and the advantages of unipotal uh, endoscopy in the form of the eye being inside the body of the patient in the form of camera, the continuous irrigation pressure giving you a fluid medium for surgery, uh, reducing collateral damage because of some heat generating instruments because of continuous irrigation flow, redu uh, reducing the blood flow giving you a better picture. And we are combining these two advantages of tubular as well as uniportal endoscopy in the form of unilateral biportal endoscopy. So the major uh, advantages include fluid medium surgery, the ease of approach, better visualization and broader indications. I thank you for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Ketan. Uh, <clears throat> very nice presentation and excellent demonstration of the surgical technique. And uh, if you are ready, can we join you in the theater for the same or should we proceed with the next talk by Dr. Sukumar? Ketan, are you there? He's not able to okay. hear me. Okay, then uh, we go ahead with the uh, Dr. Sukumar's talk and finish the uh, talks in this session and then we join Hello. Dr. Ketan in the theater. Can you can you get on with the talk for, by Dr. Sukumar? Hello. The organizing team, please. Hello. Yes, doctor. Hello. He's not yes, able please. To... No, please no, 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 start no, no, no. Dr. Sukumar's talk first and then we go to Dr. Ketan for the surgery. Hello, Dr. Banod. Yes, Ketan. Uh, yeah. You can start scrubbing, etc. And then no, sir, we'll we just... are actually ready. My mic was not connected. So I was okay, just okay. trying to so tell then... you the same oh. thing. We are almost ready. So can I start with this? Yes, go ahead. Then we go to the theater. We'll uh, finish Dr. Uh, Sukuma's talk later then. Sure. Are you able to see the video? No, we are not. Can you just... Uh, the organizing team, can you just uh, connect us to the OT feed from Dr. Th uh, Ketan's OT? No, no, mic is there. They want this video. Yeah, yes, Ketan. We are able to yes, see show you. the MRI. We are not able to see you. So the video is on? Yeah, no, no we are just able audio. to hear you. There is no video feed from your side. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, this is a case of L45 uh, disc prolapse. The patient uh, has. Ketan, Ketan, please uh, wait for uh, the. Uh, the yeah, yeah. IT guy to connect the feed because we are not able Anil, to see. Anil, Anil this is Prashant here. Uh, please uh, unmute us. We are not uh, able to unmute the video from here. Uh, video is not on. Video is not on. Okay. Sir, I think you are getting yes. the video now. Uh, yes, yes. Now we are able to see you. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, so go ahead, I, Ketan. Yeah. Yes. I'll yes. just explain you the MRI first. Yes, please. Yeah. Can you focus on the MRI? So this is a case of L45 uh, disc collapse. She has a predominant uh, right-sided uh, disc herniation, as seen on these axial images. Are you able to see this? Not kindly ask the cameraman to focus properly. It's a blurred image. You go closer and uh, focus properly. On this line. Zoom in. Zoom Slightly in. better but still, still not uh, that clear. Yeah, zoom in please. Zoom in more.
इज इट बेटर नाउ मेरी है जी yes. मेरी है जी या या नाउ वी कैन yes yeah so this is the first uh, axial cut at l45 level you can see that there is a right sided uh, paracentral disc herniation which is extending down almost four cuts so slightly down migrated disc herniation also there is a tail piece which is extending over to the left side also but the patient has predominantly right sided symptoms you can see that uh, in the sagittal cuts also if you can focus here so there is a disc herniation which is extending almost up to the posterior one third of the lower body so it's a down migrated right sided paracentral disc herniation so what we are Correct. planning today is so what we are planning today is l45 ub will be using the left sided approach go over the top contralateral sublaminar way and uh, do the surgery or remove the disc from the right side marker please so any preference of going from the left side is it because of your right handed or uh... yeah it's easy going from the uh, left side for a right handed surgeon for right handed approach it is also possible and in this case i want to see both the traverse both sided uh, exiting uh, traversing routes because there is a fragment which is extending on the left side as well uh, the down okay. migrated tail part of it so i want to see both the l5 routes in this case So I prefer. So you will be also doing something like a uh, bilateral decompression with the yes, same sir. approach. Yes, yes, sir. Over the top and bilateral. So the first line that we are marking here on the AP view is the midline. So the spinous processes are marked here. The second line that I am drawing here is roughly representing the uh, lower pedicle, which is one centimeter lateral to the midline. See, I am shoot, please. Can you ask the CM guy to uh, the cameraman to yeah. focus on CM? cm show us the cm images yes sir he is doing that so that is on the lower edge of the l5 pedicle or yes. the middle of the yes. l5 no uh, at the lower edge of the l5 pedicle because if you see the interlaminar window at l45 right. level the predominantly the lateral most uh, the lateral most bulging part of the interlaminar window that is where i pull, i place my incision and i will be going oblique like this see i am shoot please and my target point is somewhere or here so somewhere in between so the entry point is somewhere in between l5 and uh, the spinous processes of l5 and the pedicle of l5 1 cm lateral to the midline and going obliquely targeting the l4 spinolaminar junction the second point so that i am not at the l5 pedicle and <coughs> you direct it cranially Yes, go obliquely and land on the L4 uh, spinolaminar junction. The second right. point that I'm going to mark is this one. Shoot, please. So this roughly corresponds to the upper pedicle. So this is okay. this is going to be my scopic portal. The previous one is going to be my uh, working channel. So now I'll ask the CM person to go in lateral view, straight, and then lateral. Can I just stand here? That's <laughs> okay. so we have just uh, done the skin marking of these two portals in lateral view i'll put some markers on top of these points and we'll just confirm whether the uh, the triangulation part which is going to be happening inside we can just approximate whether it is in the right direction or not thoda sa height niche le lo fir ho jayega that's okay so now i'm putting two markers on these two points and we'll be checking the lateral view thoda sa leg ki taraf aa jao more towards the leg yeah shoot please height upar karo uska thoda थोड़ा सा सीएम लेग की तरफ या शूट क्लियर पिक्चर या कैन यू सी दिस सीएम पिक्चर नाउ यस द लैटरल इज नॉट सो क्लियर व्हाट आर यू ट्राइंग टू डू ऑन द लैटरल व्यू 
I am just putting the markers on the. Uh, I am just putting some metallic markers on the points that we had marked on AP view, and I am trying okay. to confirm yeah. that my scopic portal, which is the line seen on the upper part, should right. This one, the scopic portal, has to be in line with the disc, and this portal should. This is going to be the working portal. This has to be parallel to the lamina, so it has to land on to the lamina. And when I check them both simultaneously, should. So we have to approximately see that the upper laminospinal junction is the target where these two, uh, where these two tags are going to meet. So I'm happy with this targeting. I'll go back into AP view and I'll start the procedure. AP. So Ketan, can I ask a question to you now? Sure. I'm Dr. P. C. Day from Bhubaneswar. Yes, sir. Yeah, your upper uh, this uh, scopy portal should be parallel to the disc space, right? Yes, sir. Okay. The upper scopic portal is straight, bang on to the disc. And the lower one is roughly corresponding to the lower pedicle, obliquely going towards the disc. For the height so of PC, the level, PC. Yeah. What do you mean by parallel to the disc space? Yeah, means that is a uh, in lateral view. In lateral in, view. In line with the disc space. In, in line, line with the disc space. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And your port, uh, endoscopy port should be at a forty-five degree angle. Approximately. Yeah. Yeah. So now I am taking the incision of the. Working portal, an approximately 1.5 centimeter incision. Although the skin incision is straight, my facial incision is going to be oblique, like we had seen in the lateral view. See, I'm cutting the fascia obliquely here. Now I will use the obturator to go in and feel the upper laminospinal junction. Okay. CM shoot, please. Okay. Can you focus the CM? So as you can see, the tip of my obturator is at the upper laminospinal junction. What I'm trying to do here is feel the end of the lamina and the beginning of the spinous process, the junction of those two. So I check it in this way also, and then I slide upwards and feel the spinous process also. So this is the target point where those two points are supposed to meet. I'll use the dilators now. The longer one first, yeah. So the first dilator goes in. The second dilator goes in on top of it. We do some amount of soft tissue clearance like this. So I'm clearing the upper lamina now. Then we move towards the interlamina space. I feel the lower lamina, and we do some lower laminar clearance as well. So this is where we are creating the space beneath the fascicle not, of multifidus uh, muscle. Just interfering, Ketana. We are not able to see the outside picture. Yes. Okay. Now it is okay. So now I am on the upper upper uh, spinal laminar junction. I am clearing the L4 lamina like this. Right. Then sliding on to the interlaminar space and then over the lower lamina. Right. So that's how I create the space below the multifidus fascicle. Now the dilators they come out. And I take the second stab incision for the scopic portal. You are using eleven number blade. Yes, blade, please. So this incision is slightly smaller as we are using a four mm scope. So just half a centimeter incision, and here the facial cut is in line with the incision because this incision was. In line to the disc level, and we directly go in with this blunt tip uh, trocar cannula. We just go in straight, and now what I'm trying to do is touch the tip of those two instruments, and trying to make triangulation, trying to create space triangulation. Yes, and I'm trying to be at the same point, and we'll just confirm it in CM in just a minute. So you are at the spinal laminar junction again. Yes. Uh, CM shoot, please. Can you focus on the CM? Yeah. So my scope and my uh, obturator, both the tips are touching each other. I can feel that on the CM we have confirmed that it is at the same spinal laminar junction at L4-5 level on the left hand side, and this is where the CM goes out and the scope comes in. Out, please. I want the half sleeve. 
those two sleeves we have use the the longer one no no just detach this only give me half part of it so we use this kind of a semi circular tube to keep the uh, facial opening intact for the initial part of the procedure and it facilitates the flow of irrigation outside we do this waddling movement also so as to create a pathway of least resistance for the irrigation fluid to come out scope and that that part is that, that instrument is only for the operating uh, this uh, uh, working fluid yeah. yeah because for you are using 30 here you already degree. have a trocar cannula right you are using 30 degree scope or 0 degree <laughs> i am using a 12 degree scope this one is specially designed for ube okay on please okay okay yeah can i have the obturator again this uh, this scope is also designed by dr son sorry this scope is also designed by the dr son yes They have can, made, can you tell why uh, twelve degree is important here, sir? They have uh, it's kind of a trial and error. They have used fifteen degree, zero degree, thirty degree, twelve degree, multiple of them, and they okay. found out this to be the best suitable one for ipsilateral as well as contralateral work. So they are using this. This screen, थोड़ा सा छोटा कर सकते हैं. It's too big of a screen. The video is too big. स्क्रीन थोड़ा छोटा हो सकता है इसका देर इज नो वर्किंग पोर्टल वी आर यूजिंग टू सेपरेट पोर्टल वन इज अपिक पोर्टल एंड द अदर इज वर्किंग चैनल द वर्किंग चैनल स्क्रीन इन सीजन इज वन पॉइंट फाइव मिलीमीटर्स दिस इज जस्ट स्क्रीन इन सीजन एंड फैसल इन सीजन जस्ट ओपन there is no uh, portal or not there is no uh, nothing no instrumentation only they say incision is 1.5 cm as that you said yeah and you so first what i did was i inserted this rf can you see the endoscopic view now no yes now uh, yes going going coming like that get the endoscope in the bigger picture No, it so it is, is there in the bigger picture, there. but it is too big to appreciate anything. Yeah, yeah. Can you? And you were Can asking you them to size? reduce the size. That is correct, but then they have yeah. not been able to do it. Just reduce the size of the inside picture, endoscopic picture. Maybe you can do it from your own camera as well. Display. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. Yeah, you can reduce the size. फ्रॉम युअर हैंड जस्ट ट्यून अप लिटल बिट मोर फोकस स्मॉलर बटन ये स्मॉलर बटन फोकस ये बेटर ये बेटर ओके if it is better for you it will be better for us as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes so now once I'm you are clear with the landmarks just orient us uh, in the beginning yeah the orientation part is quite simple disc forceps uh, since i am standing on the left side uh, left side of the patient the yeah. left hand side that is the 9 o'clock position is going to be the cranial part the 3 o'clock position is going to be the caudal part 
the 12 o'clock position is the medial aspect and clean little bit ketan clean little bit you take one minute then you will show us better just uh, clean little bit because there is uh, picture is little oh. hazy everything red anarchy need to clean i guess dr roidas how to have this big screen of the surgery not able to hear you clearly sir wo jo abhi surgery dikha rahe hai usko enlarge kaise karna hai big screen kaisa karna hai usko sir right now to big screen pe hi hai wo majorly to mujhe nahi big screen mein main sab sab logon ko dekh raha hu sir bhi kuch gadbad aapke system mein hai baki to dikh raha hai sabko wo bol ke maine ye kiya hai lekin sir go on the right hand right hand corner you have राइट हैंड कर्नर में व्यू है ना उस व्यू है उसमें मिल 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 गया 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 ओके ओके यू यू सी एनी पंप ऑन फोर्स नो ओनली विद द सो नाउ आई हैव लोकलाइज्ड द एंड 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 इन सॉरी डिट गेट दैट pump is contraindicated in ub pump uh, pump pump isn't contraindicated as long as you have a clear uh, outflow of the fluid which is if you can see that the irrigation fluid is sufficiently coming out from the opposite end then pump is not a contraindication you can use it but i prefer using a gravitational uh, this thing at it it gives me a mental peace that I, i after opening the epidural space i am not worried about increase intracranial pressure because of you can send height of the saline bottle or uh, yeah just sorry height of the saline bottle height. yeah yeah, yeah. Sir, height It's approximately 6 feet we have put it at the maximum so this is the so let's start with the orientation now so this side yeah. the 9 o'clock is the cranial end this side the 3 o'clock is the caudal end this uh, 12 o'clock is the uh, the medial part and 6 o'clock is the lateral part so i'm standing on the left side of the patient and this is l4 5 level this is the l4 lamina and this point here is the spinal laminar junction yes correct can you identify uh, can you uh, yes, recognize yes, the lamina very, yes, is going yeah. on to the interlamina space irrigation is okay no yeah. this is the interlamina space you can see the i'm clearing the soft tissue on top of ligamentum flavum this is the ligamentum flavum so you don't have to remove things mechanically much you can just shrink it and you have already done the clearance mechanically by your obturator right yeah i tried to use the disc forceps and it has caused some amount of muscular bleeding so i'm just trying to control that so that we don't have any problems later on with visual clarity absolutely can i clear this now things are yeah. coming clearer yeah uh, the shaver so once you identify this bony margin we'll start with removing the uh, the bone so we are using a uh, oval tip pani 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 continue salo sadan tacha shay disap nahi da so we are using this oval tip uh, shaver to do the cranial laminotomy which company shaver striker ye kon kar rahe hain right ketan desh pani mana bangalore madhe so you have to stop in between do some soft tissue clearance then again go in so that the bony edges they are visible they are clearly visible to us all the time we control bleeding by rf for flow of saline with both whatever is controlled with flow of saline and the rest is taken care by the rf like this even the bony bleeding can also be controlled to some extent by the rf to some extent we can use a bone wax also but sometimes it's very difficult to get that piece of bone wax right up to the part which is bleeding 
because of True. the irrigation fluid tends to slip away or flow away you you need continuous irrigation under certain pressure to get a clear view yes sir there is no other alternative so this is a shaver with a protection uh, sleeve yes sir this one has a protection sleeve is it protected at the side only or it is end and side both end and side both sir can i have the other sleeve that is a long sleeve we want one no no uh, this one yeah i am attaching one more instrument to the scope here so this one is a kind of an uh, outer covering sheath and it has a long tongue and it can help me retract the soft tissues better uh, we are not able to appreciate that the management team can you enlarge the outside picture to show that instrument can you see this now yes, yeah. yes. so this is kind of a cover for yeah. this and it has a stopper so i can put it i can stop it uh, at whatever height i want and it is like a lip and i can glide it inside whenever i need to it is a retractor yes sir so it retractor act as a retractor for, this, for the scope hmm. not not act as a it is a retractor so now i'm sliding it down retractor and also stopper that that you are putting on the bore itself yeah. Yeah. so this i'm putting it on the bone itself and it will also stop the soft tissues from coming in my field okay. especially when i'm using the burr it also serves a, another good purpose of keeping certain distance between the tip of the camera and the working space because it is fixed to the outer part here it does not let my camera slide down inside and prevents any damage that might occur by being very close to this radio frequency cutter or being very close to the burr this instrument you designed no, it's it's endoscope not camera no sir copy paste mm -hmm. endoscope ah. yes endoscope not camera the endoscopic camera yes <laughs> dr song has uh, mentioned once to me that he needs a an endoscope every 30 to 40 cases i wish i had that luxury no no because it gets damaged <laughs> so every 32 40 cases he that's why he uses very cheap endoscope mm -hmm. and for demonstration he will you use the high quality go. endoscope there was this will fall no ye nikal do just let it fall down but uh, i think the arthroscopic surgeon they are very uh, expert or uh, habituated to use the bar sure. during surgery of arthroscopy shoulder knee etc so damaging the scope is not comes sir for an arthroscopic surgeon there is a confined space to work into you inject fluid and the space increases even more here the issue is we don't have a confined space so that is much more possible that you try and go closer and closer to the uh the working field to see what actually you are cutting and uh, in my experience also i have damaged two of my scopes by being too close to the drill or to the cutting part of the radio frequency damaging oh. the lens and scratching right. the lens as well and then you do this body work in l4 l5 or l5 s1 also at any point sir it depends on how large the interlamina space is if i am able if there if it's just a case of disc and i am able to cut through the flava then i mean i may not i can skip the bony work for l5 s1 if it's a very huge uh, interlamina window with no stenosis only disc part drill apan vapar for l4 l5 most am i right l4 l5 more yes can you change the tip to round one This is sort of the same as for arthroscopy. Or is it different? Shaver. Same, same sir. Same shaver striker. Same, same. same. Keep it on this side. 
90 degrees. How many buckets of fluid required? Uh, usually, uh, three liter. Uh, uh, this three liters of uh, around seven to eight bottles of three liter uh, saline. Seven to eight bottles of three liter. Yeah. 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 So it at three quite, quite a lot. 20, 20, 20 liters. Yeah. yeah. Same, same, same as what Sean does. Twenty liters. How Even more for tea leaf. The question for Arun, you know, Arun, Arun Bharat. Latur me jaha fluid nahi hota hai, waha kya karenge Ketan? Sir? Latur me pani nahi hota hai. Sir, manun me descend ola lagat nahi na pani. This is on the lighter side. Arun? Arun? Pani nahi hota hai. Pene ke liye pani nahi hota. How much fluid you need for your system for this? So for an average uh, transforaminal endoscopy, we need one or two bottles only. And for interlaminar, depending upon what procedure we are doing, if it is a simple interlaminar discectomy, it can be done in uh, again within the one to two lit, uh, bottles of three liter saline. Rarely, if we are doing stenosis, uh, in that case, we may have to go to four bottles or five bottles. Yes. Then on the lighter side, how may, how you have a drain in your OT also? Sir, I got a bag to collect. Drain in the OT. <laughs> Drain in the OT. No, there, there, there is a very nice flow no, suction sir, available this, these days. Uh, this bag, if this drape which I am using right now, it has a fluid collection bag. There is an outlet and we have already connected it to the uh, just ah. gravity aided uh, this thing. We have put it in a bucket and every drop of fluid that is going out is getting collected and not spread anywhere. This, this is Amit, no? Amit? Yes. What do you do? What do you we have a tube for anesthesia purpose, no gas tube, something yeah. like that, plastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Usko curve karke chipak chipkate hai. Achha. Make like a wall and through that the drain is uh, taken out. Okay. Yeah, at but this present, is very simple. This is slight so modification at, at of the... present in COVID time, what we are doing that that uh, anesthesia tube goes out of our OT. So that the gases doesn't come in the OT. The similarly is for the fluid. So his pouch is coming, you know, that pouch helps to collect the fluid and from the pouch there is an outlet. So you put a, uh, just connecting any uh, uh, suction dip from the outlet and put a bucket. Nowadays so you can get a uh, uh, drip kit also, ready yeah, made drip kit. Drip seat with a pouch is coming nowadays. Oh, with that pouch and everything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this pouch is commonly used by uh, cesarean. <laughs> Pouch will collect all the fluid and there is an outlet and there is a stopper also. When you can stop, you can open that. And a cheaper version of that, that, a cheaper version of that could be a plastic bag, which is usually mm -hmm. the blue colored one, which is used for covering this Mayo trolley. You can use two of those and just stick them to your drapes on either sides using offside. And okay. you can let the fluid okay. collect in it or put a suction in it or something like that. What is an average time to do an over-the-top decompression with this system? 45 to 50 minutes, sir. For disc, it may take some more time. But for an uh, over-the-top decompression, bilateral, lateral disc decompression, 45 to 50 minutes. So it's easier for the uh, decompression than the disc? Definitely, sir. I think that is the ligamentum phloem split in the midline because we can see that there is some change of color there. The yellow ligament going into the red part. Uh, cure it, please. I'll ask my CM person to come in and we'll take a CM shoot here. I'll put a cure it here in the midline and we'll take a CM shoot. CM? Camera CM. AP, AP, yeah. Please come. So you want to check the midline? Yeah. Okay. I want to check the midline. So just AP view. Anyway, is always on the midline. Am I right? Sorry? Anyway, is always on the midline. Yeah. You have to start always from the midline, spinal laminar junction. Yeah, but many a times, as you showed in your case also, the spinous process are not always in the midline. So sometimes after undercutting the spinous process, you tend to lose the orientation. But but you between. have to start, your landing point is midline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you see this EM picture? 
no focus on the cm please shoot yeah so i'm just beneath the spinous process i'm right in the center part everything is white here. everything is white not able to appreciate the bone focus ketan why do you need cm at this level this uh, uh, time yeah yeah it is better now yeah cm out yes sir i just need to confirm how much of uh, this thing undercutting i am doing of the lamina because but the ligament is split if you are able to see the flymom which is detached sir it is more for demonstration purpose okay yeah सकाळी जरा जर पडला आपण ढगाळ राहायचं yeah can you see that yeah that's the part the where the right yeah that is the part where the ligamentum flavum is deficit so there is always this v cut where the butterfly shaped ligamentum flavum at its uh, insertion is deficit under the upper lamina so the burring part is up to this point only from this point onwards we won't be going too close to the epidural space and the soft tissue dissection will start from this point onwards cure it please up uh, can you reduce the coagulation uh, this thing settings to minimum just the blue one the cutting can be done to zero and the coagulation to minimum coagulation to okay yeah that's fine i'll see i don't know this means you're giving you 17 or something 2 and cutting is zero i am not going to use cutting on once i open the epidural space okay can i have the cure it angled cure it now i'm trying to detach the ligamentum flavum yeah from, from the, the lateral cranial. aspect cranial lamina yes going down okay medial side is almost free i'll use a keras in 3 mm
What is size of the punch you use? Three millimeters. Forty-five degree, three mm. The instrument directly goes through the working port, or there is a channel uh, for that. There is a semi-tubular retractor that I have kept up till now, mm -hmm. but after passing such big instruments for uh, maybe two three times, uh, it doesn't matter. Even if I remove this, the fluid will still come out, and I can still use the same instruments without any resistance because the fluid has now created a pathway, and it will remain patent irrespective. Pull out that. This is getting pulled. Fluid on, please. You can see there are many capillaries here, and Dr. Yodongwa, when he taught me, he told me that Baltic book. There is a small film of, uh, there's a small uh, flimsy layer on top of the dura, which contains all these capillaries. So if you can just take it out, those capillaries will not come in your way. So using a ball tip, you can separate this film like this, and most of the capillaries will get retracted on their own. And you can see the dura much more clearly. So I'm still not able to see the lateral extent of the dura, so I'll do some more uh, decompression in the ipsilateral uh, lateral recess. Ketan, uh, is there a post-operative collection of a uh, blood or a hematoma which may be possible here? Yes, sir. It so, is possible, but in majority of my cases, I don't use drain right now because initially I used to put a drain. I used to make it come out through the the uh, scopic portal and used to suture it. But uh, in majority of my cases, there was no collection, there was no fluid later on. But when I started doing post-operative MRIs, I've started to notice that yes, there is some fluid collection, essentially asymptomatic. Sometimes this patient, even in, uh, with the tubular, they do come with some, uh, sometimes a posture change and some back pain, which is more. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I asked. This Double end with two. Even, even the people are complaining the neck pain also sometimes. Neck pain, neck pain due to collection of the fluid. You have to increase the fluid pressure. Unless you have a pump, uh, you have only a height, or you can apply uh, on the on the uh, saline bottles the BP cuff. Increase the height. If it is full, then you have to apply the BP cuff. Yeah, mm. yeah this one is full now. But there is a every chance of extra vessel of the fluid. There may epidural space, it may go up also if you increase the pressure. Fluid 
burpees. Atom, maybe you tried with the neuropathies to protect the nerve root here. Sorry, neuropathy. To use the neuropathy to protect the nerve root here. No, I haven't tried using a patty here. I have not seen Son to use the neuropathy, but uh, other people are using nowadays, and they are happy. Okay. I might be a bit scared of them migrating from the operative field. Because yeah, due to this again point. and again, the thread will be outside, but again and again, the instruments are going to use the same portal. If at all the thread gets detached, that might be troublesome. Right, right. right. PC. PC. Hello. Yes, tell me. That luxury of using the cottonoid is not there in this UB. Yes, but uh, you can use now. No, no, no. Not possible. Hmm. Yeah. So, the that's presence the... of the fluid, constant irrigation does not allow the patty to be as effective as in open surgeries. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and can you uh, see I that I am at the, the I am at the shoulder of the traversing route on ipsilateral side. Right. right, right. The ipsilateral route. I am at the shoulder. I can clearly see the lateral Please. margin of the dura on my side. Since the disc is more on that side, I would now go on the contralateral side. Just do some RF coagulation of the vessels in the lateral recess. So nerve root of the nerve root of the left side is totally decompressed up to the foramen. Yeah. And you are not finding any uh, free fragment of the disc. Yeah, I thought I would, but yeah. Okay, but I will go to the counter the right side. side. Why do you want to see Bar, the left side? You always operate from the left side? Majority of the times, yes. Suppose it's a right sided disc then? I had done only two sided, uh, two right sided cases, both of which had a a uh, foraminal disc on left side. So when I'm operating on the left side, I'm not able to see the exiting route on my side. So I had to target the foramen, the exiting route on the left side. So I went in from right side and use the contralateral approach, undercut the left sided facet and go to the exiting route. Because from this approach, I can see the traversing route on my side, the exiting and traversing route on the opposite side, but I can't see the exiting route on my side. So whenever there is a pathology which is affecting that, I would prefer a right-sided approach. Secondly, if there is a disc which is uh, up-migrated on the right side, sometimes it is slightly difficult to approach it from the contralateral approach. So why, and why don't you go from the isthmus? Sorry? Rather than going interlaminar for a foraminal disc, uh -huh. you can use the uh, approach through the isthmus. You mean a trans pedicular? Extra, extra foraminal. Extra foraminal. Extra, extra foraminal. Lateral foraminal. to the facet. Lateral to the facet. Or lateral yeah, to the but parts. then again, the medial part of the lateral disc is not uh, accessible from that uh, approach. No, if it is a foraminal disc, that's why. Yeah. yeah. In this case, the problem is there on the right side. Okay. Yeah. Why do you want to see the left first then? Sorry? Why do you want to see the left side? The problem is no, no, right. not, not, not on this case, sir. I was just trying to explain a, a, a scenario where if there is a foraminal compression of the left-sided exiting route, then only I would try a right-sided approach and go contralateral over to the left side. Otherwise, I am happy with the left-sided oh, approach for the rest of the oh, cases. Sweet, so 
now we are coming up at the midline and trying to go to the contralateral side to remove the flavor on the contralateral side i still need to do some more of the undercutting of the uh, spines process i would use a shaver here you can notice that whenever i open the channel of the shaver the dura is getting pulled although we haven't applied any suction tip to it but still the flow of the irrigation pulls it so whenever i'm working so close i always keep the channel closed and when i want to drain the fluid out only at that time i'm opening the channel and then again closing it but it is not a uh, uh, little bit of concern that when you are using drill the endoscopic picture picture gets blurred yeah because when you open the channel there is uh, some amount of uh, uh, bleeding it the fluid gets uh, the fluid tries to escape out and uh, there is some amount of bony bleeding at that point and if you try to close it there is bone dust so you have to settle for something in between so yeah now i am able to go in between the lamina and the ligamentum flavum on the contralateral side Hello. i am going to detach it from the lamina above pull it down and then try and take it out so don't need to go too much uh, no no need to do any kind of a table maneuvers here just detaching that ligamentum flavum and then pulling it out with a carison punch meter chai pani sample use other one is it ready then please sir pari open it now yeah the irrigation fluid was over so this is the contralateral ligamentum flavum that i'm removing now going to the opposite side are picking this thing the fluid comes are fluid pressure bahar barobar lagte sada leader pan tar dete nahi yeah better uh, i forgot to pull out the lip of that uh, retractor and that caused some bleeding over the facet joint when i was trying to tilt the scope the lip of the retractor was still beyond the scope and it nicked something over the facet that led to this bleeding yeah keresan So Ketan can you uh, tell us something about the learning curve of this procedure So the initial part of the triangulation is the most uh, Yeah how much cases only. and uh, how how many cases did you have uh, this problem uh, Sir I think with three or four cases you should be able to overcome that problem the best part about this is you don't have to learn the technique because what I'm doing is what everybody does either via 
a mini open microscope yeah. tubular or open surgery so the rest of the part and the orientation of the anatomy is very similar uh, it is an uh, fluid uh, medium surgery so that is an advantage the camera is inside so that is one more advantage the initial part where you have to make sure that both the instruments are in line and what your camera is seeing exactly where that that's the point where your instrument should go that is the only part which is uh, slightly uh, needs a bit more practice and i think 3 to 4 cases is more than enough to get uh, that triangulation uh, and then the rest of the part becomes quite simple and which cases uh, disc or uh, stenosis because and uh, right side or left side because these are the I things would, that you are preferring uh, i would prefer a stenosis case over a disc phase for learning because it is quite easier uh and uh, i mean uh, it is more of a, a you know step wise uh, protocol based surgery there are not too many variations in cases of disc there are uh, many a times there are surprises mm. where the disc is not exactly found at the location where we where it is supposed to be based on the mri findings so initially when you are uh, uh, if you know that your guidelines and everything is fixed stenosis cases are much simpler to start with and right or left uh, so central stenosis bilateral stenosis doesn't matter no amit yes in this case you have endoscope in left hand yeah so it depends on the uh, depends instrument in the right hand mm. so left sided approach in most of the cases okay even son does that yes okay very rarely he goes from the right side So even for the right sided disc, uh, he will go from the left side and remove the disc. From yes. Right side. If it is an isolated right sided disc, you can go from the right side. Also, what you can do is you can still stand on the right left side and the uh, and take the incisions on the opposite side of the midline, so that you oh. will have the same orientation and you will be on the opposite side. But if Because you are ambidextrous, you can work with both the hands. Yes, sir. Then. Uh, uh, <laughs> or you might you might have to learn that yeah no, it's not that easy try that in one case like but it's quite difficult to have a instrument in the the endoscope yeah, in the right the hand instrument and in the left not yeah, easy yeah maybe a left side left handed surgeon can use it from the right side yeah so if you are doing it l23 right sided disc it may be difficult because you might have to manipulate the dura uh, much more at a higher level l4 yes. by l5 s1 is okay bro yes so then there is a limitation of this uh, system to lower lumbar spine for disc ticket you have to learn how to go from left to right in all the cases so whatever learning but you have to depress and you have to manipulate this no? yes that is the part basics of the technique Can you just enlarge the uh, the hand movement picture for a while? Hello. They want the hand movement picture to be enlarged from outside. The outside picture. Outside, picture, outside picture. Outside picture. Just for a minute. How much is the make it reverse? <coughs> How much is the BP? Yeah, can you please keep it down? Yeah, it's, it's too much of capillary bleeding. Light for light for me. Light for light for me. Isn't that a disc nice up to me? Carry on. 
अप्रूवेबल सो एम वर्किंग ऑन द लैटरल रिसेस ऑन द कॉन्ट्रा लैटरल साइड ट्राइंग टू गेन एक्सेस टू द कॉन्ट्रा लैटरल ड्यूरल एज still need to get rid of this part of the ligamentum flavum so that i'll be see it i'll be able to see it more clearly there is some punch thanks yeah that's the lateral edge on the contralateral side and uh, i am at the shoulder of the traverse yeah, root on the opposite yes. side yes. this is the this is the nerve root is visible side. opposite side nerve root yeah i need to coagulate those vessels root retractor please there is an angled uh, yeah thank you can you hold this I think can somebody enlarge your hand picture? Is it not done yet? No. उनको बोलना करने के लिए. They want this picture to be enlarged from outside. Management team. No, 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 no. The PIP picture. They want PIP picture. Yes. Scope smaller. Yes, yes. This one. It is okay picture. now. It is done now. It's done. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hold this. Yeah. RF. so you are retracting the opposite side uh, dura yeah with your retractor yes yeah The RF probe you use, it is ninety degree. Do you ever yes. need a front tip or a forty five degree? Uh, we have forty five degree also, and uh, a hook probe as well. Yeah. So the hook probe is very uh, useful whenever you are working quite close to. But unfortunately, the system here I had brought those probes, but the system here is different. It's not compatible. The piece of a disc just popped out when I was doing the. rf this thing so now you uh, uh, you switch over to the uh, endoscopic picture yeah endoscopic picture is the bp okay you know yeah. yeah please enlarge the endoscopic picture now is it done yes okay when i was doing the rf this thing a uh, piece a uh, disposer that's a disc piece that just popped out so yeah. for all the cases you always do it from the left side because it is your comfort zone and you break the usual conventional norm wherein we are taught that the symptomatic side should be approached yes sir double ended i think that is the annular tear at the shoulder of the traversing root on the contralateral side you can see some piece of disc popping out of it i'll again use a root retractor and uh, try and retract this part and take out the disc fragment 
So whenever I used to use the retractor, I have to take out that sleeve because two instruments cannot pass through that sleeve. So just this retractor going in. Yeah, hold this. Yeah, there's a popping out now. Yeah, can I have a ball tip probe? Risk for sir. Even the UB master, Dr. Ajay. Yes, sir. Yeah, even the UB master, Dr. Son is doing the same thing. They are comfortable from the opposite side. Yeah, most, most of the time they are approaching from the left side. Yeah. But I think this is a point to be pondered because you see, uh, of course, it's a very good demonstration, very good technique. But then uh, to go from the opposite side always. Uh, it's point uh, to be pondered upon, right? Because sometimes it's a central disc, right? You cannot, you have to still retract it more uh, medially. No, approaching from the left side is in the comfort zone. You can approach to the same uh, disc of the left side or right side disc or in the central disc. The approach from the left side, they are doing always almost 90% cases. Agreed, but agreed. The, Dr. Ketan told very rightly, if there is a disc in the foramen, of the left side, then then I are approaching from the right side. But if you can do it from the other side, then why you approach from this side? Got a logical point, right? It's more of logical, but as Ketan is saying, he has been comfortable doing it and there is no harm in doing it. As such also by posterior surgery, what you are doing is you are, this is whatever you are doing is for the approach. The pathology for this case yes. is always ventral to the dura. Yeah, but then you are removing the whole ligament for doing a very small removal of a small yes, piece. Yes, that is, that is are, the point. That is yeah? definitely there. That is the point. So then me. if you want to revise this, you know, Ajay, it's going to be a... a yeah, yeah, it is. It is a difficult it is, job, yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, definitely. That is, that is the point, uh, Amit, that is the point. If you are approaching from the left side for the right side disc, you have to sacrifice whole of the uh, uh, ligament. The, the ligament and then there is a fibrosis. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. it is there. It is there. <laughs> Then it is routinely you do from the other side, or it is norms for doing uh, from the opposite side, or you prefer that opposite side? No, I can always stand on left side and approach it from the right side if it's just an isolated disc. But in this case, if you see the actual images, there is some part of the disc which is down migrated and it is coming over to the left side. So at the start of the procedure, only I said I want to see both the traversing route. So it is not always necessary. And ipsilateral so lateral can, recess decompression not needed because so you it, can approach from the same side this call yeah without without removing yeah. the ipsilateral ligamentum phlegm also you can go contralateral sublaminar without damaging the ipsilateral uh, ligamentum phlegm you can do laminotomy uh, spinous process base uh, uh, removal and then go to the contralateral side oh, keep the ligamentum phlegm on the ipsilateral side intact. Now my question is, same side you can approach, am I right? Or your comfortability you are approaching from the opposite side? Yeah. There is only one scientific reason for approaching from the right side, that is to have lesser exposure uh -huh. or footprint. And secondly, absolute indication is a foraminal disc on the same side. Otherwise, uh, like Ketan is doing, he is comfortable doing it. Yeah, if you want to do a tele for a major thing, then there is no problem. Yeah. An absolute indication for the opposite side would be only a foraminal disc on the same side. Otherwise, anything now, can be done from this side. Now, Son does most of the cases fixation than only discectomy. Hello? Yes, yeah. yes. What, is, what Son is doing... Is 80% cases are fixation. 
yeah in listesis cases what is doing is doing uh, he is putting the telescope into the disk space directly and then decompressing the disk space curate little bit and then yeah, putting yeah, the actually. cage and then coming out and then percutaneous fixation yeah logically speaking that is the same thing what dr amit bhai amit jala sir has been saying so you are doing an extensive dissection the essence of an endoscopic surgery doing a minimalistic approach by endoscopy is doing even grade one grade two listesis which is a stable listesis you go in do least damage and come out without fixation so what essentially would happen here is removing so much may add to a potential instability that would be a reason why dr son is converting to most of the fusions now no he is going suppose there is a grade two listesis and you want to fix it then he is going into the disk space decompressing and putting the case and coming out then fix with the percutaneous so what yeah. he is doing it is a decompression through the telescope yeah it is more of the endoscope assisted thing that's fine okay amit i think uh, i would like to make a comment over here i think any technique is not good for all things absolutely so i is, do agree I do so agree. It is specifically meant. So I guess UB is very good for central stenosis, where it may be unilateral or bilateral. Suppose you have a patient with unilateral uh, leg pain, but on MRI he has a central stenosis. You would obviously want to decompress both sides, and in that case, maybe left-sided approach is fine. But I would, if uh, there is a right-sided disc herniation. Okay. and only a disc herniation and you want to treat it endoscopically then you have other endoscopic ways of treating it in a better manner rather than going always from the left side so pradyuman that's what i i was up to because every technique uh, we need to find out a proper indication yes yes we i should not agree. stick to one technique we require a proper indication for each and every technique Voltip. yes yes amit, I, i agree there is a bigger one amit yes amit yes Amit, with distend you, you can do anything. No, no, with tube also I can do anything. <laughs> so it is not a question of distend or a tube, but which system works best for what indication that we need to find out. So what are the indications for tube? No, no, I can I can see the decompression like uh, interlabular decompression. I think it is better to do uh, with a full endoscope, even with a tube or uh, distend. If you want to do a minimalistic thing. What Then is minimalistic? Endoscope. Whatever this is a minimalistic, right? Now, is is there any 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 parameter to know how much muscle trauma is there? How much? There is no is parameter. There, there is no parameter. It is obvious. Then it is individual perception. So then yes. that then that's okay because then even if because the outcomes are going to be the same whether you do a full fenestration, micro discectomy or a tube or. A, Uh, or a distend do, or even a, a full endoscopy. Even a malice at Goa. Yeah, so uh, they are going to be the same. Outcomes are same. He is giving us also re results. Yeah. Amit, what yes. what I have understood is yeah, that I I let me come into it. So why do we use these magnification tools, the microscope, the endoscope, or distend do, or this? The idea is to have very good visualization. Agreed. agreed so the best visualization you get is in a saline medium who said i, I, I say sir it is obvious you you see the surgery you showed and see the yeah uh, yeah now now you now you are seeing the fluid medium and are you able to see the clear things so right now he is not able to control the bleeding whereas that is the thing you have to always medium, depend on, you have to always depend upon the pre blood pressure of the patient the fluid pressure everything it is not in your no, hand no sir but But but, but in open there, or in distendu or microsurgery, the fluid the medium the structures will always be red. Let me complete. Yeah. But with air, if you cauterize everything, the muscles are not intruding. Everything is clear. Sir, but that's what I'm saying, red. sir. You, there will always be a reddish hue in the air medium surgery than yeah. with the saline medium because in saline medium you will once you have a hemostasis. you will have the near natural vision whereas in air medium despite good hemostasis you will be using uh, you will be having a reddish hue of the structures you come to my you will have a very good vision 
So we so saw your three just half an hour ago, sir. You'll be able because, to differentiate. Because listen to me. When you are using a fluid medium, you have limitations in between because of the fluid pressure, the blood pressure of the patient, everything. No, no. Those limitations are because of inadequate. Uh, application of the technique we are talking of the best impl implication of the technique in that situation do we have a equivalent vision the answer is no let me go to the ot i am starting the second case if time permits i will say show you the second case now this this discussion will go on but there is something which i would like it's not to not a question of going on you are no sir, no, no sir, just let me let me come to for that the young, for the youngsters you don't honestly tell the uh, the basic things Is Dr. Ruidas there? Hello. Is Dr. Ruidas there? Sir, is there probably but not audible. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah, sir. I I think we should all agree that there are certain advantages of saline medium because now there are uh, advantages. Yeah, and uh, right now the BP, the diastolic BP is almost over hundred. So I was not able to get a clear picture, and that is now, not the case the in every. Listen to me now. We never used any hypotensive anesthesia in my life. Sir, then why is there need for distender to have a wet and dry system? Because Doctor Mun, Doctor Kaushal is coming up with the system. That is a marketing has... gimmick. Sorry, I, I no, no, sir. Actually, tell to him. Even if you don't use use hypotensive, at least one should not be using hypertensive anesthesia like right now. Ketan is facing his diastolic BP is hundred. Listen to me. So definitely, we never people. use hypotensive anesthesia. We just manage Good. normally. You, you yes, see, sir, uh, you are all uh, missing on the point. You are all missing on the point. See, the, the thing point is, that is you cannot keep on adapting to sir. Rohida sir has adapted to the dry medium. Exactly. It so, doesn't mean that everybody would be able to adapt. At the same so, time, it does not mean that fluid medium is the only answer, and you cannot adapt to all the techniques over a life period of an active twenty-five years. You cannot learn all techniques. So whatever you learn, you improvise that if technique. You try, if you try, if you try to that to the next level, try to learn all the techniques. You will not be master of any you one. You will never master. So that should not be done. You can master only one or two techniques and keep improvising on that. So the message should not be that you learn all technique and then pick up the best from all techniques. No, no, there are possible. There, there is never a one best answer yeah, to yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. At a platform, so, we cannot argue this is best. Yeah, but in so, the hands of Ketan, it may be working the best. Yeah, agreed. But then, uh, scientifically, we should the, have the points that the what are the best things for this. You may have discectomy done by any way, right? But then, number one is this, two is this, three is this, four is this. It does not mean that we have to adopt the first one. And if you want to, if you want to do, a, if you want to do a fusion, then you cannot do. A, you cannot just stick to one technique. That fusion is best done by this technique, right? Um, I mean, we are running short of time. We have to. Amit, Amit, yes. Amit, we are running short of time. We have to wind up this session by another ten minutes. We yes. have one more talk pending from Dr. Sukumar. So, sure. Ketan, if you permit, can we switch on to the sure, talk? Sure. And if there is anything else, uh, you want yes, to discuss yes. here? Sure, quickly? sir. I would. I would just like to show. I think the... he has finished, and we can move. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would just like just to show. Just one minute the... for you. Yeah, sure. tell me. Yeah, yeah. This is the contralateral route going into the foramen, right. shoulder nice. part, the axillary yeah. part. This is the central right. decompression, and very nice. We come to our side, and this is the. The fat that you see, that's the axil of the ipsilateral root. If I go laterally and retract it, that's the shoulder, and that's the ipsilateral root going into the foramen. Right, the ipsilateral side. Yeah. So I think so, uh, yeah. so you just have to clear a little bit on the. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, sir. Lateral Please continue with the. So we'll yeah. we'll move on to the presentation. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. Uh, to the organizing team, can we have the last presentation of this session by Dr. Sukumar? Uh, yes, doctor. Yes, please. Thank you.
when is this operative live session is going to stop stop it is going to stop now sir no no it is still good morning endoscopic spine surgery has come a long way for past 10 years and the learning curve has become shorter and shorter <laughs> day by day because of the proper training so any uh, technique has to be adopted uh, it goes through this various phases and the endoscopy is in between early adopters and early majority so any beginner who want to start uh, endoscopic spine surgery is always in a dilemma whether to start transferaminal or interlaminar or both so when we see this image any central pathology better go <coughs> interlaminar way any lateral recessed stenosis or uh, pathology can be dealt both transferaminal and interlaminar way and foraminal extra foraminal better to do with a transferaminal approach so when we want to adopt as a beginner a transferaminal approach better start with discectomy then once you are confident with discectomies then you can do a discectomy with a hard part where osteophytes or a stenosis bony stenosis is there we can deal with it then we can do lateral recessed stenosis after some time and ultimately we can do endofusion also see with the interlaminar approach start with a simple discectomies where you can handle uh, uh, discectomies then go for <coughs> lateral recessed stenosis and central stenosis and bilateral lateral recessed stenosis decompression later date once we are uh, confident we can do contralateral foraminotomy and discectomy with endofusion also so what challenges do we face as a beginner when we start endoscopy it is mainly with the scope and the instruments initially where we are new to the this technology where we need to do everything through a same channel and instruments which are long and slender might break the adding radio frequency and drill system is the key so any beginner will have to invest in this technology and training a cm technician and having a proper cm technician and a good anesthesia team where they understand your requirement and understand the concept of pain management is the key so any beginner who has to start a endoscopic spine surgery it's like giving a hungry person the chopsticks where he cannot uh do it faster so hand eye coordination is the key depth perception is the key because with this both we need to understand where we are doing 3d surgery with the uh, image of 2d so an uh, understanding this 3d anatomy orientation with the uh, uh, proper instrument handling with the angle scope is the uh, common problems we face we need to understand and get trained in this and initially the radiation is very Uh, high because of the number of uh, shots taken as a beginner so we need to understand the radiation <coughs> doses of any endoscopic uh, surgery as a beginner is very high so case selection is the key for our success as a beginner so case selection is the key when you take a case uh, for example you want to adapt a transferaminal approach the case when you select a case it should be young with a soft disc lateral disc where there is no stenosis component discite is maintained and there are no osteophytes and when we look at the cm or the x-ray the iliac crest is way beyond our path and ultimately we need to have this desired result where you see a, a row, fragment removed below the root and root is free with no bony or ligament stenosis this is the end point uh, as any spine surgeon uh, wants to have where you have removed the pathology causing pain and decompress the root so whenever we are planning for a transferaminal approach as a beginner better take uh, a case where discite is maintained it's acute soft disc relatively younger patient with no osteophytes or stenosis component and with the height of the iliac crest is way beyond below the pathway the same with the interlaminar technique where we need to see the we need to see the the components within the circle where uh, we need to address try such cases where there is no need for drilling there is wide interlaminar window facet pathology is not abnormal and uh, the mri findings are correlated or incorporated on your uh, x ray findings so that there is no need to drill and you are reaching the lateral edge try such cases initially rather than this cases where you see osteophyte and uh, 
uh, as a beginner it becomes to deal with the osteophytes initially so try alpha is for cases initially with a wide interlamina window where no drill is required and there is no facet disease with osteophytes so any learning curve definitely as for any technique uh, it's a it's a steep learning curve for especially endoscopy and we should not become over confident with uh, uh, learning and incomplete uh, learning will lead to disaster so we need to spend some time to master this technique so my learning curve when i started this technology uh, to in 2012 initially i had lot of problems where patient had partial relief and a lot of recurrences i broke the scopes and with some complications then how did i overcome so i just uh, sat and thought and uh, start uh, started getting a immediate post of mri and started seeing my own uh, videos this helped me a lot to correct myself and uh, give a better results and with addition of uh, radio frequency ablator and drill system so my results became much better. better visualization much better and i went to masters again and again and uh, try to correct myself and train my staff where they helped me a lot correcting <coughs> more problems so my learning curve after this uh, uh, addition and uh, learning uh, my results were much better the next 6 uh, years where recurrences were less residual cases uh, were only two and complications were much less when compared to <coughs> previous 100 cases so take home message initial case selection is the key for any beginner to have a good outcome spending time with uh, 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 endoscopic uh, technology thinking about it uh, orientation getting oriented yourself and proper training and learning both transferabular and interlaminar is the key i always tell uh, uh, any beginner that to audit his own cases so that he can learn from his own mistakes and the patience and persistence and practice perseverance is the key for any <coughs> any uh, success for endoscopic spine surgery thank you thank you uh, dr sukumar for the wonderful description and sharing your experience of how to overcome the learning curve Uh, yes it's correct and you mentioned very rightly that you should do your post operative mris and go back to your own surgical videos again and again to see especially the cases that you feel are not doing good that where did you err and it not only the bad one but also look at the good ones to learn that what did you do right to to keep repeating the right steps again and again so that your hands learn those steps thank you thank you arun thank you and uh, with that i think we come yeah we come to the end of this wonderful session we had two live surgeries very nice demonstration by dr rohit das for a tough stenosis and uh, similarly dr ketan deshpande for the ube for a uh, central and a right paracentral herniation excellent demonstration of both the techniques and we had a very nice discussion thank you all the panel members as well as the uh, uh, speakers thank you thank you so we move on to the next session thank you hello everybody now we move on to the next session shall we start this am i audible yes sir we can start so we go on to the next session uh, the didactic lecture session we are here with our panelist dr pc day dr pradhaman pai dr prasad patkonkar and mahesh ak uh, and i'll invite dr arun manot for his first talk which is overcoming the challenges in full endoscopic treatment of difficult disc prolapse we can just go through all the talks and then take up the questions that would be better part to do dr banod 
Yes, I'm there. They have to share my uh, recorded video. Can the organizers please uh, share my talk? Is my screen is visible, doctor? Yes, it is there. Okay, I'm playing the video. My name is Arun Bhanot and today I will be sharing with you whatever little experience I have about managing some difficult disc herniation using the full endoscopic technique. The transforaminal full endoscopic technique has hitherto been considered not very suitable for sequestered or migrated herniations or large disc herniations or associated stenosis and also calcified herniations and cordiacona syndromes. But with the advent of interlaminar full endoscopy that has opened up the avenues for wider application of the full endoscopic technique and we will learn about some of the few examples in the coming few slides of both the transforaminal and the interlaminar techniques. Now this is one such example. It is a case of a down migrated herniation. Now we can see that this is a L45 down migrated herniation where the tip of the herniation reaches up to the inferior border of the lower L5 pedicle. The L5 pedicle here is the main hindrance for getting you the good access to the herniated fragment. So one can manage this transforaminally or interlaminar depending upon the experience of the surgeon. For the transforaminal uh, discectomy like we did in this case, we plan the trajectory slightly differently than routine. So we uh, direct our needle craniocordally and in the lateral view the tip of the needle rests on the posterior edge of the annulus so that the cannula remains as close to the epidural space thus permitting a safe adequate surgery. So in this case the same principle was followed and this is the post operative MRI showing a good neurological decompression. Large central herniations are another big challenge one can see that this herniation is occupying nearly 70% of the spinal canal. So Transforaminal is a better indication for this type of case where you can come flat from the side and access the whole herniation in one go rather than from the interlaminar approach. So here we aim to position our cannula in the AP view cross midline when the tip of the cannula is still partly anchored in the annulus and partly in the epidural space. By executing this plan during the intraoperative CM as shown here, we can achieve this kind of a post-operative MRI outcome where full decompression of the central large herniation has been done. This is an example of a 40 years old male who presented with left foot weakness and left radicular pain of 3 weeks duration and the MRI shows a acute on chronic disc herniation picture with a small fragment of the disc which is pinching the left S1 nerve root and there was a possibility of a calcified disc in this case. So we chose the interlaminar approach uh, after opening the epidural space and positioning the cannula onto the disc surface. Here is the surgical video. We rotate the working tube medially. The flange is protecting the traversing nerve root and now we can expose the disc herniation here. We can see this is the hard calcified part which is drilled using this end cutting phase mill which is acting like a trephine and while the nerve root is getting protected by the cannula flange. So once this bony part is thinned out, we can uh, remove the remaining uh, calcified component by using the endoscopic uh, osteotome to cut this part and remove it using the endoscopic grasper later on. And after that, we can do an intradiscal decompression as well. So once this is loosened up, we can remove it and do a adequate intradiscal as well as epidural decompression to free the nerve root. Now with the nerve root S1 root is completely free and there is no impingement. This is the post-operative MRI showing adequate decompression of both the soft and the hard component. This is an example of a 49 years female presenting with right leg radiculopathy and partial foot weakness on the right side. The MRI shows a very large L5-S1 disc herniation. The disc herniation is extending right from the S1 pedicle to the L5 pedicle and in the axial we can see the right arm hemi canal is fully occupied by the hernia mass. So we chose an interlaminar discectomy in this case. After exposing the ligamentum flavum, we create a small opening with the endoscope. We cut the ligamentum flavum layer by layer and once the epidural space is open, we extend this opening laterally. 
with the endoscopic cutter and we try to reach the lateral edge of the S1 nerve root. Once the S1 nerve root is identified, we retract it and protect it by rotating the cannula again medially. The flange of the cannula is now your retractor which keeps the root away and the disc is exposed. The uh, layers of the disc are opened with the endoscopic cutter and one large fragment is being removed. Now there was a component of disc herniation which had migrated cranially so we tilt the cannula and rotate it cranially and one can see that we are seeing the cranial side removing a little bit of ligamentum flavum and now the fragment is visualized which is again opened with the endoscopic cutter and then after exposing the fragment we are grabbing it and removing it. One can see how far we can tilt the cannula in the PIP picture. So again the fragment is removed and we can see there is still one more fragment because it was a large herniation so we expect three four large fragments. This is the third large fragment coming out and then we see the root is adequately decompressed. We can also palpate the axilla of the S1 root which is free and we can also check with the fluoroscopic view from upper pedicle to lower pedicle. This is her postoperative MRI showing complete removal of the large hernia mass. Another example, 47 years male who presented with a left leg radiculopathy and thigh and knee pain with left quadriceps weakness and walking with a limp. MRI shows a large sequestered and up migrated L3-4 herniation. The fragment was lying besides the L3 pedicle and in the actual view we can see that the fragment is in the axilla of the exiting L3 root. Here we use the translaminal full endoscopic technique. By drilling a hole in the upper L3 lamina, in the middle of the lamina, we don't violate the ligamentum flavum and use a targeted approach. So, after docking the cannula onto the L3 lamina and clearing the soft tissue, we start the drilling process under endoscopic control, extend the hole laterally but protecting the pars and then we open the posterior cortex of the lamina with the endoscopic drill. And once we visualize the opening of the epidural space, we widen the hole by the drill and then using this endoscopic uh, punch uh, and coagulating the epidural vessels, we can see the thecal sac. Again, we use this end protective drill to widen the foramenotomy hole. This is the pars. So after uh, widening the hole, we search the lateral edge of the thecal sac which is identified and then we try to go towards the pedicle of the L3. We remember the fragment was besides L3 pedicle, removing the epidural fat here and we can visualize the herniated fragment which is opened using this right angle force, right angle probe and the fragment is duly removed with the and this is the large fragment. One can see nicely decompressed axilla and this is the L3 exiting nerve root. There is no remaining compression. This is the postoperative MRI showing adequate decompression and this is the hole through which this all was accomplished. So to conclude, by using advanced tools and good understanding of pathological lesion, along with adequate experience of using the full endoscopic technique, nowadays one can manage almost all disc herniations with the full endoscopy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would invite now Dr. Christopher Sepe, our international faculty, for his talk on interlaminal endoscopy standards and extended applications. We can take uh, questions of full talks together because they may be just overlapping some questions there. Dr. Sepe, please. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. Uh, is my screen is visible? Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining me in this talk on interlaminar endoscopy, the standards and extended applications for the treatment of lumbar spinal pathologies. Has he gone mute? Can you please check up his voice? We will be talking about, in my present talk, the interlaminar approach technique. Uh, it's a recorded video, Doctor. It, 
it is, but I don't know why it's not playing the sound. The sound is in the video. No, something is wrong. The sound is in the video. I'll just stop, stop share and I will share it again. Yeah, otherwise, I mean, I can do the, I can do it again. I can, I can comment this. Um, you like. Place the scope uh, on the facet joint facing the interlaminar window. Any, any feedback with uh, with respect to the te technical? He is replaying it. Let's see. If it is not replaying, then you can put the overlay now. Yeah. Okay. Just to... It is a MP4 with sound and picture and everything. Yeah. And uh, it was confirmed that everything was working well when I sent the videos. interlaminar endoscopy, the standards and extended applications for the treatment of lumbar spinal pathologies. That we will be talking about in my present talk, the interlaminar approach technique. I think there is an issue with the recording or some relay problem. Dr. Sipe, would you like I, to... I can, I, can, I can continue if you like. But I mean, it was confirmed that the, that the videos were working properly. Yeah. If you are comfortable, so, then you can start with your audio and we can mute you over here. So, so anyway, what we are doing, uh, first of all, we open up the operating table. That was the last slide, which kind of helps you to increase the access to the lumbar spine. Uh, the next thing then, once we have draped everything... Place the scope. Uh, on the facet joint facing the interlaminar window. Do you want me to talk or the video? Uh, doctor, you can talk, doctor. The video is muted. Okay, but then maybe maybe we mute the video then. Yeah, video so, is on. You can so speak. Oops. The next thing is, we first, first step, we open up the operating table. Second, under AP view, we do once one-shot one AP view. We, we mark uh, the, the, uh, the incision on the patient's skin surface. Um, we place the scope on the facet joint facing the interlaminar window. And, um, and then basically we start using the burr. I do a lot of the bony work before I open up the yellow ligament. We then expose the yellow ligament and you've seen this in the previous videos. Then we make an incision with the with cutters carefully. We make our incisions. And then we start uh, resecting the yellow ligament. That's the one option. The other option would be that we go to the cranial lamina. We detach the yellow ligament from the cranial lamina, just like we would do in microsurgery. And then, yeah, we start our central decompression, as you can see here. Uh, first of all, we start with the central decompression. And then we do our ipsilateral recess decompression, always in a craniocaudal direction, layer by layer. So what I'm telling everybody is, don't cut a hole just in, don't dig a hole just in one spot. So you go layer by layer, first layer, second layer, third layer, until you have fully, as you can see here, fully decompressed the ipsilateral recess. You can see the exiting nerve root with the shoulder, with the axilla of the nerve. And then when you have a picture like that, then you know that the decompression has been done uh, completely. Okay, video should continue because now I want to show you how to do the over-the-top uh, over decompression. Which we saw in the live video just now. So actually doing the over-the-top decompression is an easy part. And I actually find this faster, quicker than when you do this with a, with a microscope. You basically just tilt the scope to the contralateral side. And then we start resecting the contralateral uh, bony and ligamentous structures that are compressing the nerves. You can do that with the scissors, you can do that with the Kerenson punches, you can do that uh, with the burrs, as, as you've also seen in the, in the live video just now. 
until we can see that also the contralateral recess is fully decompressed. So there is no limit here with respect to, to the technique. Then, of course, final inspection, we want to make sure that the neural structures are fully decompressed. Here you can see the full on over the top decompression, that there are no more bleedings. If there are bleedings, then we have to stop the bleedings. And then we finish our surgery with just what, what would I say, maybe seven, eight millimeter incision, which is particularly nice when you have very obese patients. So this is another pathology that I would like to show here. It's the, it's the pathology of lumbar synovial uh, facet joints. You can see a massive, quite a, quite a big cyst here. It's, it was actually much, much bigger than what the preoperative MRI shows. And we all know that these cysts can be challenging because at times they, they could be very adhesive with the surrounding uh, uh, neural structures. So then we need to go in and separate these adhesions first. And once we have separated that, I, I usually do the separations with a, with a bipolar and with a dissector. I actually in some way prefer the bipolar because I think it's even more blunt than the dissector. Anyway, very important that we first get rid of the adhesions. Once we've done that, again, layer by layer in a cranial cordial direction, we start to resect the cyst completely again until we can see that all the neural structures are fully decompressed. That was a big part of the cyst. Another one. And now you will be able to see caudally uh, that the exiting nerve root can uh, exit freely. This is a very important part of the surgery. So what kind of pathologies can we address? Because this is also about extended indications. But you can see here, you can do central decompression. You can do lateral recess decompression. You can remove disc herniations with, with, with sequestration. We can remove some synovuses. You can address your complications if there are any, such as epidural hematoma and so on. So really, you have a wide variety of indications. The technique is not the limit. Usually what I say is the surgeon is the limit in the way where, in the sense, where are you at what stage of your learning curve? So in the beginning, obviously, you start with very easy cases. And then later on, step by step, you start uh, to do more, more complex cases. So this is what I would recommend with respect to the interlaminar technique. Don't rush it. Patient safety comes first. The most important goal is that you get good technical and clinical results. The goal is not to do a surgery quick, quick. Yeah, that comes later. In the beginning, you need to do it safely. Start with easy cases, disectomies, L5 is one. Then you can do the first disectomies L4-5, where you start working in the recess, do some recess decompression. Then you can continue with over-the-top decompressions. And then last but not least, if you feel very comfortable, uh, then you can also go to the posterior cervical spine. I will talk about that later. Thank you for your attention. And I hope that we were able to you know, come over this technical issue here. And thanks again for inviting me to India. Thank you so much, Dr. Christopher. Small hiccups, but it is done. Uh, now, I would like to have a few questions uh, uh, for the first two speakers, Dr. Arun and uh, Dr. C.P. Okay, were you able to hear me clearly? Yes, yes, you were audible. And yes, we did. Thank, you, Thank so you so much. much. Okay. Any questions? Anything that you do differently? You know, I'm always uh, interested in what other people do differently. Maybe you have some tips and tricks that we can use from next week. For example, in the live surgery, I like the, I like, I enjoyed the, the bird. The last slide which you showed, that was the beauty, beauty of your, the learning part, the how to progress and yes. that was a wonderful slide. Okay. Eh? Ajay, it was not clear. Will you please repeat that? So, so we, we don't have any Ajay, questions. Ajay, you are not that. audible. If there are any that in that box. I will move further. I would uh, invite Dr. Sukumar Suda. Hello. I would like to invite Dr. Sukumar Suda for his uh, talk, Full Endoscopic Treatment of Thoracic Disc Pathology. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. 
Good morning. Thoracic anatomy in spine is very unique uh, compared to cervical and lumbar anatomy because of the rib cage. When we see the thoracic pathologies other than trauma, infection and some tumors, the commonest problem we see is the, the disc which might be soft or the hard disc causing severe radiculopathy or a foraminal stenosis or sometimes the ossified elbow ligament causing canal stenosis causing severe stenotic symptoms and bilateral radiculopathy. When we see for any approach to the thoracic spine, there are conventional approaches where we can go interlaminar, postolateral that is through the pedicle or retropleural that is when we just strip the pleura and enter the uh, foramen and the disc space or the transthoracic where we strip the pleura, go through the pleural cavity and enter the disc space. So for a small removal of the disc pathology, we need to do a, such a morbid procedures sometimes in thoracic spine. So we can go through the lamina, we can go through the trans, uh, the pedicle or do a costo transversectomy to enter the disc space. You can see here, just to remove a small piece of disc, we need to do a costo vertebrectomy or do a transthoracic decompression to remove the disc fragment or we can drill out the whole pedicle and enter the disc space to remove the disc fragment. For these procedures, you need to put a big incision, strip the muscles, do a such a morbid procedure for just removing a, a small fragment which is causing severe radiculopathy or address the foramen which is causing stenosis. Is there any role of endoscopy here in thoracic pathologies? Yes, there is definitely a role thanks to this uh, gentleman uh, where in his early uh, student days he described on a cadaver the feasibility of endoscopy in thoracic spine. We were fortunate to get trained by him, to spend some time with him in USA. So in 1994 when he was getting trained in USA, so he uh, did a cadaveric study to show the feasibility of the endoscopic uh, surgery in thoracic spine and also described a, a great anatomic detail where the exiting nerve in thoracic spine and the lumbar spine when you compare the exiting route in thoracic spine goes superolaterally where in uh, a lumbar spine it goes infralaterally. So this superolateral trajectory of the exiting route gives us a great deal where we will not uh, uh, injure this nerve and the fear of injuring a transforminal uh, root is not there. Only the rib is the, the hurdle here. So if you can tackle the rib, we can do wonders in thoracic spine through endoscopy. Then he did his first surgery in 1995. Then he published, later published in 2012 uh, with the bipotal technique, he did a cervical uh, disc surgery and the patient was discharged the same day. He did this in local, local uh, anesthesia. So, what are the challenges we see in uh, uh, challenges we see in uh, thoracic spine endoscopy? The main challenge is the rib head, the narrow foramen, the vertebral canal is narrow. Disc height, when compared to cervical and uh, lumbar, the disc height is very narrow, uh, very small. And the thickened PLL is sometimes uh, difficult to tackle, and the discs are most of the time hard or sometimes calcified. When we see the anatomy in detail, the rib head when we see in the uh, thoracic spine, it inserts somewhere in the disc space or below the disc space. Here we see, can see the T6, T7 vertebra, the uh, uh, rib inserts, a rib head inserts into the disc space and the tubercle inserts into the transverse process. So when we are passing through the two transverse process transforaminally, the rib head, rib head becomes a major hurdle sometimes. As we see the anatomy from T T9 above, the rib head attaches to the disc space, but when come from T9 below, the rib head attaches inferiorly to the disc. So the transfer technique is quite easy in T9 below, and when you go T9 above, it becomes difficult. 
So when we see this anatomy, it's open surgery, exposed transverse process above and below, and in between you can see a rib head where it is occupying the foramen area. So when we are coming transforaminally, we uh, get a rib head sometimes, so which we need to drill. So the armamentarium used is a smaller scope here and a drill or a hand drill and sometimes the tools which can do a good foramenotomy where we can drill, a rib, drill the rib head and the foramen and enter the disc space. To just show some a few examples, we'll say 55 year old lady uh, came with a severe upper back pain with right intercostal pain with uh, no deficit. So MRI was showing a uh, DAD9 uh, disc fragment with a severe foramen narrowing with a collapsed disc. So you can see the axial images, there is a disc and a foramen narrowing in this patient. So uh, better to calculate on MRI the trajectories and the distance from midline to enter. So here it's 6.3 cm from the midline and the angle is roughly 40 degrees. So just it's marked AP lateral here, it's a 6.3 cm. So when I put a needle, my needle was uh, hitting uh, the rib head. So I put a marker there and one more needle and drill the rib head into, uh, through the, uh, uh, the uh, one more uh, uh, interlaminar approach and drill the rib head. Then I was able to enter the disc space. Once I entered the disc space, I was able to enter the foramen easily with the cannula and the shape. So we did a good foramen out of you can see the post op the foramen is widely open, and the fragment is removed, and post op patient is completely relieved of the radical growth. Second case uh, is a, one more case where the patient presented with the spastic paraparesis. So, had a D11, D12, D12, L1 disc prolapse causing fecal sac compression. So, again, the same route transformable, uh, the, uh, the disc space was entered and discectomy was done at two levels and the compression was relieved. So, you can see here uh, the, you can see here the upper and lower end plates are seen, the disc fragment is removed. At 12 o'clock, you can see the PLL fibers and the Pulsating fecal sac can be seen nicely as I come out. So I'm coming out, the cannula is coming out, and you can see the very nice pulsation of fecal sac and the fat. So, with a small incision, we have removed the disc, we have decompressed the, decompressed the fecal sac, and this is post op. And you can see, patient is the three years follow up from till now, and patient is completely relieved. Case 3, this is a very unique case, uh, patient has severe lower limb paresthesia with walking difficulties and uh, paraparesis. So you can see here there is an ossification of the yellow ligament at D10 level. So it, it was done in interlaminar approach where uh, landed in the interlaminar space and drilled the whole interlaminar ossified yellow ligament and the uh, ligament which was underneath the facet also which was ossified. A good decompression was achieved. And you can see here, the uh, fecal sac is well decompressed, the opposite lateral recess is decompressed, the lateral recess is decompressed uh, nicely. And you can see the uh, fecal sac there. So, and post op complete offending pathology is removed with a small incision. And uh, post op patient is uh, completely relieved of his symptoms. It's a 76 year old with a small incision. We have done uh, whatever is required to a small. Endoscope. Thank you. Thoracic disc, the mostly th seen thing is a calcified disc. And you usually have an end plate spur which is there. And uh, it, 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 is, it would need, uh, need more amount of ventral decompression as compared to a soft disc removal. What is your comment on that, Dr. Yes. Sukumar? Yeah, most of the time, uh, <clears throat> this calcified material you can uh, easily remove with uh, 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 locally made gooses. Just it's a small tap, they will break. And with our uh, punches and cutters, these things are easily uh, you can uh, tackle and break. And because the interpedicular uh, distance is very narrow in uh, thoracic spine, 
so you can reach easily the midline uh, without any uh, problem so most of the time reaching the disc space is a problem once you reach a disc space you can easily tackle this spurs better when compared to lumbar spine can you hear me ajay hello it's very clear hello, now. ajay can you hear me yes there is some yeah, hello hello can you hear me ajay hello yeah 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 you are audible can you hear me yes 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 you are clear yeah yeah so in thoracic spine uh, reaching the disc space is a most difficult part once you reach there the tackling this uh, bony osteophytes or a uh, calcified disc is easy because you can use a hand mill or a, a goose you can just to break the hard part so it is because the space is small and the interpedicular distance is small it is easy to manage in thoracic spine rather than a lumbar spine okay so any other question dr ajay dr ajay sir has left uh, due to technical issue uh, dr you can continue you yeah can... i think the i have to check the next speaker who yeah. is dr ajay next... is here yeah ajay sir is back yeah yeah Hello. Yes. Doctor, you just take over. Doctor Ajay, I think you are out uh, from from the scene for two, three seconds. Yeah. yeah. Now again, it is back. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, one more question to Doctor Sukumar. Do you uh, mark everything in an anteroposterior view, or you take an oblique view to see the foot and the uh, the rib head? No, no. I do. I do it in only AP view. I don't uh, take oblique uh, view. So most of the time, uh, the AP view is enough. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, we will move forward. I would uh, again request Dr. Christopher Safe for his next talk. Um. Are you able to speak? Go ahead, Anil. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this presentation on the application of full endoscopic spine surgery uh, in case of cervical pathologies. We all know there are a number of different pathologies that we might have to address in the cervical spine, depending on different degrees of disc degeneration or accompanying a compression of the neural structures. And depending on the underlying pathology, we have different types of surgeries, how to address them appropriately. For example, we could do a simple single level ACDF. And then in some cases, we also encounter more serious pathologies where we really have to uh, 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 do a reconstruction of the cervical spine. So, to summarize, if, if we look at the varying degrees of, of pathologies and the more complex that they're getting, for example, tumor or trauma cases or severe deformity cases or significant axial neck pain or wherever we need to reconstruct our doses, we need to become a little bit more invasive. We have to reconstruct. We can do that with pedicle screw-based systems, or we can do that from the front uh, with with uh, with with um, ACDF and plates, for example. So, nevertheless, there are easier cases, for example, where we have a monoradiculopathy only from a nerve root compression in one neuroforamen, for example, and this is where we might want to opt to do uh, less invasive procedures. And this is where we are talking about endoscopic cases. And this is where, uh, um, our OR setup in Munich. We are quite spoiled here. We've got nice 4K screens. Everybody in the OR room can, can watch the endoscopic procedures nicely. And just to give you an idea how we do these uh, uh, surgeries, um, only 6 to 7 millimeter incisions, Everything is projected onto large 4K screens. 
We basically visualize the neural structures uh, under very large magnification, and then you can decompress anything that compresses uh, the nerve roots, the dura, the neural structures in general, and you can finish lumbar or thoracic or cervical cases with just a six or seven millimeter incision. When we talk about cervical endoscopic procedures, there are anterior approaches to the cervical spine or posterior uh, cervical approaches in the full endoscopic technique. So just to fully outline also the anterior approaches, I'm, I can personally tell you that this is not my favorite uh, uh, approach, but this is how you can do it. Um, it's a contralateral approach, so basically you can palpate, um, especially in, in, in slim patients, you can, you can palpate the vital structures. So this is basically what it looks like. You place your scope. It's the smallest possible scope that you can use here with only a three millimeter working channel because the space here is very limited. And then you can do the surgical procedure with the preparation of the end plates. Uh, you can open up the posterior annulus and the posterior longitudinal ligament. You can enlarge the foramen uh, with Karenson punches or with burrs. And then you can also resect uh, anything that is uh, possibly compressing the nerve roots, su uh, such as a, um, an anterior uh, disc herniation. From my point of view, I think this is a little bit of a borderline indication. It's not my preferred choice. And the reason for that is simply with the approach, I would feel more comfortable seeing these vital structures such as the uh, carotid artery or the esophagus. So there are vital anterior cervical structures. Basically, you are going through the disc space, which means there is some kind of destruction of this motion segment. And if there is some kind of uh, destruction of this motion segment, this may end up secondarily in uh, kyphotic, in an increase in kyphosis of the segment, and perhaps also the development of posterior postoperative neck pain. So this is why this is not my preferred choice. But with respect to the cervical lateral disc herniations, this is one of the most elegant surgeries that I know. And I can show you a case here of a patient uh, over 100 kilograms with a far lateral disc herniation. This is the perfect indication for this type of procedure. We had a motor uh, uh, deficit with a tri uh, triceps weakness. So this is how we position the patients uh, uh, in the Mayfield uh, uh, fixation of, of the cervical spine. And I can show you here an operating video. First of all, you would enlarge the interlaminar window with, um, with a burr, as you can see here. So we do that going cranially and caudally, and then you can either go straight through the yellow ligament with scissors, as you can see here. The other option would be to go cranially and caudally and basically to detach the yellow ligament from the cranial or caudal insertion. In either way, you have to resect the yellow ligament, you can expose the dural sac, you expose the nerve root, and then you basically look for the disc herniation and remove it just like you would do it in an open or a microsurgical fashion. So you can see this here. We have now exposed the nerve root. We can remove now the first sequester fragments. Here we go. Okay, some more fragments coming. And then at the end of the surgery, you can see that we have decompressed the neural structures nicely. One of the big advantages, if you can imagine if we have to do a skin incision, for example, for a microsurgical technique, then there is a high risk of developing post-operative uh, infections or wound healing problems after, after, this, after the surgery. So this is what is particularly nice here in this case of this lady who had over 100 kilograms uh, body weight. Plus, we have all the advantages uh, that come along with using uh, uh, minimally invasive techniques. Yeah? Small skin incisions, no retractor uh, systems, it's basically independent of the patient's weight, uh, immediate post-operative mobilization, short hospital stay. So to summarize from my point of view, the endoscopic posterior foraminotomy 
uh, is extremely uh, elegant for this type of indication that I have presented to you. So if we look at the broad spectrum of cervical spine procedures, front and back and instrumentations, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. We have to look what is the patient's pathologies. These techniques are complementary, they're not competitive. And we have to look what is the best for that particular patient. For endoscopic posterior foraminotomies that we can use for the treatment of far lateral disc herniations or for foraminal single level decompression, this is a real true motion preserving technique. There's very minimal blood loss as one of the other advantages in comparison uh, to, um, to microsurgical techniques, for example. From my point of view, it's the least invasive and most uh, elegant technique out there for the decompression of cervical uh, or mono monoradicular compression symptoms. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello? Doctor, you're audible, you can go ahead. He's finished his talk, I think. Yeah, uh, Doctor, next talk, as per the uh, agenda, is Doctor Pramod Lokhan. Yes, yes. Pramod is here. Doctor Pramod Lakhande, are you here? Yeah? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please load the presentation. Uh, Diksha, is my screen is visible? Yes. Yes, and I'll go ahead. The topic of discussion today is to discuss the unusual but useful applications of full endoscopic spine surgery. We all know that full endoscopy is an established technique in the management of degenerative spinal diseases and its use is mainly confined for decompressions of the lumbar thoracic and the cervical spine and fusion to limited extent in the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine. The purpose of this talk is to share our experiences of its use in the management of other pathologies like infections, tumors and deformities and uh, to discuss how far we have succeeded in reaching that particular goal. So let's come to our first case, a 20 year old male patient with difficulty in walking, severe back pain and bilateral leg pain. Since aggravated since last few days, the patient had some weakness in the legs. And if you see the MRI, there is an extensive epidural abscess extending from the second sacral vertebra right up, right up to the upper border of the L1 vertebra. The lower part of the abscess was thick with cages tissue, whereas the upper part of the abscess was liquid in nature. So can we do this case endoscopically? A right sided L5 S1 interamer approach was uh, performed in this case and the plan was to remove uh, the KGS tissue or the thick abscess manually under direct vision and once that is removed a smooth silicon catheter was passed in the upward direction to aspirate and irrigate the liquid abscess. So this is the endoscopic picture uh, once the cannula is rotated to retract the nerve root all the KGS tissue is seen and this is manually removed under direct vision. The sample was sent for biopsy and culture and this was done before the starting of irrigation fluid to maximize the culture yield and this is after final decompression of the uh, nerve root. So these are the pictures which show the mobility of the endoscope. The endoscope can be tilted both cranially and caudally due to the wide interlaminar space and you can see the extent of uh, you know manual reach of the endoscope both superiorly right up to the lower border L4 and uh, inferiorly up to the mid of the S1 vertebra. The infection turned out to be rifampicin sensitive or mycobacterium tuberculosis. Anti-tuberculosis treatment was given for one year and these are the post-operative MRI pictures. At six months you can see there is complete resolution of the abscess 
cases without any involvement of the disc case or soft tissues anywhere around. Another case of infection at L5S1 disc space level with a moderate bone destruction and you can see there is a cold abscess tracking down along the iliacus muscle into the pelvis and the abscess communicating with the disc space. So what are the aims of surgery in such patients? We, we need to take a biopsy for identification of the organism. Debridement and abscess drainage is there and we perform fusion if necessary. So can we achieve all these four goals endoscopically? We have tried it and uh, we performed a right-sided L5S1 interlaminar approach. Once the anterior part of the annulus was teased, the communication between the iliacus abscess and the disc space was re-established. So this is what happened. The abscess started draining out through the working sleeve. Nearly 250 ml of abscess, which was thick and purulent in nature, was drained through the working sleeve. It was taken for culture and histopathological examination. And uh, once the thorough debridement of the disc space was done, we performed fusion. Bone grafts, cancellous bone grafts were obtained from the posterior iliac crest and they were inserted through the working sleeve into the disc space and jam pack uh, under under pressure and we perform percutaneous posterior pedicle screw fixation later on. The patient remained asymptomatic for next three months and is still under follow-up. This is another case example where endoscopic decompression was used as a palliative procedure for management of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. A 27-year-old male patient was suffering from NHL since 10 years. He was operated twice. Lumbar decompression was done for paraparesis 10 years ago and cervical decompression 7 years ago. He had received multiple chemotherapies during last 10 years and there was one failed episode of chemotherapy where he developed severe life-threatening reaction and the patient has refused further chemotherapies. Now presently the patient came with a chief complaint of right anterior thigh pain. Treatment aim was to cause pain relief. There you can see that the tumor mass is invading the right foramens of L3-4 and L4-5 levels. A transformal approach was performed at both the levels. The main challenge in such cases is to differentiate the normal anatomical structures from the tumor mass and separate from it. This is the tumor mass being separated from the exiting nerve root on the right side. There is the facet joint drilling and that's the well decompressed exiting nerve root with the disc space below and the facet on the top side. The patient had good post-operative pain relief. Now what about deformities at the craniocervical junction? Irreducible C1, C2 instability with severe myelopathy. There are many ways of belling this cat and one of the treatment option is anterior release followed by posterior fixation. Here we release the anterior tight longus coli, longus capitis and the anterior joint capsule followed by posterior fixation. Can we do this anterior procedure endoscopically? So we performed a percutaneous approach at uh, with the incision at C5-6 level and uh, uh, since the incision is quite low, uh, it avoids all the problems of high retropharyngeal approach uh, protecting the hypoglossal nerve root. Apart from uh, the anterior release procedure, this approach can also be used for odontoidectomy or management of infections. The CM picture show the position of the working sleeve and the position of the instruments at the C1-C2 junction and the uh, if you see endoscopically that's the joint space and this is the mobility of the joint that you see start drilling the joint with an uh, with a round burr round cutting burr and this is the dura dissector inside the joint space which is trying to open it up and mobilize it uh, we can also uh, uh, you know put bone grafts inside the joint space to cause fusion which i have not done in this case the procedure was followed by posterior fixation where we put uh, lateral mass screws in the c1 and c2 and these are the post operative uh, images showing good decompression and good reduction. So lastly, the take-home message, full endoscopy is a very sophisticated and highly evolved form of minimal invasive spine surgery. It offers trifold benefits of elimination, magnification and a clear field of vision due to irrigation fluid. Endoscope assisted procedures uh, can definitely help in reducing morbidity of the open surgery. It is an excellent procedure for difficult to access areas in the thoracic or the cervical spine and it is a huge potential to explore the use of endoscope in pathologies other than degenerative spinal diseases. Thank you. Extra, excellent extrapolation of the full endoscopic approach advantages. Thank you, Pramod. Any Thank questions? <coughs> I would now invite Dr. Rohida, sir, and I am sure that his uh, spectrum would cover all the advances in spine possible with his great experience. Rohida, sir. Okay. Yes, I This is a different topic. Distend use technique, extended applications. Now, first, uh, in three, four slides, we'll just uh, try to know the what is the distend use technique. This is a, a 
way of uh, endoscopic discectomy where the instruments used are this is the outer tube and this is the inner tube. The inner tube has various channels for endoscope, suction, and working channel. And there is an angle of 12 degrees in between the working instrument and the endoscope. These are the very few instruments which are uh, quite economical because these are routine instruments. And this is the angle, this is an angle in between the working instrument and the endoscope. And this can be moved in all directions, cranial, caudal, medial, lateral, it can be, it can go up and down also with a zoom effect. Now, this is distant use technique is an air-based endoscopy and mobile system. Now, because of this air-based uh, uh, technology, we can use this in intradural tumors also, where we have to open the dura, and also in anterior cervical, where a fluid medium cannot hold because of the laxity of the neck muscles, and it is not possible to use fluid for a, uh, anterior cervical uh, techniques. So these are the extended applications of the uh, 3D endoscope, the, the distant use technique in endoscopy. This is the only system which can be used for all techniques like lumbar discectomy, canal stenosis, cervical anterior posterior and intradural tumors also. And this is the extended application is it can be used with 3D endoscope. So this is the only system which can be used with 3D endoscope and in future it will be used with the 4K endoscope. The first extended application was when we uh, started using this technique for canal decompression. We used to go on the opposite side, undercut the lamina, preserve the whole structure on the opposite side, muscle attachment line, lamina and the facet. And we have used to get the canal decompression. This is how we can use it for two levels also through the same incision by moving the endoscope cranial cord. Now this is at L4. Pi. This is on the opposite side. So this is the contralateral root. You can appreciate this is the traverse root on the opposite side, and this is the disc. So this is the extended application. You can use it for canal decompression. Same thing. With this system, we can use ultrasonic bone dissector, which is quite easy. This is less traumatic, and we can undercut the opposite facet without damaging the neural structures. This can be used in multiple level stenosis like this. Now, this is a particular case which has problem at four levels. This is at D12, 1, L12, L34, and L45. We have tackled all the four levels. L34 discectomy and canal decompression at all, all the four levels. And these are the incisions. This is post-op one year. He is able to do his laborer work. He is a farmer. Another extended application is the anterior cervical, where we go through the unconvertible joint, medial to the vertebral artery, like this. Diagonally, we go down and remove the disc and decompress the canal also in cases of single level OPL. We go medial to the vertebral artery, decompress the root, which is something around 6 mm from the dual sac up to the vertebral artery. If we go diagonally on the opposite side, we can decompress the canal also. You can see this is the uncovertable joint and vertebral is here and we remove the disc. This is a disc preserving surgery. This is the final outcome, ural sac, nerve root, vertebral artery. This is after about four hours after the surgery. He was not able to sleep for about 30 days, severe pain, no collar, no drain, no need of any fixation. This is one more case. It's a huge disc at L3-4 leading to 
right sided hemiparesis this is a huge disc we approached to the unconvertible joint decompress the canal and the remove the disc huge disc and this is next day in the morning so we can do a targeted surgery achieve the same goal without any fixation this is the incision for the anterior cervical as compared to the open technique and this is the statistics <coughs> so till now we have done around 78 cases these are the levels with 20 cases of minor radiculopathy excellent result in 75 very poor result in two in cases of a multiple level uh, opln this technique also can be used for the posterior cervical now this is i am going on the opposite side this is at around l34 level and undercutting the lavina on the opposite side this is a cervical cord i am using this ultrasonic bone dissector two incisions and c3 to c7 hemilaminectomy with undercutting of the opposite side so it is a in fact decompression of the cord from one side to the opposite side at c3 to c7 level so these are the cases which we have done 42 cases each and every level with discectomy and canal decompression also excellent result in 35 cases good in 5 fair in 2 because in cases of multiple level uh, canal stenosis with existing myelopathy we cannot get a 100% good result this same system can be used this is another extended application it can be used with a 3d endoscope this is a tip cam 3d endoscope by stores which is 18 cm 0 degree endoscope with tip on chip on tip technology this is the endoscope same it can be used as with the uh, another routine endoscopes we have done around 466 cases since 2017 october lumbar cases 428 anterior cervical 16 posterior cervical 10 intradural sol 10 and thoracic disc 2 we have five complications of dural puncture in 428 lumbar cases in cases of canal stenosis and lysthesis and one dural leak needed need we have to use fibrin glue and tissue dura patch to close the leak another extended application is the intradural tumor this is a meningioma at d89 d910 we have opened the cord and this is a meningioma thoracic cord is here and we are using tumor cusa same incision same technique same instruments this is a cervical neurofibroma done posteriorly at c5 this is a neurofibroma this is 4 hours after the surgery no catheter no drain this is the intradural tumor at lumbar region this is a neurofibroma and this is the rudimentary root we can use small micro scissors to cut the root we can close the dura with 40 vicrin using a pediatric needle holder through the outer tube or the way which we have shown here we can use anasto clips which are titanium clips used in cardiothoracic surgery to close the arterial walls and these are the clips which give you water tight closure and it is quite easy and fast
And this is a real watertight closure. We have used this technique in 29 cases, excellent result in 28, better in one. Out of them, 20 were neurofibromas, eight were meningiomas, and one was hematoma. This is the last thing. Now, this is a 4K endoscope. We will be able to use this 4K in cases of anterior cervical. Now, this is a carotid artery with ICG. This is a meningioma which is removed in the skull base and you can see the vessels here. Now, this is one of the things which can be used with the distant use technique. Now, you can see the vessels here. So, this is one of the extended applications which can be used in future 4K endoscope with distant use technique. Thank you. Kisi, who is the moderator? Hello. Excellent, yes. sir. Thank you so much for the wonderful spectrum you have shown. There's nothing left out and none of the techniques are competing with you. Any 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 question any you want to ask? Hello. Any questions for Rohida, sir? Uh, Rohida, I have a question. Bolo, bolo. Uh, are you putting uh, uh, any fibrin glow over the uh, anastoclip? No, no, no. Only anastoclip and leave it? Yes. Sometimes I might put, put a tissue dura patch. Okay. okay. Tissue dura patch. For additional safety to have sleep at that night. Okay. Uh, for want of time, we'll go to the next talk. Okay. Thank you very okay. much, Let sir. Start. Let me continue with my Great. surgery. Thank you. Girish Datar, the next speaker for the full endoscopic interbody fusion techniques and challenges. Dr. Hello, Giri. Ajay. Hello, Ajay. Hi. Welcome, dear. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm speaking on full endoscopic lumbar interbody fusion. Now, a representative case that I have chosen for this presentation it was a 72 years male, a medical doctor with bilateral lower limb symptoms, right more than left, claudication about 50 feet, right more than left. The back pain and the leg pain were was seven, predominantly on the right side. His MRI showed a grade one listhesis at L4 and L5 with a stenosis. You can see the foraminal area here, which is also uh, you, some amount of compression is seen in the inferior part. The axial section shows bilateral paracentral lateral recess foraminal involvement on the right side as well as on the left side with the central component. The dynamic x-ray shows instability with a grade 1 listhesis at L4 and L5. Now, as far as the patient position, equipment and anesthesia is concerned, the patient is in a prone position on a radio lucent table with a bolster support underneath the chest and the pelvis. As far as the anesthesia is concerned, a combination of spinal anesthesia and epidural anesthesia is the one that we use. Important and the first thing that we need to do understand here is the axis and the targeting. So, if the patient in the prone position on the right side, you have marked the inter uh, the interbody space here, which is midway between the spinous process and the medial border of the pedicle. This is the normal entry point, but we need to check in lateral to see how uh, how are how is the position placed as far as the uh, interbody space is concerned and we here see that we are a little more cranial we can manipulate the endoscope to reach the interbody space but if we are parallel then it becomes easy so that we can prepare the end plates well and it will also easy to put in the uh, interbody cage so the change in the position has to be done depending on how the needle position is on the lateral projection of the image intensifier so after the position is the needle position is changed and corrected we are more parallel to the this space. So, skin marking is done with a radiolucent uh, marker. Once we mark with a marker pen, we can use a, a, a needle with a local anesthetic and with adrenaline so as to ensure some amount of uh, to control bleeding. A small incision of about 8 millimeters is sufficient enough to start off. A dilator is introduced till you reach the lateral border, that is, you come in, encounter, you encounter the facet, and a sleeve is 
input. You may choose to use a smaller system to start off, clear off the extra spinal tissue and then use a larger system or you can directly start off with the larger system. Now, the first important thing that you need to identify here is the tip of the inferior articular process. So, the identification of the inferior articular tip of the inferior articular process is an important step in the uh, entire decompression. The tip of the uh, uh, inferior articular process is identified primarily on the image intensifier and on the manual field using your uh, instruments. So, you can take off all the tissue that is overlying it. So, once you have removed the tissue with the help of a, a punch and then the ronger, you can use the radio frequencies to remove and shrink tissue so as to identify the joint space. So, once, once you have encountered the uh, joint space, you can use an annular, annular cutter to remove or take off part of the capsule so that you can gain access intra-articular. So you, here you see after coagulation that I am taking off part of the inferior part of the capsule here of the facet joint and once you have cleared out soft tissue, you can reorient your endoscope by turning it and gain access into the inferior aspect of the facet joint. So you can use a 4 millimeter kerosene ronger to get an access inside and you can confirm that it's a facet joint. Once you take off the facet joint you see the lamina part of the superior articular process that is the at the base and you can start your decompression from here gradually cranial words. Now trimming of the inferior articular process is done on the ipsilateral side is done with the help of a 5 millimeter burr which is guarded on one side. So these are low RPM high torque burrs. So you can progress ahead with the de decompression and go cranial. As you start de uh, decompressing or as you start trimming the inferior articular process you are going to detach the superficial layer of the ligamentum from as well, you'll see more of the superior articular process in the base. Now, the superior articular process starts curving laterally and if you reach a little beyond that, you'll see that this is going to be the uh, roof of the foramen. So, once you have completed the trimming of the uh, inferior articular process a little beyond and the cranial lamina a little beyond the tip of the superior articular process, you can, you can progress ahead by doing the uh, drilling or burring of the base of the spinous process to get a contralateral axis. The contralateral axis, I would I personally would like to retain the ligamentum flavum till I complete the bony decompression, which is typically called as an outside in technique. So once I have completed the bony decompression ipsilateral, cranial, caudal and contralaterally and the ligamentum flavum is now loose, before you remove the ligamentum flavum, you would want to do an osteotomy of the inferior articular process to gain more room in the lateral aspect uh, that is lateral to the neurological structures. So you would typically do an osteotomy at the level of the um, uh uh, end plate, the inferior end plate of the superior vertebra. Now you can do it with the help of an osteotome or you can do it with the help of a burr. I prefer to do it with an osteotome as it is just fast. So I would first create a dent in the part of the inferior articular process. I have already done my decompression here. Now I have to remove this so that I can uh, do a decompression more laterally. If required, I can also take off part of the superior articular process or trim superior articular process, but inferior articular uh, process removal by and large is sufficient gain sufficient amount of room lateral to the neurological structure. You can just twist the uh, osteotome and the um, uh, part of the inferior articular process that you have removed becomes loose which can be delivered directly to the endoscopic sleeve. This part of the bone and the part of the bone which is removed from the lamina can be used as the bone graft for your interbody area. Now after you have done your decompression and removal of the um, uh, inferior articular process, you can progress ahead by removing the ligamentum flower. So you can do an annulotomy by using a punch and then take off part of the annulus uh, uh, with a kerosene ronger. The end plate cartilage can be easily removed with the help of a, a, a blunt instrument and you can do a visualized discectomy making sure that radiologically you are guided as far as how medial you are and how ventral you are. You can use a curd curette to remove areas more deeper and more dorsal. A thorough end plate preparation is <clears throat> a key to uh, a good interbody fusion. So once an interbody uh, area is prepared, the, the, uh, the then starts is the area where you want to put in a bone graft and cage. <coughs> so before you would want to um, put in a, after you have put in a bone graft, you would want to retract the neurological structures more medially so that you can place a large size or a big cage with a good foot plate that is a 10 millimeter foot plate. 
So the technique is just for a diagrammatic representation. I'm showing you the video on this. So you put in a dilator and a kind of a retractor, then turn the retractor 180 degrees uh, to retract the neurological structures. And this can be hinged. Now this is also useful for you to guide your cage more obliquely rather than straight like a cliff. But so you can direct it more oblique and, the, and the, there is a good uh, and safe placement of the cage is possible. With the retractor in situation, in the place, after you have put in your dilator and sleeve, the, the uh, retractor is out of the sleeve which you can see at probably the 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock and now at 12 o'clock position. So once you have retracted the neurological structures, the sleeve can be withdrawn to you see that now you have a sufficient uh, area or a safe corridor from where you can put in your interbody cage. So you, once you have put in your cage sufficient enough and tightly snugly fit inside with the right position uh, and in the safe corridor in the interbody area, you may expand it as comparable to the adjacent levels. So you can confirm it uh, on PA and lateral that the placement of the cage is perfect and once the cage placement of the cage is perfect you may remove the introducer. This is the final cage and this is after doing a percutaneous pedicle screw by uh, for augmentation of the posterior column and this is the final picture that you see the cage in C2 with the pedicle screws in place. This is the video of the in, of the same patient with the cage in place. So you can see a decompression lateral part of the neurological structures after the D retract is removed, the cage is sitting inside, all the graft is going to be more medial and ventral to the cage. You may leave a closed suction drain inside and um, for, for it to drain for about 24 hours and then you can remove it because you have removed some amount of bone so it tends to bleed. The same patient where we did uh, the decompression, this was the pre-op picture, this was the axial view, this is the same patient, we have a, a CT scan at 4 months, you can see perfect placement of case in a safe corridor in the interbody area and you can see the cage in on the axial section. You can also appreciate the amount of decompression that is possible on the ipsilateral and on the contralateral side. You don't see the inferior articular process because we have removed it. Thank you. Thank you, Dada. Wonderful video. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, any questions to Girish? Can we raise questions? Hello, yes, Dr. Sipe, go ahead. You, 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 um, you mentioned that you enter the sleeve and then you protect the dura to the medial side. Uh, how can you make sure that you protect the cranially exiting nerve root or, or how are you doing that? So the sleeve, the sleeve that we use is a kind of a semi-curvilinear sleeve. It's not a rectangular kind of a sleeve. So you put it in the axilla and then you, you can protect it pretty well. Okay. And maybe if I can raise another question is if, if, if you look at the size of the cage, obviously it's, it's somewhat limited. And, and sometimes I would feel comfortable doing this in a slim lady, let's say, 50 kilograms, but not so sure if I would use that on some of the Bavarian patients around here, you know, 90, 100, 110 kilos. So what, what's your experience with that? Uh, we've been using these expandable cages since the last two years. So these are 10 millimeter foot plate cages, which are about 8 millimeters in size. When we before we expand it, and it usually expands about four millimeters, so we are able to achieve about twelve millimeters. In but if we think that the patient is a large patient with a large size, then we may not opt for endoscopic fusion. Okay, that's that's good to know. I'm I'm not worried about the height. I think the height will be okay. The foot plate. I'm worried about the surface area so that you can get a good solid fusion. I agree. Yeah. So I think the height will be will be alright. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Good. Uh, we move on and we have the last talk of the session. Far lateral modified TILIF using bipodal endoscopic approach. Dr. Dong Ho Heo. Welcome, doctor. Diksha, is my screen is visible? Yeah, it is visible. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Tomo. I work at Seoul Luminous Hospital and the Spine Surgery Center. 
So it's my topic is modified paralateral UBA tulip or extreme lateral UBA tulip. We sometimes we call the UBAX tulip. Today's my lecture will focus on the surgical technique, basically bipotal endoscopic tulip. UBA tulip is basically based on similar to the that of the MIS tulip using the tubular retractor. To the UBA uh, X tulip, uh, UBA surgery experience, MI slip surgery experience, and UBA fusion surgery experience are essential and required. Two biggest advantage of the paratra UBA slip is that we can put in the large size of the cage instead of the usual slip or slip cages. We for the protein in the life size of the case, we have to make enough space. Uh, if we do the extra laminotomy and total facetectomy, we can make a large space for the insertion of the life size of the case. If we, we did the unilateral laminotomy, extra total facetectomy, we have we can make enough space for the insertion of the life size of the case, which has all regard to the cages. To summarize the Bipotrophyrotherapy, we, we have to do firstly unilateral laminotomy and bilateral decompression, second, unilateral total vasectomy and discectomy. We finally we have to do end plate preparations and we can put in those uh, life size of the cages. Before the surgery, we measure the the length between the extreme of root and traversal of root using the actual MRI. If it is more than 15 millimeters, we can put in the light side of the cage of like this. However, if we do length between extreme of root two and traversal of root two is under the below 15 millimeters, we have to Convert to the usual tulip. So, therefore, this surgery is mainly done at the lower lumbar level, such as L45 and L5S1s. For the insertion of the cages, we have to make another paratra portal. The light side of the cage is inserted uh, obliquely through the paratra portal, extrematra portal, like this, and we have to. We proceed a KG transversely like this. So we have to make the paratra portal for the life size of KG insertion like this. This is the rear uh, operation wound pictures. You can see the another portal for the paratra portal for the KG insertions. Sometimes I make the Another uh, long size of the wound uh, for the life size of the cage insertions. So we usually use the uh, only cage or the lip cage rather than the flip or to lip cages. Recently, the specialized customized case for the X lip were produced like this. The size of the X lip case is bigger than the tulip or flip cage. Uh, for the uh, safe insertion of the cage, light side of the cage, we have to use the cage guidance, uh, customized cage guidance. Firstly, we have to insert the cage guidance into the disk space and uh, we put in the largest of the cage very safely. Now I'd like to show a video. The drawer was retract, slightly retracted medially and put in the cage guidance like this. And cage was safely inserted without any injury of the dura and the root. And finally, I, I did the reposition of the cage transversely. Like this. The cage, customized cage guidance is very uh, useful and important for the life size of cage insertions.
Now I'd like to show my case. The two female patients complained of the post leg pain. You can see there, grade two spondylolisthesis at the L5 S1. Also, you can see the bilateral fibrinal stenosis. I did the UMI X clip, bilateral clip, the grade two spondylolisthesis was totally reducted. And all of the cases, case, the 73 female patient complained of the claudication with bilateral leg pain. You can see the grade one spondylolisthesis of the alpha 5 also actual images leaving the central stenosis. And I did the paratel UV clip. Firstly, I exposed the lamina and interlaminar space and facet joint using the radio frequency. And I did the extracurricular laminotomy and facetectomy. And I did the I removed the hypothyroid ligament flavum. And then I did the mastectomy totally, which started This bone was uh, used to the fusion material. After total mastectomy, we, we can see the enough space for the large size of the cage insertion. Now I did the uh, Extinct lobular to decompression very carefully. You can see the enough space for the life size of the KG. Check the, the length between the extinct and traversal lobular tip. And I did a discectomy and end plate preparations. And end, prepar end plate preparation is very important for the sleep. Dura was just slightly retracted the medial and put in the case guidance. And finally, I put in the life size of the cages, extra cages or all the cages. And I will proceed caging transversely without any injury of the dura and extinct lobulative. Dura and extreme of was very completely decompressed there. The post of uh, cage guidance is very important. After surgery, you can see the complete reduction of the spondylolisthesis, and also you can see the life size of the cage in such a status. So the sister MRI showed the complete reduction of the spondylolisthesis. And the central canal was well decompressed. Also, you can see the life size of all the case. Uh, Today, I talk about the uh, surgical technique of the far lateral, extreme lateral, UV clip, sometimes we call UV X clip. I suggest UV X clip is very useful method for the uh, fusion surgery. So today's only uh, today's I talk only talk about the surgical method of the UV clip, especially paratrack clip. Uh, if there are any another chance, I will also talk about the clinical and radiologic outcome of the paratrack endoscopy clip using the UVE. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So we come to the end of this session. Uh, do you have any questions to Dr. Dong? I would have one. Yes. If nobody else has a question. It's a, it's a similar question. When, when, you, when you come in from far lateral, um, there is more of a risk that you, um, that you might getting contact with the cranially exiting nerve root even more than when you enter more medially. So have you encountered this and what do you do to protect the cranially exiting nerve root? Yes, we did two 
device is born is the dura retractor. Dura retractor is the medial protection of the medial dura and also cranial external root to the protected by cage guidance. Cage guidance um, will guidance for the cage insertion and protection of the external root. Sometimes the distance between exiting noble two and traversing noble two is sometimes very narrow. And the parater extra tulip is impossible. Sometimes I change it to the just ordinary endoscopic tulip. CP, uh, Dr. CP? Yeah? Yes, uh, I can give the, some answer for, uh, about that. In Korea, we have so many endoscope fusion, uh, uh, unipotal and bipotal. But uh, in Korea, we already developed uh, some uh, uh, retractor system of the, uh, like uh, some working channel, uh, working channel. Uh, and we insert the uh, cage through the uh, working channel, but that is uh, protected uh, bilaterally traversing and exiting the root because it uh, ducking to the disc space after river of a disc, uh, the disc uh, and the plate and uh, insert to the retractor or, or working channel is uh, insert into the disc area and insert the cage through that point because of that uh, nerve uh, safely protect traversing and exiting now completely. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. I would like to put a few questions across to the panelists who are there. Uh, hello? Yes, Ajay. Anybody, anybody in the uh, 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 group who would like to put some questions into for discussion? Okay, we come to the end of the session. It was an absolutely wonderful session with all advanced indications which could be explored by the pioneers. And uh, this comes to prove that all techniques can go on to the ex Thank you very much for all speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, this is the third and the last session on endoscopic uh, spine, which is being held today. And I hope all of you are staying with us. And uh, I'm Dr. Pramod Lokhande. I'll be moderating this session. And we have a list of panelists with us, Dr. Rohidas, Dr. Rajamani, Dr. Karuna Karan, and Dr. Monu Singh. So without wasting much time, I would like to ask Dr. Sukumar Sura, to talk about uh, transforaminal lateral recess decompression. Good evening, Pramod. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, do we have the talk? Uh, yes, doctor. No. no. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Is my screen visible, Diksha? Yes. 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 Go ahead. Thank you. Can you block the video? Good morning. Lateral recess stenosis can be operated via endoscopic techniques today, either by transforaminal or interlaminal. Today, we'll discuss about uh, transforaminal lateral recess decompression. When we see the lateral recess, which is bounded by the facet, the pedicle, and the vertebral margin, and the disc surface, so any stenosis here, there is an impingement of the root, and most of the time, the lateral recess stenosis is associated with either central canal or foraminal stenosis. What are the components which cause uh, stenosis? It's the hypertrophied facet tissue, uh, the capsular hypertrophy, and the hypertrophied yellow ligament disc, which might be soft or hard, and end plate osteophytes, which causes lateral recess stenosis. What are the options endoscopically? We can do either by transforaminal or interlaminal decompression. So while discussing the transforaminal decompression, the case 60-year female 
Zephyr right L4 L5 radiculopathy. You can see the X-ray. There is no instability. When we see MRI, L4 L5, uh, there is a disc prolapse along with foraminal and lateral stenosis bilaterally, right more than left. In view of her unilateral symptoms, the transforaminal technique was opted. So patient is prone. Surgeon is standing on the right side and. Uh, Patient is prone, surgeon is standing on the right side with under epidural analgesia. The marker is used to mark the midline and uh, the AP and the lateral is also marked. So once AP and lateral are marked, 13 centimeters is marked on the, the lateral marking and a small uh, nick is given and needle is passed uh, with the C-arm guidance. Once the needle is passed, so you can measure the, the stillet length and the guide wire is passed into the needle and the needle is removed. Once needle is removed, so again confirm on CM and over the needle, over the guide wire, uh, dilator is passed. The dilator is uh, around 7 mm dilator uh, which is passed. You can see here how I am passing. The dilator is passed in twisting motions so that we should not push the guide wire and it should be passed along the guide wire. Confirm on the CM, then push with the counter pressure given on the opposite side and once we check on the CM and we are confirming that it is under the facet and remove the guide wire and uh, just tap this further so that it can enter the disc space. So once you are sure that it has entered the disc space, so then put it uh, further in so that you are safe and it is inside the disc. So then uh, beveled cannula is passed, it's also called a sheath, which is passed. And being on the right side, so the traversing route and exiting route, the bevel should face towards that so that we should not injure the route. To so tap the sheath inside, <coughs> tap the sheath inside and pass the camera. Once the scope is in situ, we can see the 12 o'clock is uh, the posterior, uh, 6 o'clock is the disc space, 3 o'clock is the superior, 9 o'clock is inferior. You can see the yellow ligament there around the facet which I am cutting now with the sharp uh, punches. Once this yellow ligament is uh, cut and uh, the curated, this is the yellow ligament which is in the lateral recess. Uh, which is cutting the facet joint which has been removed just now and at 3 o'clock you can see the fat and I am just cutting the osteophyte between the traversing root and the exiting root and the tissue between those two so once this is cleared you can see it's the, the body is flat there and I am removing a hard tissue between the traversing and the exiting root and uh, further trimming the bone. You can see the entire traversing root is decompressed in the lateral recess, disc is removed and at the 3 o'clock you can see the exiting root fat very well. When you see the post-op MRI, so completely foramen is decompressed, lateral recess is decompressed and patient is absolutely free of symptoms. Case 2, the 65 male with the severe left radiculopathy, pediatrician by occupation. So you can see the MRI is a lateral recess stenosis on both sides, more on the left side with a uh, foraminal narrowing also where the facet tip is impinging the uh, exiting route. So patient uh, left transforaminal decompression was done for this patient and once uh, <coughs> the cannula is inside, decompress the disc, then uh, withdraw the cannula and you can see I am drilling the, the facet with the uh, uh, drill again and here you can see here uh, I am just uh, using a, my chisel uh, uh, to remove the tip of SAP and I am just removing a part of the disc which is causing a stenosis and you can see this a lot of yellow ligament which is cutting the uh, lateral recess and the facet so I am just drilling the facet further this is a inferior most part of the facet which I am drilling. Once this is drilled 
and they can see the thecal sac and the root pulsating well and uh, they can see them further removing a the osteophyte there when this osteophyte is removed you can see osteophyte is removed and you can see at 3 o'clock and uh, the 9 o'clock is the exiting root because it's being a uh, left side so you can see the 3 o'clock of fat and the nicely exiting root is seen the traversing root and the exiting root are seen very nicely here and uh, axillary pad of fat is seen and both are well decompressed. When you see the post-op CT, uh, the left side you can see completely foramen is opened up and uh, nicely and without violating the facet joint. In post-op MRI, you can see the foramen is completely open and the lateral recess is completely open. So, lateral recess stenosis can be very well easily dealt with uh, endoscopy without violating the joint and without uh, compromising the mobility or stability of the spine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Su uh, Sura. And uh, do we have any questions from the panelists? Any question? Dr. Pai? Okay, then we move on to the next uh, topic uh, by Dr. Pai. He's going to talk on extra foraminal full endoscopic lumbar discectomy. Please, can you load the presentation of Dr. Pai? Diksha, is, is my screen is visible? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. My topic is full endoscopic discectomy for treatment of lumbar extrafaraminal disc herniations. Just a few points on extrafaraminal disc herniations. They are peculiar because they compress the exiting nerve root and the dorsal root ganglion and not the traversing nerve root. Because they compress the exiting nerve root, the pain is quite significant. The other thing is they are mostly missed by the radiologist because they don't visualize the far lateral uh, component of the disc and the extra parasagital images. The other peculiar thing is if you are treating it surgically, then the surgical treatment options, uh, the intracanal method of laminotomy or a microdiscectomy will not be useful and you will have to treat them through the paraspinal will say approach. Today I am going to describe a specific full endoscopic approach for treating extra phenomenal disc herniations. By meaningful endoscopic, we use the percutaneous endoscopic technique. We use the guide, needle, guide wire, the dilator, and the cannula following it. And then we directly target the extrafaraminal fragment pressing on the exiting nerve root. The basic principles of this approach, it's a percutaneous uniportal approach with targeted fragmentectomy. The guidance is with initially with the image intensifier and later by the endoscope and preferably done under local anesthesia. We use the working channel endoscope, uh, where the working channel can range from 2.7 to 4.1. Anything can be used. There is a slight modification from the usual transferaminal approach, where the transferaminal approach, your distance from the middle line is about 8 to 12 centimeters. Here, because we are targeting only the extrafaminal disc and we want the exiting nerve root to be visualized, our distance from the middle line is just 6 to 8 centimeters and the trajectory is more steeper. Thus, the aim is targeted removal of the extrafaraminal disc without destabilization. Now, this is a 65-year-old male patient with right-sided radiating leg pain for three weeks. It is severe. He can't even lie supine. And the femoral stretch test is positive. This is the MRI, which shows a large extrafaraminal disc herniation seen in the parachysiatal images also. Here, uh, the other side root, you can visualize the exiting nerve root over here is fully compressed. Now, the surgical technique involves, I usually prefer doing it under local anesthesia with conscious sedation, though some people can do it under um, general anesthesia, but you have to be very careful. With local anesthesia, it becomes much more safe for the patient as well as the surgeon. So, I use midazolam, fentanyl, and local anesthesia with lidocaine. You mark the entry point based on your images, you give local anesthesia and then 
put the needle in the CM under CM guidance. Here, your target point is the lateral pedicular line in the AP view, and it should be at the posterior vertebral body line in lateral view. You put the guide wire, you put the dilator, and then we use the round cannula specifically in this, and then the working channel endoscope is inserted from this. Once you put the working channel endoscope, further thing is targeted fragmentectomy using the forceps, use the radio frequency cautery for hemostasis and tissue modulation. This is the final position of the cannula. The most important thing is the cannula being round. It acts like a retractor protecting the exiting nerve root. We use specifically the round cannula because it's an extra discal approach. So there is chance of bleeding. With a round cannula, you can control it much uh, better. At the same time, because of the round cannula retracting the exiting nerve root, you can reach the uh, extruded fragment, pressing the exiting nerve root much more easily. Now, this is the endoscope view. This is the caudal. This is the cranial. We are treating the right-sided uh, disc. So once we have removed slightly part of the annulus over here, the round cannula is placed over the annulus and it does not enter the disc. And as we translate the cannula above, we can see the exiting nerve root. Uh, we can see the fragment which is extruded in the axilla of the exiting nerve root. And once we have visualized the exiting nerve root, uh, the fragment, we can remove it with the forceps. Once we remove it in total, you can see the fat surrounding the exiting nerve root. And hence, you want to clearly visualize the exiting nerve root, you can definitely do it. Here you can see that the exiting nerve root is clearly visualized and it's completely free. Now, this is the annulus which is present below. This is the fragment which you have removed. This is the post-op immediately on table. You find that the patient is pain-free and the femoral stretch test is negative. The cannula position, as we discussed uh, while uh, discussing it, while I showed you the video, here the cannula position initially is lower down. Then you, as you retract the exiting nerve root, you can go superiorly and then you can remove the fragment specifically with, with protecting the exiting nerve root by the cannula. The most important thing to note over here is at the upper end plate level, the exiting nerve root is closer and the lower end plate level, the exiting nerve root is farther. So initially your target point is the lower end plate and then you translate retracting the exiting nerve root with the cannula. Thus, percutaneous full endoscopic discectomy is a safe and effective, minimally invasive, patient-friendly option for treating lumbar extrafernal disc in carefully selected cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Any questions from the audience, from the panelists? Yeah, I have one question, Pramod. Yeah, please. Um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Pai, uh, which all levels yes. does he find this technique to be most useful? And which are the more hazardous levels where he would caution against a person who's, uh, you know, initial uh, beginner or learner to stay away from? Uh I think uh, it can be used at all all lumbar levels. I don't think there's a question about uh, level for uh, easy or bad. Uh, in upper lumbar levels, usually the exiting nerve root is more angulated. So it leaves the space between the exiting nerve root and the uh, facet joint. Though it is larger, the herniated fragments are also quite easily accessible through this. And as such, at upper lumbar levels, you don't go far lateral. So you have to target it uh, steeper. The only things where it is it becomes difficult is if you have a far lateral disc along with a underlying uh, syndesmophyte or maybe a, a, a hard, frag, hard uh, edge of the disc along with it where sometimes the patient may continue to have uh, pain because you can't completely remove the uh, hard annular uh, uh, disc area below the exiting nerve root. Otherwise, I don't think uh, level matters in this. So, uh, do you routinely get your uh, uh, CT scans done for these patients in such situations? or? Uh... 
uh, in cases where there is a chronic symptoms, I do get a CT scan done. But if there is an acute disc and which is uh, seen and the X-ray does not show any uh, syndesmophytes, I usually don't get a routine CT scan. But in elderly pe people, yes, I do get a CT scan before I do a transfrainal axis. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, Pai, I have one question for you. Yes. Uh, uh, these extra foraminal or foraminal disc herniations, as we know, that they are extremely painful. And we saw in one of your videos that the patient was not able to lie supine. And you said yes. that you're going to, you always do these cases under local anesthesia. Now, yes. the thing that I'm worried about is, uh, you know, getting the patient on table in a prone position on the bolsters. And with the painting and draping, we waste almost around 10 to 15 minutes. And after that, we start giving anesthesia. So how do you manage your patients during that particular time? Uh, yes, I, as I said, the approach-related pain in uh, treating foraminal or extra foraminal discs is much more than treating in a paramedian disc herniation. Uh, for that, I feel you require slightly more deeper sedation and a more cooperative patient. A patient who is not very cooperative, anxious, obviously is a difficult thing. The other thing is sometimes I use a sequential dilatation. So I usually give more local anesthesia in that area. So you give more local anesthetic in that area. And instead of directly going with a dilator, I usually use a sequential uh, uh, dilators which are come, which go through. And where in that case, it is much easier. And once that fragment goes away, the patient is really, the patient goes to sleep. So I would do preferably do it under local uh, local anesthesia. But as you rightly say, if you there is an anxious patient, uh, I would not mind doing it under general anesthesia. But I would not recommend it to be done under general anesthesia for the beginners. Okay. Has it ever happened to you that uh, you're trying with the local anesthesia and you had to, you know, because the patient is not cooperative or you are not able to proceed further, you just have to convert the procedure under general anesthesia? Uh, no, not until now. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we come to the next speaker now, uh, Dr. Arun Bhanoth, who is going to talk about endoscopic thoracic discectomy. Is my screen is visible? Next yes, one. and it's good. My name is Arun Bhano and today I will be talking about the role of full endoscopic discectomy to manage thoracic disc herniation. Thoracic disc herniation, we all know, uh, surgery is rarely uh, done. Talk about the laminectomy and discectomy conventionally done. It has been uh, associated with possibility of poor outcomes and high risk of neurological complications because you cannot uh, retract or manipulate the spinal cord in a low cord to canal ratio area. Similarly, anterior approach thou has been effective to treat these problems, but it requires to do the surgery either through the transthoracic or retropleural uh, region, thus adding to their own morbidity. And the third option of posterior lateral decompression, like the T-lift, where we knock off the facet, it is usually restricted to the posterior lateral type disc herniations, and uh, sometimes it may require additional instrumentation thus adding to the cost and time of the surgery. But full endoscopy, especially through the transforaminal route, offers an excellent choice to treat these difficult herniations and we'll see how it is effective in the coming few slides. This is the first case. Uh, it's 64 years old gentleman who presented with difficulty in walking for a period of two months preceding to presentation. There was an apprehension to fall and there was also a pain and weakness in the left lower limb. His neurological examination showed upper motor neuron signs, thus confirming the presence of uh, myelopathy. His uh, radiological examination, x-rays show a deformity in the lumbar and lumbosacral region that was carried from the childhood and he had managed all his life comfortably through several decades with this deformity. This is his preoperative MRI showing a large disc herniation at, D, at T11 and 12 uh, pushing the spinal cord towards the other side and this is the actual pictures again confirming the hernia mass moving upwards and downwards besides the pedicle and pushing the spinal cord to the other pedicle. Now we use the full endoscopic transforaminal technique in this case 
and the principle was to widen the foramen to have a easy access to the disc herniation first we dock the cannula on the lateral surface of the ascending facet as shown here then we drill the anterolateral surface of the ascending facet sometimes one can also drill the posterior surface of the vertebral body if needed to lower the floor of the foramen and have additional safety the idea is to keep the working cannula close to the epidural space and there is no need to handle the spinal cord in this technique this is the surgical video the needle is docked onto the facet as mentioned the cannula is positioned on the ascending facet we coagulate and then remove the little bit of soft tissue covering the surf, uh, under surface of the facet which is now exposed using this flexible bipolar then we start drilling the under surface of the ascending facet the idea is to drill up to the medial edge of the facet to enter the epidural space we start drilling from the tip towards the base to utilize the whole length of the foramen once we reach the medial edge as we palpate and feel the medial edge this is the ligamentum flavum covering the under surface of facet which is cut with the endoscopic cutter and then the hernia mass is visualized so we grab it with the endoscopic forceps and then we remove this large fragment and then we search for other remaining fragments that could be present in uh, thoracic herniations so as expected there are a couple of more fragments that lie in the epidural space which are easily removed and then we check the confirmation by seeing the pulsations of the thecal sac which is free visual and uh, tactile feel now we can see that the probe is showing a decompression from upper to lower pedicle this is the post operative mri showing widened foramen on the right side and the round thecal sac and this is the sagittal view again confirming the full decompression this is the second case uh, a gentleman in his 70s presented with the mixed picture of myelopathy and uh, uh, radiculopathy because he had a thoracic and a upper lumbar herniation at t11 12 and l12 along with the pre existing lower lumbar stenosis so i'll focus this uh, talk on the thoracic herniation and this is his video the facet has been exposed and drilling started and as uh, mentioned earlier we try to reach the medial edge and in this case we drilled a little bit of the posterior surface of the vertebral body which is shown here so this is the posterior surface to lower the foramen and you can see the thecal sac along with the herniated disc which is uh, opened with this right angle probe and the fragment taken out and as uh, in the previous case we again look for the remaining fragments so another large fragment and thecal sac is becoming relatively free and this is the upper migrated fragment which is taken out and now we can see the full decompression of the thecal sac freely pulsatile so that is the end of our procedure this is his post operative mri showing adequate decompression of the neural elements so to conclude transforaminal endoscopy in thoracic spine herniations is a very useful and safe application and it reduces the chance of cord handling and its antecedent complications uh, it's very effective to remove even migrated large herniations and central herniations which may find difficulty with other possible techniques and there is a very low risk of complications because you are working under the spinal cord and not handling it because and secondly the hernia mass itself protects the spinal cord and helps you perform a safe and effective procedure thank you Excellent talk, Dr. Banot. Any questions? Prasad, any question for Dr. Banot? You are muted. You are muted. Uh, how do you, the entry point is different in uh, lower lumbar and this one, upper lumbar. The question is: yes. How the entry point differs? Yeah, the entry point is different as we uh, have uh, shown several times earlier that we try to measure it on the preoperative MRI. but uh, in this case the idea is to first dock on the lateral surface of the facet and anyway we are going to drill the under surface of the facet so uh, we can have a little bit of a luxury in uh, choosing the entry point we are not docking the cannula or the needle as close to the uh, medial border of pedicle as we do in the lower lumbar spine so when we are attempting a foraminoplasty you have the 
choice of drilling some uh, under surface of the facet to have a widened foramen and you want to remain close to the epidural space hello arun arun one more question yes. for you any yes. cases where you would not do a, a transfernal approach and you would choose some different approach so if the hernia mass is lying posteriorly or uh, on the side and posteriorly then it is better to do the interlaminar but uh, as i already said if there is a anteriorly lying hernia mass we all know you cannot retract the spinal cord and it is much easier and safer to do it from the foramen the first case which you in showed the, uh, as uh, dr sukumar mentioned in his earlier talk yeah. yes yeah so, so the sukumar first case mentioned in his showed. earlier talk hmm. sorry you you go ahead so that in that those cases in the middle thoracic spine you have to encounter the rib head but in the lower thoracic spine that problem is not there so it is easier to treat them through the transforaminal approach yes please ask what you wanted to say yeah the first case uh, retrospectively would you approach it interlaminar also now no actually i inter, uh, i initially thought i would do it interlaminar but then later realized that it would be much better uh, to do it from the uh, transforaminal in hindsight it proved correct because uh, you saw there is hardly any hair of the neural tissue and you can remove almost the entire hernia without any uh, neural uh, retraction yeah the only issue is suppose it is too fragmented there is chance that some remaining fragment you don't have too much mobility of the endoscope where you can probably have the liberty to uh, redirect it actually both the cases that i showed were multi fragmented herniation as you yes. saw yes right so uh, now the problem is that uh, that what uh, as i said that if you keep the cannula see we have to understand that the lower thoracic uh, herniations are addressed more like a floating cannula technique we are not fixed in the foramen and because we are widening the foramen either by drilling the under surface of the facet or by drilling a little bit of the posterior vertebral body so that will give you some movement of the cannula cranial cordial cordially so as as i showed in both the cases you were able to address it from the upper pedicle to the lower pedicle okay okay yeah. but i think so uh, that, that is how it is different can i add to pre op ct scan in every patient uh, most of the times yes because thoracic herniations are many a time calcified so it is uh, better to take ct scan and be prepared for it. arun um, beautiful presentation that yes promo you wanted to add some yeah one more thing i wanted to say is just to answer pai's uh, pradyumna's question that you know retracting the neural structures medially and accessing an anteriorly lying pathology is difficult in thoracic spine as compared to lumbar spine so i think whenever we plan for a you know thoracic uh, you know problems especially disc herniations uh, it's uh, the the first choice should be transforaminal approach and uh, the second okay. choice is interlaminar approach so and my question is Then for calcified also, yes. transformal we can do for calcified also. Yes, you can drill the uh, under surface of the calcified mass, and uh, you can also use a, a small endoscopic goose or uh, uh, osteotome as well to cut it with the endoscope. Yeah, uh, I have a question for you, Arun. Yeah, one yeah. question from my side is uh, not only to Dr. Bhano but also to Dr. Kim and Dr. Raja Mani and all the senior faculties here. now the problem especially when we are treating thoracic disc herniations uh, the problem is always getting the right level because we don't have any landmarks in intraoperatively i'm talking about so we may be able to do a pre operative ct scan but when we are actually you know uh, sitting inside and we don't have any osteophytes anterior osteophytes or narrowing of the disc which makes the particular affected disc stand out from the rest how do you, how do you go about it how do you try to confirm your level that's the most difficult part and usually in such cases i always do a marker ct film and keep the marker till the theater and then once inside the theater then you convert that marker to after positioning the patient you put that marker on the skin or you put it in the bone on the skin on the skin and uh, okay. it is secured it is it is it is frames 
Yeah, but the same to problem. Give a cross reference. The patient or the bolster, maybe the skin stretches and the marker moves up and down. So I I personally make the patient do lie prone while doing the CT scan. Okay. Any any inputs from Doctor Kim? Doctor Doctor Youngson Kim is us with you. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I cannot understand completely. Your question is that uh, uh, what is the uh, when the finishing the operation? Your no, the question is no, no. to identify the question is correct level intraoperatively <coughs> when you are doing a thoracic disc herniation. Ah, uh, uh, there is. Uh, uh, I'm always checking the. Uh, uh in the thoracic spine there is very difficult problem because of that uh, i always taking the whole, whole spine mri preoperatively yeah then uh, uh during the operation checking from the low lumbar to uh, target level that is always correct okay okay because so before before operation i check the whole spine mri okay 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 Monu had some question. Yeah, Monu, please go. Ahead. I just wanted to know in a broad-based uh, posterior herniation, any instances you find where you have to approach from both the sides? Uh, usually, I have uh, until now I have not needed to, and as I already said in my first presentation and this one also, if you come flat, you are under the thecal sac, so you can actually do much better for broad-based central herniations from the transforaminal route than any other approach. Okay. I believe uh, yeah. Ajay had uh, a few cases where he had gone in uh, uh, bilaterally and uh, you know put in his transferaminal scopes from both the sides and uh, done a decompression. I think the last uh, earlier part it used to be when we used to come at more steep angles, but since we started going more flat, that need has gone down. But yes, still it is possible that sometimes you may have a hernia which is extending from one lateral recess to the another, and maybe in such cases you may have to rarely. Okay, Thank now you. we come to the next uh, talk. Thank you, Dr. Banot. Uh, the next talk is by Dr. P. C. Day, and he'll be talking on Destando technique for recurrent disc herniations. Is my uh, screen visible? Yes. 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 Please. Okay. <clears throat> recurrent disc herniation endoscopic discectomy by Destando technique. Part of the underspine technique, because it provides clear differentiation of the neural structure from the scar tissue, radiosolysis is performed while preserving the stability of the remnant facet joints, etc., would lower the risk of complications like dural tear and the normal retractor and normal uh, injury. No limitations for the upward or downward migrated disc or central disc. Central canal stenosis also not as lateral canal stenosis is not a problem for the destinative technique. Because uh, here we can easily decompress as much as possible the bone. L5S1 is not a problem. For others, it is a problem because we are approaching from the interlaminar window. So, no problem. Most important is to avoid the unnecessary fusion surgery. Endospine system is a mobile operating tube. Panoramic view provides by this technique. Operating technique is interlaminar window approach. Press fit technique, there is no special device to fix it. Both the hand of the surgeons are free. The stable instrument, left hand for the suction tip and right hand for the operating instruments. 62 years lady undergone open laminectomy for 455 base 1 in 2012 for the stenosis. Recurrent of pain in 2014, there was a crippling pain. She undergone for an epidural nerve block in 2015. There was a temporary relief for three months, consulted many places. There is a white laminectomy, L4, L5, and L5H1. We did the MRI and contrast MRI confirmed there was a recurrent disc herniation in L4, L5, was compressing the right side nerve root. The target is the bone, whatever bone is available. Here it was the uh, facet. So we decompress by sacrificing a little bit of the medial aspect of facet. And there was a cleavage between the sub tissue, or here it is a fibrous tissue and the bone. And then the normal retractor is pushing the sub tissue medially, and then 3 mm disc forces were there to remove the disc. So, get cleavage between the scar tissue and the remnant of the bone, whatever the bone is available, maybe facet, maybe lamina, or maybe the pedicle, or maybe isthmus. 
another patient four five disc there was a left side compression got operated after eight months there was recurrence and uh, came to me we did the mri contrast mri confirmed the diagnosis there was recurrence of disc at the same level same side there is a left side so the tips is that to hit to hit the bone whatever may be available may be the isthmus may be the uh, pars whatever may be the available so if there is a wide laminectomy always the facet is the best way to approach because most of the time the nerve is nerve root is not adherent to the scar tissue most of the time so it is very better to sacrifice little bit of the medial aspect of the facet than directly hit to the nerve root then try to remove the scar tissue from the nerve root because it is most of the time not adherent and then here there was a special bipolar cartridge available it is coming with this set so epidural bleeding is not a problem for us and then irrigation after the discectomy this is the left approach the nerve root is completely decompressed we are not going beyond this the dura may injure if you go midline so to coexistence of the lateral dystenosis does not affect what of much of the outcome of this technique because the bone decompression is very effective with this technique without disturbing the stability another patient two level recurrent disc 3445 operated in 2017 and also there was recurrence of both the site l3 l4 and l4 l5 in 2020 he presented me in august 2020 there was recurrence at the two level 3445 and that was also in the so in contrast mri we confirm it we label it l3 l4 and l4 l5 the decompress and discectomy of the 3 4 and 4 5 both the level nerve root is completely decompressed this is the first post operative day there is two scar and this is the midline scar is a previous scar and this two are the l3 l4 and l4 l5 the same patient after 21 days of the post op to conclude the endospinal system is a safe tool for the recurrent disc superior in recurrences like central disc and upward and downward migrated disc it could avoid the fusion also endospine the mobile operating tube a simplified approach even in the two level recurrences thank you thank you dr pc day any questions uh dr rajamani you have any question for him may i ask something very simple i mean don't laugh at it but i would like to know dr day what are the major challenges that you would feel a person would face in attempting a case like this if we are we are using an endospine system for attempting an a recurrent disc herniation what are the initial challenges you feel that a person should be aware of challenges to get the neural tissue first identify the neural tissue from the scar tissue you said most of the times it is not adherent but there may be times when it is adherent no it is it is most of the time adherent to the dura not the nerve root so that's why i told to hit to the medial aspect of the uh, facet first if it possible sacrifice little bit more bone from the medial aspect of the facet because most of the time it is uh, the facet hypertrophy and that part uh, if you remove then you will land on the nerve root which is not, most of the time it is not adherent if you go medial and directly land on the dura then definitely we are going to injure the dura so the idea is to stay lateral as much as possible over the bone over the facet and sacrifice yeah, yeah. sacrifice little more bone from the medial aspect of facet and try to land on the directly nerve root so do you augment these patients with a post operative fixation with with post decompression fixation sorry post decompression fixation means uh, yeah i didn't get your questions you do do you face any instances of uh, spinal instability uh, instability no no no, no. because i always uh, measure how much bone i am removing it is maximum uh, 5 to 6 mm 4 to 5 mm so fixation uh, not comes this in the in the scenario ct for on cases the once uh, once you are uh, on the nerve root that means you are sufficiently decompressed so don't go beyond that 
you do ct for all cases uh, uh, no 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 not all cases if it is there any doubt of the hard disk or anything then i think about the no, ct scan otherwise no ct scan but i do contrast ct sometime contrast mri sorry contrast mri okay excellent excellent dr pc day now we move on to the next talk by dr prasad padgaukar and he'll be talking on trans iliac l5s1 full endoscopic discectomy is my screen visible yes, yes. and it's good Okay, go ahead, please. So, very good evening to everybody. Today's my topic is trans iliac transforaminal access for L5 S1 discectomy. I am Dr. Prasad Padgaonkar, spine surgeon from Indore. So, this is a middle-aged person who presented with the left-sided sciatica for last six months, not responding to the conservative line of management. Whose SLR is 45 degree on the left side. If you correlate clinically, it has got MRI finding of. Uh, large central inferiorly migrated herniation, which is causing left-sided more than right-sided S1 traversing now root compression. If I see the X-ray, there is obvious high iliac crest, which will definitely make uh, transforaminal access more difficult. Hence, the surgical classification given by us it gives uh, it classifies L5 S1 relationship into three categories based on AP and lateral X-ray projections. So, whenever we get type 3 by 3 classification, any uh, AP or lateral showing type 3, then we can go for trans iliac surgery. So, trans iliac, uh, this is the type 3 on lateral and type 2 on AP. So, this procedure is done under prone position with the local anesthesia and monitored anesthesia care. This is the vertical midline which is first drawn. Then the second horizontal line is drawn at the level of the disc. Then I draw a line under the pedicle which crosses above the ilium, but it is not possible here. That's why we are doing trans iliac surgery. Now, once I see the lateral projection, the disc inclination line is drawn. Then the posterior lateral entry is marked from the measuring the distance from the frontal uh, anterior aspect of the disc to the posterior surface of the patient's body. This length is transferred from the midline to the posterior lateral surface. Now, once local anesthesia is given, a small stab incision is taken. Then the needle, puncture needle, 18 gauge puncture needle is passed till the ileum where I give local anesthesia. After the local anesthesia on the outer cortex, the tomshidi needle is passed. There are two kind of tomshidi needle. One is sharp through which we enter the ileum. Once we have crossed the ileum on AP, the lateral projection is confirmed for the disc inclination line. You can progress the needle till the foramen, confirm it on AP. Once I reach to the mid pedicular line, I further progress on AP till the medial pedicular line, where I need to confirm on lateral that I have not, I have already entered inside the disc. And then once I enter into the disc on the lateral view in the posterior one fourth AP, I should be in the middle of the disc. So, that is where my targeted herniation is lying. Now, on this guide wire, I, I pass my sequential reamers. So, these reamers are 4 mm, 6 mm, 7 mm, 8 mm and 9 mm. So, I make a hole inside the ileum. Same time, it can be an outside in or inside out technique based on how you um, place your um, reamers. So, if you are doing outside in technique, this is how once you place the dilator there, remove the guide wire and then place your cannula. So cannula is rotated once you are once you reach to the mid pedicular line and then once once you are in the mid line on AP, you should be in the half in half, half out on the lateral view. So this is the endoscopic image. As you can see, this is just an, in the sub annular region on lateral as we have seen. If you, if I orient, the 12 o'clock is the dorsal, 3 o'clock is caudal, 6 o'clock is ventral, and 9 o'clock is cranial. So, this is the left side of the patient. 
Now, whatever herniation you are seeing in the cannula is the targeted herniation, which is just subannular. So, as soon as I grab the herniation, the the complete fragment of almost like three to four centimeter fragment is out. But your surgery doesn't end there. This is the as soon as you come out, this is half in half out position where the you can see the annulus and the epidural fat oozing with the flavum and the superior articular process. Now I have to create a space between the annulus and the superior articular process where you can have an epidural ooze there. Once you reach there, you can tease the fragment out, residual fragment if there is any. Then you want to confirm the decompression of the axilla as well as the traversing nerve root. So how do you do that? You probe. So this probe is going in the axilla and the hidden zone of macula. The residual traversing nerve root, decompressed traversing nerve root can be visualized by doing the proper foraminotomy. So this is the foraminotomy. And now you can see the axilla, the nicely fluttering axilla where there is a traversing nerve root horizontally placed, you can see. And the axilla is in the cranial aspect in this 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So you can see the exiting nerve root currently at 7 o'clock and it is going towards the 12 o'clock position. And the, the space Cambin's triangle can be seen here. This is my radio frequency probe which is going in the axilla. And now you can see the traversing S1 nerve root which is well decompressed. And once the decompression is completed, you can just suck the irrigation fluid. So my post-op protocol is 30 minutes after the procedure, patient can be ambulated and the, and the further exercise can be started in four to six weeks. This is the post-operative academic MRI just to see the exact extent of the herniation removed. And this is the uh, track, trans track to approach the scene. So I thank you very much for your patient here. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Any questions? Is there any reason to you prefer uh, <coughs> same thing can be done with uh, transfer nothing and a scope? Is there any reason to prefer uh, transfer in this case? Question is, is there any reason to prefer transformal approach in this case? Um, although this case was done when uh, probably my interlaminar cases were not that frequent. Um, but the thing is, um, I usually prefer, in particularly at L5-S1, I prefer trans uh, when there is a foraminal disc herniation or there is a foraminal stenosis pathology or maybe the, there is a recurrence uh, of the interlaminar or maybe the open surgery. So those are my preferred uh, places. And in this case, I would definitely consider that central large herniations, they, there usually you need to do a lot of traversing nerve root retraction to reach to the midline. And that is where probably doing trans iliac transforaminal also, I would prefer over the interlaminar because the retraction of the traversing nerve root is quite less. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, any more questions? Oh, you are uh, you are right on this. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, this was definitely a technique which was there before. But now since uh, we have got, you know, uh, interlaminar approach and most of the times we are able to deal with the foramen also through the contralateral interlaminar approach. So the, what I believe is uh, this is all minimally invasive spine surgery. And one of the principles of minimally invasive spine surgery is to do as less bone resection and as less soft tissue damage. And, uh, you know, everything has to be under full visualization. So if you go by that principle, I think uh, for me, at least in my hands, uh, interlaminar approach would be a much more easier, more predictable approach as compared to trans. I've okay. done trans iliac and I even have a... Uh, but suppose if there is a foraminal stenosis, uh, how would you... Foraminal stenosis, you don't need to go that laterally. What I usually do, I go along the medial margin of the iliac crest, just like what... The tube guys do, you know, mm -hmm. you dog the tube or even the distant guys, you they just dog the tube uh, just lateral to the facet joint. Yeah. So that kind of technique is possible and it's more minimally invasive as compared to trans approach. Mm -hmm. Once again, one, one more question, Pramod. Yes. 
the your incidence of transfer amenor is becoming less than uh, transfer amenor or what do you think or or yes so uh, in general i think if you go by the uh, you know approaches uh, previously the indications were quite limited for endoscopy and most of those indications were disc herniations and so at that time predominantly we used to do transforaminal approach but now with complex situations where we not only have a disc herniation we have uh, associated stenosis cases then we majority of our practice now was shifted from disc to stenosis even with you i think if you see your practice i think the number of cases of stenosis are quite much more than uh, that as compared to lumbar disc herniation so obviously the the incidence of usage of interlaminar approach is much more you know as compared to transforaminal but still transforaminal technique is there and it is going to be there and it is always going to be my first choice of treatment whenever possible so whenever i have any case the first thing which comes to my mind is can i do this case transforaminal if i am able to do it i do it as a first choice of treatment only if that is not possible by the transformal approach not because there is difficulty in doing it but rather the end result is what matters to me if i'm if i feel that i'm not going to do justice to that particular case and in that case i better shift on to interlaminar approach yeah any more questions okay. can we shift on to the next talk Uh, this talk is another i think a excellent talk intradural tumor resection with destandu technique by dr anand mehrotra dr mehrotra welcome please ah uh, thank you very much uh, is my screen visible yeah is yeah, my wait. screen visible yeah wait a minute yeah we are not able to see yeah i will just play the video now yeah please go ahead. okay okay Hello everybody i am dr anand mehrotra I will be talking about endoscopic excision of intradural extramedullary lesions. Now, which cases to choose, choose initially? One should always choose the benign tumors like neurofibromas or schwannomas or even meningioma. Malignant tumors should always be avoided because they usually have loss of pain from the surrounding tissue and resection of the and the resection limit in a malignant tumor also helps in prognosticating the patient. The tumor size should be approximately three to four centimeters. Should be less than three level, and a surgically placed tumor is always preferable because it will always because you are approaching the tumor or the spine from one side. So, a surgically placed tumor makes the surgery much more easy, and definitely a tumor which is posteriorly placed is much more easy surgically as compared to a tumor which is ventrally placed. This is especially true for the in the cervical spine or in the thoracic spine. Okay. Even more interaction on the cervical or thoracic spine can lead to devastating complications. I shall be talking about the Chandu's technique. So these are the instruments that we commonly use in the testendus treatment uh, technique. As one of the most important instrument is the marker, and how do we use it? You know, this is the cranial lens, this is the caudal lens, this is the marker, and this is the middle lens. And the marker should be placed such that on endoscopy, both the limbs should be dead parallel to each other, and they should be centered at the level of disc if you are doing the discectomy, or at the level of the tumor in which you are in case in which you are trying to remove the tumor. Now. Once you mark the incision, then with the help of the outer sheet and the obturator, you uh, insert the uh, outer sheet and the uh, inserter at the level, and then you do a check X-ray to see whether you are at the light level or not. And once you do that, then you have to start with the surgery per se. Just a short video of the idea. Now, this is a case of a 25-year-old gentleman who presented to us with the gradually progressive spastic paraparesis for about six months with bad bowel involvement, and the power in both the lower limbs was 3 by 5, and the DTA was 3 plus. Now, uh, it is very important that you clinically correlate the findings of the patient with the MRI. Here you can see that there is an uh, IDM which is uh, on T2 vector image, which is uh, iso intense on T2. Which is intensely contrast enhancing, and it has both extradural as well as an intradural component. As you can see here, the dura out here, and this is much better appreciated in the corner section, in which you can see the intradural part and the extradural part. Now, once you uh, have defined the level by the marker that, that we have discussed, then you move on to the surgery. Now, just to orient you a little bit, 
this is the cranial part this is the caudal part this is the middle part and this is the lateral part now i am not, not dealing with the initial part of the surgery in which the lamina is dissected because that would have been taken care of in the dissectomy uh, part of the uh, conference the after the initial part of the lamina has been removed this is the dura and then this is the external part of the tumor that is visualized here it is always preferable to use drill especially in this vitus pan and the thoracic pan region because the even using a larger size uh, caisson pan like number 3 or number 4 or number 5 can lead to two deficits in the patient so try to remove the lamina with the help of the drill make the lamina absolutely thin what we call as the egg shelling and then after you make the lamina absolutely thin just try to take out the lamina or the remaining part of the bone with the help of the caisson pan with the smallest caisson pan preferably number 1 at the most number 2 Now, once you do that, we just try to take out the last bit of the bone so that the tumor exposure has to be very good. If you can see the tumor on all all sides, as you can see here, then you can move on to opening of the dura. Here, after we open the dura, we saw that the tumor is slightly bigger than the dura opening, so we are just trying to remove the extra part of the bone so that we can have the <coughs> we can move around the tumor completely. Now, as as we have done here, you can see that we are moving around the tumor. Now the dissector and the biopsy process are one of the most important instruments for removal of the tumor. We just have to do anything. Just keep on dissecting the tumor from the surrounding plane, debulk the tumor with the help of the biopsy process, and then try to remove the tumor. If it is a small tumor, you can always remove it uh, in total. But in majority of the cases, uh, you have to remove the tumor in a piecemeal fashion, as we are doing it here. Now here you can see the last part of the tumor. I was using the fine dissecting process. This is a Fine dissecting process in the last part of the tumor. Initially, you can use a larger dissector, but when you come in close in contact, you like to come in close contact with the thicker sac or sorry, with the spinal cord. Use a fine dissector. Once the internal part of the tumor has been removed, you can move on to the external part. Here also, just dissect all the on the tumor, make a plane, and the tumor will automatically start bulging into the operative villi. As you can see here, once you remove, see you can see the tumor will automatically come out of it. Just dissect around it, and then you will see that the tumor. See, you can see the tumor is bulging into the upper tissue. In the last part, as I mentioned earlier, you have to use the fine dissector. Now, once you do that, you will see that there is increased bleeding in the external component. That is primarily because when the tumor is there, it has actually compressed the external epidural venous plexus. When the tumor is removed, these venous plexus they open up, and there they start bleeding. And then there is some amount of bleeding in the end of the part of the surgery. Once you do that, we have to check whether the tumor is completely excised or not. So you can do it with the fine dissector. You can see here, tumor is completely excised, no residual tumor. And then I just keep a uh, sheet of uh, surgery cell. It's not compulsory; it's not mandatory. You want, you can keep it if you think the incision is adequate. You need to keep the surgery cell. Once you do that, the nemesis of uh, the endoscopic tumor removal has been the dura closure. Now, for the past about 20, 20 odd cases, I have been using this artificial dura, and then I just keep this artificial dura over the dura opening. That is sufficient to take care of the dural opening. Now this is another case in which uh, thoracic tumor is there. You can see the intra intra picture. This is one and a half centimeter incision, and the postoperative when the complete tumor has been excised. You can also do detaching of the cord. This is the thickened phylum tunnel, and we are using intra monitoring. Ossified ligament of phylum can be done, and the thoracic abdominal cyst can be done. There are definitely disadvantages of this technique. Uh, if you are at a wrong level. Then you are in a big soup because either you add the most, but have to convert the surgery, uh, convert the surgery into an open technique. So you have to spend adequate time on accurate localization. The localization, as, as I mentioned, is was a very difficult part. Initially, we used to suture it, and that was very cumbersome. But now we keep artificial dura, and luckily, dura closure, CSF leak, we have not encountered since then. Postoperative medical deficit can occur, but one has to be very cautious. One has to be patient in removing the tumor, and anteriorly placed tumor, the recurrent lesion should be avoided by using this technique. Thank you. Excellent talk, Doctor Mehrotra. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions, Doctor Kim? Have you ever attempted uh, intradural tumors with our full endoscopy technique? No, still I I have no cases of that because uh, I'm worked in a private clinic because of it. Two more patients usually uh, not come to me. Yeah. <laughs> but do you think it is possible? Uh, but uh, still, uh, I can. I have not uh, confident to myself. 
because okay. because of that I I will let try that still. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Rajamani, any comments? May I ask, may I ask one question, Dr. Mehrotra? Uh, have yeah, you please. ever had the Have you ever had the uh, Have you ever had to open up a patient in these cases that you have uh, uh, done so beautifully? Has it ever happened that you have had to open up, uh, convert it to an open procedure? And if you did, then for what reasons? Uh, frankly speaking, Dr. Manu, in the initial two, three cases, it was uh, in which uh, I had to actually open up the, uh, convert into open. But as uh, I learned for the past uh, 20 cases in which I was talking about, I have not converted them into open. But in the initial three, four cases, yes, it was sort of a learning curve for me because I was doing disectomies. Uh, but then once I started doing uh, during, uh, this intradural tumor excisions, then once I started opening the dura, I reached the, started decompressing the tumor. I found it difficult to initially debulk the entire tumor. And then when I, when I started debulking the entire tumor, then I sort of found it difficult to close the dura. So it was a step-by-step -step learning process. But yes, for the past uh, uh, initial three, four cases, I had that problem. But then, uh, and I started using the artificial dura, then I have not converted any cases into the open technique. Thank you. All of us who are doing intradural tumors, I think all of us uh, prefer to uh, try to do a primary closure of the dura, you know, at least if not with a proline uh, kind of thing, but at least with some staplers. So you think uh, just putting a patch on top of it uh, avoids, you know, any post-operative complications or is as good as primary closure of the dura? Dr. Pramod, frankly speaking, in the initial part, I thought that uh, I just actually, frankly, echoed your viewpoint. But uh, since I started using, and that was by serendipity, actually, uh, I was finding it very difficult to close the dura in the little part of the, uh, it was a meningioma that I operated upon using the distant do. Yeah. And as you know, the, in meningioma, you have to take out the part of the dura as well. Okay. So in such a case, there was a defect in the dura, which I could not close. So I put this artificial dura. And that patient actually recovered very well. And then I started using it in the subsequent patients. And since then, uh, I think Dr. Monu had asked me earlier also in the operative session, that since then I had no uh, complications regarding the wound complications. There was one patient in which there was a radiological pseudomeningocele, but the patient was asymptomatic, so I did nothing for that patient. So your primary objective is always to put a patch, no, no not to attempt uh, any closure at any time. No. Um, actually, what happens in when, when the tumor is out, the dura tends to fall onto itself. Yeah. When it tends to fall onto itself, it is just a thin rim. And because the distendal technique is more of a conical uh, structure, so the the part that, that is touching the dura or actually not touching the dura, which is over the dura, is actually very small. So, uh, I have not encountered any uh, CSF-related or wound-related complications in my patients. Okay. okay. Do you need drain and do you mobilize? No, sir. I don't keep any drain. I, I, mobilization is in the... Uh, uh, usually, sir, actually, being in the government sector, this is usually the second case that we operate upon, not the first case. So, uh, we no, mobilize the patient next day morning. Okay. And no drain. Yeah. No drain. Excellent. So, we move on to the last lecture of Thank this Thank you section. very much. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Malcolm Pestanji. Is he here? Uh, dear doctor, uh, doctor is not in the link. Can we play the video? Yeah, please go ahead. So he is he is going to talk on UBE or migrated lumbar disc herniation. Uh, is my screen visible, Diksha? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Subliminal extra level approach for foramen stenosis using the technique of unilateral bipodal endoscopic decompression. Basically, what is foramen stenosis? It is a narrowing of the bony exit by which the nerve leaves the dural canal and it is caused by a decrease in the height of the disc by a craniocaudal subluxation of the upriding of the superior articular process and by buckling of the ligamentum flavum and bulging of the disc. So basically these are the contributory factors which cause foramen stenosis. Why UB? UB is basically a surgery done with two very very small portals, three millimeter cuts. One is a working portal, one is a scopic portal. The medium of fluid is normal saline. It helps in tissue dissection and absolute clear vision. It is truly a minimalistic approach. It passes through some fibers of the multifidus 
and usually in the fat space between the multifidus and the lamina is where we create our reservoir. There is only dilatation, there is no cutting, there is a 4 millimeter scope and routine instrumentation. So the advantage of a 4 millimeter scope is you can, you know, it's like chopsticks, you can move it around very nicely. You can reach all possible corners. An advantage of a 30 degree scope is it allows you proper visualization of the foramen. You can see right deep into the foramen, even beyond it. So, how do we start? We start with cutting out the base of the spinous process, decompressing that thing and then starting with the sublaminar decompression on the opposite side. This is to allow us to come to the opposite foramen. As you can see here, I am using an oval burr and I am cutting through the base of the spinous process so that I can push my instruments more horizontally and perfectly onto the opposite side lamina cut away the inferior edge of the superior lamina on the opposite side until I get a separation of the flavum auto separating itself from the base of the lamina cranial lamina so you can see over here we are burring away onto the opposite side now and you can see slowly how the flavum is detaching itself so we know that we are reaching the isthmic junction and we need to expand that junction further go more laterally and then go on to the facets so that's the way the whole sweep or the whole arc of the movement is in the next slide you can see that there's an image on the left, there's an image on the right. The image on the left is of nail 3, 4. But here you can see that I have taken two core sectors, ipsilateral and contralateral. Sublaminar decompression has been done on the contralateral side. I've thinned out the lamina, cut away the excess bone, opened up the lateral canal adequately. And I've done a similar job on the ipsilateral side. Now in the L4-5 image, if you see, you will realize that I have done everything only on the contralateral side. My pathology was contralateral, my foramen was only one block. Why do I need to do anything on this side? No, no need. So I did only a contralateral subliminal decompression. So that basically is how you plan your sectoral approach in this surgery. Now when you reach the contralateral lateral recess, you need to decompress that too. So lateral retinal decompression is that when we do, or especially I do, I try and do it extra flavoring. I preserve a layer of flavor between me and the facet so that the dura is put. I'll play this video and you'll be able to appreciate it better. You can see the drill is now taking its position above the flavum which is in the lateral recess and yeah, that's the bony edge and I'm starting to burr away, burr away and burr away, make it bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger, moving cranially towards the foramen. Undercutting of the SAP is occurring right now. That little bony red margin that you see, that is the IAP SAP junction and we are cutting and opening up that whole lateral recess over there. And when I finish this burring, you will see that there's a thick layer of flavum that is actually there. That flavum has been what has been protecting me during my burring. So it is not as rash as it seems, but it's quite well controlled. Yeah, you can see the flavum that is down there. Next step would be to identify the deeper part of the SAP, part that swings right below and out into the foramen. So again, we are doing an extra flavor resection of that. You can see how I am stripping away the flavum. You can see this whole mass. I will mark out this whole mass over here. This is the SAP. I am targeting this SAP. This is the IAP line is here. This is the IAP line, but this here is the SAP. And now I'm putting my chisel over there. It's a hockey stick chisel. It's a J-shaped chisel which comes with the endoscopic UV set. And uh, I am now doing an osteotomy. Carefully I'm osteotomizing the tip of the SAP. We will be separating it out completely. And we'll be able to see wonderfully the root below, the exiting root below. As you can see, there's a whole flavor over there. Nothing, nothing of the dura is exposed as of now. So we're quite safe and we're quite comfortable in what we are doing. I advocate this extra flavor approach, though it takes a little time for some people to understand it. It's far safer than working on the dura itself. Yes, and you can see how we are cracking it open going deeper, 
trying to push through the entire foramen. The canyon scissors bone that you see above is the IAP. Below is the tip of the SAP, which I'm trying to fracture. Yes, now it is fractured, and as you can see, the whole root lies exposed below, covered with a little bit of foramen and ligament or flavum, whatever you wish to call it. This is the osteotomized surface. And below you can see the beautiful root and the entire exit completely opened up, beautifully opened up. So that is a take home from this that you can do an SAP contralateral osteotomy. Sometimes it becomes difficult, I won't say diff impossible, but it becomes difficult to even do an osteotomy. You try to do an osteotomy, but the bone is just too thick. It's just too thick, it's just not possible. I'm now using a curet, I'm using a small curet to clear out as much of the SAP tip as I can and try and create a tunnel over there. A tunnel in which I can then gradually introduce a diamond tip burr, protected guarded burr with the root and dura below so that I can expand the exit part of the foramen. And as you can see now, I've taken position and I'm burning towards the dorsal surface. I'm going cranially and dorsally in both directions. I'm trying to open up the foramen as far as possible, out as much as possible and as clearly as possible. Yeah, that is the outer edge and we are going through there. And we are opening it up thoroughly. A little bit of a dip of the lateral recess and the foramen over there. So we will burr that also. But you will be realizing, okay, and you can see now how beautifully our instrument is going across the entire facet. So we have comfortably opened it up. This is the image post op CT reconstruction. You can see that the tip of the SAP is gone. Foramen is nice and wide. And here you can see. Uh, bald probe tip going through the entire foramen out on the opposite side, ensuring the fact that we have really freed up everything over there. So I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to address you. I look a little haggard, but I'm not well. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Malcolm. Uh, and since he is not here, uh, I have some questions. Uh, Pradyumna, are you there? Dr. Pai? Dr. Pai, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me, Pramod. Yeah, now, uh, uh, Pradyumna, you have the experience of both the techniques, uniportal and uh, biportal technique. And one of the things which surprised me today afternoon when Ketan Deshpande was operating, he said that operating uh, on a disc herniation with a biportal technique is much more difficult as compared to decompression of stenosis. So, do you agree with it or and what might be the reasons for that? I think uh, the he said it because he has to target it from the left side for a right-sided disc herniation. So, I think if you are treating a right-sided disc herniation always from the left side, it is difficult because you can't retract it. But for a stenosis, it is easy because you have to decompress everything and doing stenosis Uniportally, yes, it is much more uh, uh, tech savvy. You require a lot of equipment, but with uh, biportal, so I think he meant it in that circumstances rather than anything else. But I guess for, if you are doing just a micro discectomy and left-sided disc herniation, okay. I don't think uniportal or biportal makes a difference. Okay, and uh, another question is. Uh, how difficult is a right-sided approach for a left-handed person with the bipodal technique? Uh, the approach is, yes, it becomes, because once you are trained in doing one way, uh, the similarly, the opposite, it really becomes challenging because most of the times you are holding, if you are holding the scope on the right side and you are doing it with the left hand, your dexterity changes. But yes, there are some surgeons who can do it both ways. You can do it left as well as right side. But most people, if you are going to do an occasional UB, then you would always want to do it from the left side. Okay. And do you think that the, this particular drawback of UBE technique 
uh, will deter people from adapting uh, this technique wholeheartedly no i don't think so i think as i said uh, ub is a very good technique for central stenosis so it is uh, much more versatile and not that uh, uh, technology dependent so you can probably use it use your regular instruments and doing it so i would prefer it for a central stenosis but i would not do it uh, that for using it for t lift and everything i think there are definite other ways of doing it much more effectively rather than trying to have that scale that learning curve and trying to use it for additional uh, ways of doing it or different yeah dr monu uh, you guys you have been you know training with both the techniques destando for a long time you have been working and recently you have also been you know quite interested with the ub technique so you feel that uh, you know it's easy for you to switch from a destando technique to ub technique um the two techniques are not uh, very similar first of all because the fluid medium itself makes a difference and with ube you need to have a certain amount of ability to triangulate in destando it is already done for you because you working through a sleep but for ube you need to understand how to triangulate and that ability i think comes much more easily for uh, you know orthopedic surgeons who've been uh, doing arthroscopic surgeries for them it is much easier to pick up yeah. and uh, i do feel that ube whatever i have not had to handle this experience because of shortage of equipment but i did feel in my initial cases where i worked with ube that it does uh, score over uh, distendu sorry to say so being a distendu follower for so long yeah that's i do that. feel that it tends to score over distendu in a, a number of uh, ways and uh, yes it should be the future ahead going ahead and uh, it is good it is a good technique to pick up after distendu actually because they work similarly through the uh, same you know uh, surgical anatomy it's just that uh, you are not constrained by a sleeve anymore so okay. the freedom amount is definitely much more okay okay yeah so dr kim any final comments on this particular session yes uh, uh today a symposium is very endoscopic symposium is very very interesting and uh, it discuss all things of endoscopic spine surgery uh, i'm also agree to full endoscopic transformer is a, a basic mind of the endoscopic spine surgeon but we always uh, uh, push to that purpose but uh, Uh, to uh, to uh, work together with the biportal and uniportal and the standard system, that will be the best uh, option to developing the endoscopic spine surgery to become a mainstream of the spine spinal treatment. Uh, thank you so much uh, to this very nice symposium. Yeah, well said, Dr. Kim, and thank you very much. Thank you all the faculties on the panelists for participating in this wonderful session. and i would like to declare this session as closed now thank you thank you thank you thank you डॉक्टर उमेश सर
Thank you, Diksha. Diksha? Then I'm closing this all. Yeah, yeah, please.